Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The story I bring you is one of the most curious I've ever encountered. For what happened to pretty little Amy Prentice shouldn't happen to, well, to you. Put yourself in Amy's place. You arrive one day at the home of the fiancé, Jack Morton, and... Jack. Jack, darling, I'm here. I beg your pardon? I'm here. I, I mean, here I am. You're here, all right, but who are you? Who am I? Look, if you're some kind of saleswoman, Jack, you're really not... please. Please stop kidding. I'm Amy. Amy Prentice. Your fiancé. You're crazy. That's what you are. I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Our mystery drama, The Bride That Wasn't was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Janet Waldo and Anne Seymour. We've all had odd, unexplainable things happen to us. Sometimes we put them down to tricks of memory, a curious combination of circumstances, or an occurrence that was simply inexplicable, and have then dismissed them from our minds. Perhaps Amy Prentice should have done that, but alas, didn't, when she arrived at the home of her fiancé, Jack Morton, all set to get married, only to have Jack tell her, I've never seen you or heard of you in my life. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Now, wait just you a minute. You heard me, sister. Beat it. Sister? Beat it? Jack Morton, I don't know what this is all about, what but... What is it, Jack? What's wrong? Yes, what seems to be the trouble? Well, this girl claims she knows me. Claims I know you. We're engaged. Engaged to be married. Married? Oh, my dear young lady, you're suffering from some sort of delusion. You bat or you're playing some sort of game. Now, you just get along out of here. Oh, now, now, mother. I mean it, Florence. I'll call the police if she doesn't. No. The poor girl, whatever her problem, looks terribly tired. You'd be tired, too, if you'd come all the way from Midvale in a day coach. Come in. And... Come in and at least have a cup of tea. Oh, I don't think so. Not now. Not after this reception I just got. Well, that's just fine with us. Take off. Jack, how can you act this way? Oh, honey, I don't know what this is all about, but you come on in and have a cup of tea with no. us. No. You get out of here. Go away or I'll call the police. Now, Mother, you know you'll do no such thing. This young woman is obviously in some sort of trouble. And it's up to us to help her if we can. Jack, you pick up her bag and bring it in. And, honey, you come on along with me. I... I, I don't know. Oh, I... nonsense. Come on, dear. All right, Jack, bring the suitcase. Close the door. And now let's all go into the dining room and have some tea. You too, Jack. And you, Mother. Now, what's your name, honey? Amy. Amy Prentice. Well, you sit right there, Amy, and I'll pour tea, and you tell us what this is all about. Tell you... We... You, you act... You all act as if you'd never heard of me. We haven't. Anyway, I haven't. This is some kind of trick. Confidence game. Mother, you... please. Here we are, honey. Nice cup of tea. Now, there's milk and sugar right there if you want them. And a plate of cookies. Now, let me introduce ourselves to begin with. This is Mother Morton, Jack's, that's him, Jack's mother. And I'm Florence Morton, his wife. Wife? Yes, dear. So, you see, you're thinking he's your fiancé. Well, you see, that just can't be so. Is she your wife? Of course she is. Let me tell you once again, I don't know you. I never saw you before in my life. You, you did. You did. We met just two weeks ago at the conference at State Teachers College. Now, what in blazes would I be doing at a teacher's college? Well, you're an English.
English teacher, aren't you? English teacher, my foot. I'm an insurance salesman. But you can't be. You can't be. Uh, unless you don't have a twin brother or, or a double or something. No, Amy, he doesn't. Yes, she very well knows. Mother, Amy, why don't you tell us what you think this is all about? I mean, start at the beginning and, well, tell us the whole story. Perhaps we can help in, I don't know, in some way. But he knows what happened. Whether he... he does or not, you just tell us in your own words. Well, I'm an English teacher at Midvale High School. And I attended the conference of English teachers at State Teachers two weeks ago. On the third day, when I was having lunch in the cafeteria... Look, excuse me, uh, there, there seems to be a shortage of tables. Do you mind if I sit down here? No, no, of course not. Please. Thanks. I'll just put my tray down here. There we are. Or rather, here I am. <laughs> uh, my name's Mort, Jack Morton. Amy Prentice. Where are you from? Midvale. Newark. High school English. You know, Chaucer, Shakespeare, and all that. <laughs> well, we, um... Have a lot in common. Mm hmm. Including food. I see you got a BLT on whole wheat, toasted. <laughs> you too. <laughs> uh, mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. <laughs> hey, are you uh, enjoying the conference? Oh, yes and no. Well, what's the no part? Well, quite honestly, I, I, I don't go for some of the new teaching methods they're recommending. Yeah. Like letting your students read what they want to read instead of holding them to the curriculum. You too? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have a lot in common. Yeah, I should say we do. Sure glad I asked to sit at your table. Uh, so am I. Uh, Amy, uh, do you mind if I call you Amy? <laughs> no. And you call me Jack, okay? <laughs> All right, Jack. Well, uh... What I was going to say, it, it's kind of early to ask you for a date, but... Well, look, the barbecue tonight. I'm not looking forward to going alone, and I sort of wondered... I wasn't looking forward to it either, for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about two minds with but a single thought, two hearts that beat as one. Well, how about it? How about what? Going to the barbecue with me. Look, the steak is going to be New York cut, my favorite. Oh, mine too. I'd love to. It's a date then, Amy? It's a date, Jack. And that was our first date. We saw each other from then on every chance we got every day. And just before the end of the conference, Jack asked me... Jack, you know you did. You, you asked me to marry you. Look, will you make sense? I'm married to Florence. I've been married to her for ten years. Would I ask you or anyone else to marry me? But you did. What do you think I'm doing here? We we arranged for me to come today to meet your mother and, and stay here till we got married over the weekend. What? This is the engagement ring you gave me. Now, wait a minute. Cool it, lady. You could have gotten that anywhere. You could have bought it yourself. Amy, I know you're sincere in thinking you met Jack at that conference and that he asked you to marry him, but, well, it's a, it's got to be some sort of delusion. If it is, how did I know his name and address? That you could have got out of any phone book. I don't care what you say, Florence. This girl is playing some kind of game. I don't think so, Mother. I think she really believes what she says. I believe it because it happened. No, Amy, as I say, it's some sort of delusion. Is the Rose Garden a delusion? Yeah. The, the Rose Garden? Your Rose Garden, Mrs. Morton. Jack told me you love roses... And that you're an expert at growing them. That you even exhibit them and have won prizes. Is that true? Well, yes, but... That window there. That, that picture window. Do, does it look out on the backyard where the rose garden is? Why, good heavens, it does, yes. I'll describe it for you. Just as Jack described it for me. There's... There's a brick walk down the center. Dividing the yard in half. You... Enter the walk through a white trellis that's covered with red and white roses. At the far end of the walk, there's a tall French fence to screen you from the neighbors. And in front of the fence, there's a fountain with a large statue of the god Pan. Is that right? Perfectly. It's unbelievable. I don't see anything unbelievable about it. 
She could have gone out back and looked at my garden before she rang the front bell. Well, yes, that is true. How would I know that Jack's mother exhibits her roses, wins prizes? Oh, that's true, too, Mother. Well, there are plenty of ways she could have found out. Name one. You just named me one. I could name you half a dozen. You could have asked questions around the neighborhood. And there is a record book of prize winners with stories of their backgrounds, their lives. You could have just made an educated guess. You Personally, I don't think this poor child did any of those things. Then you explain how she knows. I can't. No more than she can. I have. Jack told me about that garden and all about his mother, but... Well, it, it doesn't matter now. Well, what do you mean, Amy? I mean, I don't understand it, but obviously Jack doesn't want to marry me. Can't marry me. And regardless of what I think, what I believed happened, and it did, I know it did. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, where are you going? Back where I came from, of course, Midvale. Thanks for the tea. I'll be happy to take your bag to the well, door. Now, just and... one minute, just one minute. Amy, you can't go back to Midvale today. Why not? There's only one train from Newark to Midvale. I happen to know because I have a friend I visit in the asylum there. And that leaves at 9.30 in the morning. Well, I'll stay somewhere. At a hotel. You do no such thing. You'll spend the night here. With us. I can't have that. I won't have it, Florence. I'm not letting some tricky little character like her stay the night under my roof. Mother, we can't put her out. That simply wouldn't be decent. Human. No, I insist. She's got to spend the night, have a good, refreshing sleep. And then I'll drive her to the station after breakfast in the morning. I, I, I really can't put you out like this. Not another word, Amy. I won't take no for an answer. Now, let me show you to the guest room. Bring her suitcase, Jack. Okay. You come along, too, Mother. You don't need me. Oh, yes, we do. What for? Why, uh, I think it's going to be a chilly night. And you know where the extra blankets are. So do you, Florence. Please. Come on, Mom. I'm... I, I'm really sorry to bother you like this. And, uh, look, you, you needn't trouble about an extra blanket. The weather's warm, really. Here we are. Oh, wait. Wait, before you open the door. Yes? Jack described the room where I'd be staying, the, the guest room. I can tell you exactly what it looks like. Oh, you couldn't possibly. There's a big dormer window, like all old houses have, and, and chintz curtains. Good heavens. A big easy chair with an ottoman. The bed has a canopy, and the rug, it's a woven rug, oval, with a design of roses. But this is, this is incredible. Oh, Jack, you didn't meet Amy at State Teachers, did you? You didn't propose marriage? Oh, come off it, Florence. Well, this is the strangest thing, because... Well, Amy, you've described the room perfectly. Now, here, see for yourself. Yes. Just as Jack described it. Well, there's no understanding this. I, I, I just can't fathom it. You must have second sight. Or something. No, I... No more talk now. You're tired and upset. And what you need is a good nap. Dinner won't be for several hours. I'll call you when it's ready. Thank you. And you can look forward to dinner. We're having steak. New York cut, no less. Jack adores steak. New York cut. Amy. Jack. Quiet, I said. Just listen to me, darling. Darling? The dearest, most darling girl in the world. But I... Look, there's no time to explain. It's two o'clock in the morning, and I've got to get you out of here fast. I, I can't take a chance on my wife waking up and finding me gone. You are married. Florence is your wife. Yes, but we did meet, you and I, and I do love you and want to marry you. Oh, marry me when you're already married? Please, stop talking. Get this robe on. We've got to move fast. I... Where are we going? Out of this house. In Robin's slippers? Look, I'll explain later. Come on now, let's go. Where? Go where, Jack? Florence. Your wife, standing in the doorway. And, 
Jack's in her hand. Oh, Jack. Jack, what does this mean? What indeed does it mean? Why does Jack want to get Amy out of that house as fast as he can? What is Florence, his wife, doing with an axe in her hand? One thing is virtually sure. However incredible events for Amy have been up to now, they are as nothing to what lies ahead. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. G.K. Chesterton was fond of saying that an adventure was merely an inconvenience viewed in the right light. Perhaps then, one may say that the incredible is merely the credible viewed in the wrong light. However that may be, to come to the home of a man you expect to marry and to discover him already married, and on top of that, to find yourself facing his wife at two in the morning with an axe in her hand. Really, Amy? Mother was right about you after all. You are playing tricks. Oh, no. No, I, I assure you... Then what I... is my husband doing in your room at two o'clock in the morning and you in your nightgown? I, I, I can explain. Do that, Jack. Please do. First, give me the axe, Florence. Tempted to ask where you'd like it. Just explain your presence in Amy's room, Jack. Well, I, I thought I heard her cry out. I thought she might be in trouble. I, I came to see if she was all right. It's just a nightmare, Florence. I, I had a nightmare. That's hardly surprising with all you've been through. Well, I, I guess so. Could I have the axe now, Florence? Oh, of course. Here. You see, I heard you cry out too, Amy. You, you did? Yes. And I thought there might be an intruder in the house. Burglar, something like that. You keep an axe in your bedroom? Well, it's an old house. Very old. Our bedroom, Jack's and mine, has a fireplace in it. We keep a small supply of wood there. And sometimes it has to be split. You didn't think I was going to chop you, did you? No. I... Well, Jack and I will go back to our bedroom now. Come, Jack. Oh, and Amy. Yes? Try not to have any more... Nightmares. The more toast and marmalade, Amy. Oh, thank, thank you. No coffee. Then. No. Uh, frankly, I'm I'm anxious to get started. Get get that train for Midvale. I I don't want to miss it. You won't miss it. Plenty of time. Well, there really isn't, Florence. There's just under half an hour, and it takes fifteen minutes to reach the station. I know. I know. So, uh, I, I think we'd better get started, Amy. Your bag's packed and in the hall. So let's go. You. Well, I'll drive her to the station. I was planning to do that. No, I'll do it. No, Jack, no. Waste of gas. I mean, waste. You take her or I take her. What's the waste? I have to go into town shopping to do for the weekend. And you don't. I see. I can do my shopping at the same time. Yes, I see. So that'll mean only one round trip instead of two. I said I see, Florence. Saves gas. Yes. Well, uh, if we're going to get started... Oh, but first you must see the Rose Garden. No, no, I... Oh, but I... yes. I mean, how can you even think of leaving without seeing it? In some unaccountable way, you do know what it looks like. But, well, if I were you, I'd want to see it for myself. But there, there isn't time. Of course there is. Take a moment. Let's all go to the Rose Garden. And aren't these lovely? Hybrid teas. Yes, but, uh, you know, time... And this rambler. Isn't it gorgeous? Yes. Well, yes, you're, you're certainly to be complimented, Mrs. Morton. Thank you. Oh, but this isn't her garden, you know. It's mine, really. But Jack said... Jack said. Jack couldn't have said anything. Now, could he? Since you didn't meet him till yesterday. Or did you? Did you meet her at State Teachers, Jack? I've told you I never saw her before in my life. Yes. But I've been thinking. You know how I am? Oh, it's thinking. Sometimes... My head aches terribly. Oh, please, uh, we're going to miss my train. I think about so many things. 
I know you take this rose garden. She gets the credit for it. Always has got the credit for it. But I'm the one who designed it, created it, planted it. Even your father had to admit it was beautiful, Jack. Remember? Yes. Oh, how that man hated me, reviled me, scorned me. But even he admitted that my rose garden was a thing of beauty. Florence, we've got to go. Now. If Amy's going to get her train. Yes. Oh, yes. But first, I wanted to see these Florabunda. Aren't they gorgeous? They are, yes. Note the deep, dark red of the blossoms. Very dark. Very deep red. Lovely. Do you know why? Uh, cultivation, I suppose. Blood. Blood? Mr. Morton's blood. Jack's father's blood. This is where we found him. Hacked to bits. Oh, Jack, easy, I Mom. Can't easy, Mom. His blood had Florence, poured Florence. onto the soil, into it, saturating it. Would you believe that before that day, these roses had been rather weak, skimpy, subject to all sorts of diseases? But afterwards, they'd literally burgeoned with health and beauty. Would you believe that? Now, look, whether I believe it or not, we can't stay here another second. Why not? My train, that's why not. The only daily train to Midvale. Are, are you deliberately trying to make me miss it? But of course not. What a thing to say. I only wanted you to see the Rose Garden. Well, now that I've seen it, let's go. Please. Whatever you say, whatever you say. Uh, I'll go along too, Florence. You, Mother? Whatever for? Some... Uh, shopping for myself. Well, why not? We'll all go together. You too, Jack. Well, no. I, I'll i stay here. <laughs> not a chance, Jack. Not a chance. Oh, excuse me, but uh, while we're doing all this talking, time is slipping by. I don't want to miss that train. Of course you don't. But before we go, I do want you to know, Amy, what a pleasure it's been having you stay with us. Thank you. Of course, you haven't enjoyed it. Poor dear. But never mind. You're sure to find a husband so attractive, so pretty. Could, could we go now? Come on. Come on, Jack, Mother, Amy, get in the car. We just have time to make the Midvale train. Luckily, as you see, Amy, the garage fronts on the street. Luckily. Well, we can drive right out into the street and not waste time. Drive right straight out. Yes. Now, if the garage was in the back of the house, waste time, a minute or two, and we don't have it to waste. Could could we get started? Oh, you are in a hurry. Well, you said yourself we don't have any time to spare. That's why you don't have to tell me. I I'm sorry. I should think you would be. Well, here we go. Something wrong? Damp, I guess. Suppose you let me drive, Florence. How can you drive, Mother, if the car won't start? Mm. By the time the spirit won't start. Look, I I'll get a taxi. By the time the taxi gets here, your call and everything, you'd miss the train. But uh, we're certainly not going to get anywhere this way. The battery's wearing down. Correction. It's worn down. Oh, no. Well, that means I'll never make the train to Midvale. Well, now, I resent that, Amy. You sound as if spending another night with us here would be most unpleasant to you. Oh, no. No, no, I, I didn't did mean... We did try to make everything as pleasant as possible for you. Back in the house, all. Look, uh, if I went down to the corner and got a cab... Amy, yes? do as Florence says. Of course, Jack. Of course. Out of the car. Back in the house, all. Oh, look. Uh, a taxi. A taxi pulling up right in front. Oh, Oh, good heavens, I, I forgot. Joe! Joe? Who's Joe? Oh, my brother. All the excitement and all, I, I forgot. He he was coming to give me away. Okay, driver, thanks. Oh, no, Joe, wait! Keep that cab! Driver, don't drive off! Wait! It's all right, driver, go on. No, no, wait! Please, wait! Joe, hold that cab! Amy, Amy, what driver, in the world is... Driver, wait! Go on! Driver, go on. We don't need you. For criminy's sake, go stay. Go stay. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Amy. Oh, 
Mimi. Baby, sis, what is this? Oh, she's all upset. All upset. I'm Florence Morton. How do you do? Oh, uh, Joe Prentice, Amy's brother. <gasps> Amy, Amy, what's what? You understand, Joe. I may call you Joe. Oh, yeah, yeah. But... Amy's all upset. You know how it is getting married for the first time. Nerves. <laughs> oh, sure. Joe. You Jack Morton? Yes, I am. Ah, oh, glad to meet you, Jack. Great pleasure. And you're, uh, Jack's sister, huh? She's Let's all my... go into the house. Come on now, come on. Have you had breakfast, Joe? I have something on the train. Well, you want more than that. Eggs, bacon, toast, and marmalade, hot coffee. In the house, everybody. No, no. Amy, in the house. Amy, what's going on here? You're all acting like... Well, I, I don't know. You're... Wedding plans, Joe. Wedding plans. Everybody uptight. You understand. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh... Florence, is it? Florence. Everybody in. Everybody in. Well, now, here we are. All together once again. Joe. Yeah, Amy? Joe, there's something crazy going on in this house. Something real crazy. Now, Amy, honey. Joe. Joe, listen to me. There's something wrong. I don't know what it's all about. I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but Jack says he never saw me before in his life. What? And never proposed marriage to me, and then he did. And she, her, his wife, she came to my bedroom with an act in Hold her it, hand. for Jiminy's sake, hold it. Amy, you're not making sense. Oh, I know I'm not, because what's happening here, what, what, what's happened to me, it doesn't make sense Look, either. will somebody explain this? I'll explain it. Mr. Prentice, Joe, a mistake of some kind has been made. A mistake? Your sister, she... Well, I, I haven't wanted to spell this out in so many words, but since you're here now and can take care of her, Joe, I'm afraid your sister is crazy. You're afraid my sister is crazy? Well, she... She came here yesterday afternoon, arrived just out of the blue, out of nowhere, saying she'd come to marry my husband. You don't mean him? Yes, him. Jack. Jack. My husband. He's your... My husband, Jack, yes. Somehow your sister has got into her head that they met at teacher's conference and he proposed marriage, but, well, it's ridiculous. You, Jack. You say you never met Amy? No. Jack, last night in my room... Now, hold said... it, Amy, just hold it. Let me try to get this thing straight. You didn't meet her at a teacher's conference? State teacher's college? Not me. I'm an insurance salesman. This is plain screwy. Amy, if you say you met him and he asked you to marry him, I say you met him and he asked you to marry him. But he says... I that... never saw her, talked to her, knew anything about her until she arrived here yesterday. I see. Well, either you're a liar, Mr. Morton, or you're crazy. If anybody around here has lost his marbles, you have, not her. Now, Amy, what do you want to do about this? I just want to get out of here. And that's what we'll do. Where's the phone? Over there, but I'm afraid Let you're... me just call a cab and we'll blow. You can't. You going to stop me? The phone's out of order. Now, we'll see about that. That's dead all right. No wonder. The wire's been pulled out of the box on the wall. Now, what is going on here? Who pulled those wires out of the box and why? Come on, damn it, answer me. Who and why? You're like Jack's father. All male. He was a Taurus, a bull, strong, masculine like you. He thought like you. What are you, some women's liver? I'm me. I'm Florence Morton. And I don't take anything from you or anybody else. His father learned that the hard way. What do you mean the hard way? She killed him with an axe. Killed him. <laughs> killed him. <laughs> Hacked him to pieces. He had to be killed. I certainly wasn't going to live out my life with him dominating me. Stupid, he called me. Stupid, like that. One day I said to him, you call me stupid once more and I'll kill you. We're in the garden. Maybe you notice there's a wood pile in one corner, Amy. Yes. And there was this axe he used for splitting wood. You know what he did? No. Guess. Please. He picked up the axe and handed it to me. Go ahead, he said. Kill me, stupid. 
Was he surprised? Hacked him to bits. <laughs> to bits. Amy, come on. We're getting out of here. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Amy. Goodbye. This door's locked. It's bolted on the inside. Oh, I thought you knew. You didn't see me bolt and lock it when we came in? All right, give me the key. So you can unlock it? What else? Uh-uh. Now look, you... Joe, please, don't cross her. Please, don't cross her. She'll kill us all. Joe, Joe... Take it easy, Amy. We're not dead yet. Not yet, Joe. Not quite yet. Ever been face to face with a homicidal maniac? With everything stacked against you? Happily, I never have, and hope you never have either. But Amy and Joe are. And so are Jack and his mother. What I can't figure out is why Jack, with a homicidal wife at home, ever proposed marriage to Amy. Well, We'll have the answer to that when I return shortly with Act Three. Terror can be a thing so palpable you can feel it. Clammy to your touch. Ice cold in your veins. A taste of brass in your mouth. Certainly, this is what Amy Prentice feels, along with the Mortons and her brother Joe, as Florence Morton makes all too clear the fact that they are not going to leave the old house on Hilliard Street alive. Look, Florence, I don't get any of this. I don't get any of it except all this hate you got in you. You can't blame my sister for it, and you can't blame me. So we're leaving now. No. Joe, she's got a gun. I can see that, Amy. Question is, will she use it? Yes, yeah, she'll use it all right. You better understand something, Joe. She's a killer, a homicidal maniac. Then what the hell is she doing here? Why isn't she in an asylum? She was. She escaped just a day before I got back from the teacher's conference. Jack! Amy, I am sorry. So sorry. I pretended I'd never seen you before, tried to get you to leave before you set foot in this house because Florence was right there behind me all the time and I knew she'd kill you sooner or later. Kill you. Nine years. Nine long years. They kept me in that place. But I knew. I always knew someday I'd get out. But, Jack, if you're married to her... No, I'm not. Not anymore. I had the marriage annulled a year ago. The authorities agreed Florence would never be cured. So where are these authorities now? Didn't they figure she'd head straight for this house? They telephoned to let me know she'd escaped. Asked me to notify them if she did come here. And all the time I was talking on the phone, she had a gun against my head. You're going to die. You're all going to die. Not if I can help it, lady. You can't help it. There isn't a thing you can do. We'll see about that. One thing I don't believe in is just standing here waiting for you to kill us. Me, I fight fire with fire. Oh? And just how do you think you... Fight fire with fire? Fire! Oh, Florence, what do you think? Be quiet, saying? Jack. I'm thinking, thinking. Fire. Fire. You know, Joe, you've given me the idea I was looking for. I gave you... I've been wondering how to kill you all, all at once. And now I know. Into the kitchen. What for? You see, Mother. Into the kitchen, all. And now, Jack. Dear, loving husband, open the cellar door. You're taking us down to the cellar? Putting you down in the cellar, Jack. Open the door. Now, down into the cellar with you. You lead the way, Jack. Look, Florence. Don't you... argue, Jack. Just go. No, we're not... <laughs> My leg. You all right? Oh, Joe. If you may Joe. be able to fight fire, Joe, but you can't fight bullets. Oh. Now, Amy, help your brother down into the cellar. Oh, Joe. Take, take it easy. Oh. oh pain is... You're bleeding. I'll be okay. Oh. She hit me in the side. Fleshy part. Oh. You better let me have a look at that wound, Joe, okay? Okay. Oh. Let him bleed to death, Jack. 
It'll be easier for him. I'm sorry I can't make it easier for you all. Oh, oh, she's locked us in down here. Is there another door? No, there's not even a window. We're trapped. Absolutely no way out. Is there any way of breaking that door down? Prying it open. No, Joe, this is an old house. It's built when they really build them. Break that door down. No way. Oh. Look, try, try to hold still. It's it's not that bad, but it's bleeding quite a lot. I've got to stop the bleeding. Look, Amy. Yes, dear. Just around that corner, you'll find a desk. A uh, uh, desk? Yeah, I have my office set up there. Oh. In the bottom drawer on the right, you'll find a first aid kit. Now, bring it here, will you? Yes. yes. Oh, Jack. Jack, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of here? Mom, if I had the answer to that. Jack, there's a telephone here on, on your desk. Yeah, with the wires pulled out of the wall box. Florence didn't miss a trick. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, they are pulled out. Look, well, hurry with that first aid kit. Here it is, Jack. Here. Thanks. Have you patched up in a jiffy, Joe? Though, much good it'll do you, I'm afraid. Don't lose your nerve. Me, I've been in worse binds than this. Vietnam, for one. My work, for another. What do you do, Joe? I'm a cop. New York City Police Force. Man, I've been in spots that make this look like... Hey, wait. She's up there. That's not the kitchen. No, it's the living room, right above us. <gasps> what was that? She put something down on the floor, something <gasps> heavy and made of metal. What could it be, Jack? I don't know, unless it's... Wait a minute. What, Jack? What? Uh, metal? Fire? I, I keep a can of gasoline in the garage for the lawnmower. How big a can? Two gallons. Was it full? I'm afraid so, and I'm afraid I'm right. I smell gasoline. Oh, it's dripping down through the floorboards above us. She's going to set the house on fire. She's going to burn it down around our heads. And kill herself, the poor crazy woman. Florence! Florence, listen to me! Florence, you'll kill yourself! Strike a match and the gasoline fumes, the fumes, Florence, they'll explode. You're right. She lights that stuff. She'll never get out alive. Florence, will you listen? Will you please listen? Oh, oh God, she's done it. A house this old. It'll go up like a haystack, a dry haystack. It's all going to die. First alive. Oh, no. We gotta try that door. We gotta see when we break it down. Jack, give me a hand. We'll both get our shoulders against it. When I give the word. What? What? Let's forget it. The door's hot already. Flames on the other side. <coughs> Even if we got it open, we'd never get out. There's gotta be something we can do. It's got to be. What are the neighbors? Neighbors? Well, they'll see the house burning, call the fire department. Well, what could let to us? They'll rescue us. Get us out of no, here. Amy, honey, they don't know we're down here. Oh. Oh. Wait a minute. There's one chance. Just one chance. What, Joe? The telephone. No, no, no. I told you. Florence pulled the wires out of the wall box. We gotta see can we connect them again. You think you can? Or do you? Jack. Uh. What? Thank God you set up your office down here with a phone. Uh. If we can reconnect those wires. Let's get this wall box open. You got any tools down here? Yeah. Top door of my desk. One of those little kits. Here. What do you want? Uh. Uh. Screw yeah, here you go. Uh. Now, oh. get this lid open. Right. Easy, easy. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, right. hurry, Joe, hurry. Yeah, yeah. off of the lid. Oh, good. Oh, no. What, what? Three wires. Red, blue, and green. Three poles to attach them with. So attach them. Yeah, but which wire to which pole? Oh, it's Joe, 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 try something. What do you think I'm doing? Let's see. Red to this pole. Blue to this one. Green here. All right, see if you can get a dial to him. Got nothing. Try again. Joe, move it. Let's see. Put the red here. Blue. There. Yeah. Green on this pole. Okay. Anything, Jack? <laughs> That's it. That's it. I got a dial tone. Well, use it. Get the operator. Is this your operator? May I help you? Operator, I'm calling from a burning house. 37 Hilliard Street. <laughs> the fire department's just arriving, but they don't know we're in the cellar. We're in the cellar. Stand 
Right. Amy. What? Here. Oh. Fire chief just gave me another thermos of coffee. Have some more. Oh, thanks, Jack. Joe? I've got Joe in the ambulance unit over there. Oh. They're really patching up his leg. Isn't he wonderful? I-, I think I've got the most wonderful brother in the world. Well, I think he's got the most wonderful sister in the world. I'm, I'm sorry about Florence. Lord knows I am, too, but it's better this way. Mom, Mom, are you okay? Even the rose garden's gone. The heat killed everything. Maybe that's better, too, Mom. Oh, how could it be? How? I'm going to see to it you have another house, another rose garden, without the memories that went with this one. Memories we're all going to do our best to forget. So, what began as mystery, created by Florence Morton, ended as tragedy for Florence Morton. And uh, perhaps for the best, as Jack said. She is at peace now, and if in death she has not found a better world, as we very much hope she has, she's at least out of this one, which brought her so much unhappiness. I'll be back shortly. Jack and Amy Morton are happily married now. Amy no longer teaches, at least not in school, because she has two youngsters to keep her more than busy. The boy is named Joe. The girl, Florence. As for Mother Morton, she has another garden. But not roses, vegetables. Well, everything costs so much these days. Our cast included Janet Waldo, Ann Seymour, Lorene Tuttle, Bill Quinn, and Bernard Barrow. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Most people look upon their own everyday lives as being routine without much excitement. But that shouldn't stop anyone from having an active imagination. This is why we make our escape from the humdrum with stories of adventure, mystery, and murder. Another mental activity most people enjoy is fitting together the pieces of a puzzle. The stranger the shapes, the more challenging that puzzle becomes. Our present puzzle concerns a young man who is called upon to use all his wits in figuring out the whereabouts of a string of deadly pearls. Now, it's absolutely essential, Keith, that you understand the importance of this assignment. I believe I do, sir. If those pearls aren't recovered, and recovered soon, it's an established fact that someone else will die. I understand. And no matter what happens, no one on that island must have any idea who you really are or what you're doing there. Check. You better be a good actor. I think I can manage that. What do I have to lose? You could lose your life. Our 
our mystery drama, The Deadly Pearls, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Paul Hecht and Kate Reed. Although the FBI and the Honolulu police were in on the case, because of certain peculiar circumstances, it was important that the criminal be apprehended by a private investigator. This hazardous assignment went to Keith Spencer, a young man who had proved his physical courage in wartime service. But other qualifications were required for the job. As explained, when Keith had his final briefing in San Francisco with the head of the Gordon Investigating Service. Afraid we've given you a rough time these past few days. Oh, I didn't mind, sir. Only I am anxious to get going. Uh, you do type, don't you? Oh, sure. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to prove it, so let's do two things at once. Take over this typewriter, and yeah. I'll dictate some paragraphs. Okay, shoot. Um, uh, I, Keith Spencer, am unmarried... With no living relatives and no dependents. From this day forward and until the completion of this assignment, I have assumed the identity of Robert Keith Ryder. And under no circumstances will I reveal my true identity. Is that all? Yeah, if you'll sign it. Sure, got a pen. Here. Oh, I suppose you should have signed a statement about your ability to play bridge. What? You did assure us that you play at least an average game of contract. Well, sure, but I didn't realize it was all that important. It could be crucial. Our three suspects are avid bridge players, when they can find a fourth. Okay. Now, before I leave, let's go over the basic facts once more. All right. The missing pearls were cultured. A single strand, about 24 inches long. So they'd hang down about 12 inches if someone was wearing them. They don't sound very spectacular. Yeah, but they are. Jonathan Kohlmeyer, who bought them, was a partner in a watch company which made radium dials. And somehow he managed to have the pearls treated with radium so they would glow in the dark. When he first thought up this scheme, did he have an ulterior motive? Okay. Who knows? It was what happened later that we care about. And you don't think he started out as a murderer? Well, that's beside the point. He became one, and when he found out how easy it was, he did it again, three times. Now, clue me in. Who did he bump off first? The first woman he gave the pearls to was said to be very frail. When she died in an accident, Kohlmeyer was in a state of shock. So no one accused him of complicity in her death. Yeah, but apparently he did retrieve whatever presents he'd given her. Oh, yeah. He was that type. Then he got married. He gave the pearls to his bride, who wore them constantly. She loved that string of pearls. How long did she last? Well, radium can be a slow death. But it caught up with her after a while, and when she was dying, the doctors suspected radium poisoning. So why didn't they nail her husband right then? It never occurred to anyone to suspect the pearls. How could any smart murderer pull the same stunt again? He fell in love with a young and brainless beauty. Must have really liked her because he didn't give her the pearls for a long time. Not till he retired and they moved to Hawaii. What did she do to deserve such a present? <laughs> Started playing around with another man. Huh. That did it. Kohlmeyer gave her the pearls. She moved out, went off with the pearls and her new boyfriend to a scarcely inhabited island, a small one, well offshore from Oahu. And when she developed an unexplained malady, the boyfriend left her. Big-hearted guy. <laughs> well, after her death, there was an autopsy. And this time, no question. Radium poisoning. Now, why didn't the police move in and confiscate the pearls? There were no pearls to be found. Now, isn't it possible that Kohlmeyer had been there and gotten them? No way. Kohlmeyer committed suicide without returning to the islands. Without a confession about what he'd done. Good Lord, no. He was a respected businessman. Now, you think the pearls are still on the island? We're sure of it. But more than that, Keith... We've narrowed down to three people who lived nearest the cottage where the last victim died. So my job, then, is to make friends with these three people and find out quietly which one of them has the deadly pearls. Well, you make it sound too easy. Each of these people is highly eccentric. 
The few people who come and go from that island are under constant surveillance. <laughs> Including me. Naturally. The pearls were usually kept in a narrow box. It looked like an ordinary jeweler's box, but it was made of lead. Yeah, protection against the radium, of course. Means it would be heavier than most boxes that size. Well, that makes it seem more elegant. The box is covered with purple velvet and lined with satin. How original. I know. It won't look much different from any jewel box you've ever seen. Mm. I can't help thinking how useful a Geiger counter would be. That's totally out of the question. When you bring a Geiger near a suspected object, it starts ticking. Sure, sure, I know. No gadgets to make life easier. Just your own ingenuity. And it better be damn good. Well, there's not much more I can say, except to wish you luck. I did my homework, and the more I read about those three characters on the island, the more curious I was to meet them. The Honolulu police cleared me, and then I was completely on my own with a photograph of the cottage and a map that showed how to find it. I was given a putt-putt stocked with a supply of canned goods, stowed the typewriter and duffel bag, and at last I was off. It was a cloudless day, and I found the beaching cove on the island without any trouble. You couldn't see the cottage from the beach, but I knew how to follow directions. Lugging my big canvas bag, I headed up a steep and winding path. And there it was, a neat, modern cottage with an enormous deck from which there must be quite a spectacular view. But I had a spectacular view myself just then, because on that deck was a dazzling blonde, obviously sunbathing. She sprang to her feet in all her glory and... <laughs> I would have been speechless, except I knew I couldn't be. Who the hell are you? I, oh, uh, this, this is the Colmeyer Cottage, isn't it? What business is that of yours? <laughs> I'm the new tenant. <laughs> this place is not for rent. Uh, no, well, that's right, not anymore. I've signed the papers. It's mine, uh, for at least a year. Who are you? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, how rude of me not to introduce myself. I'm Robert Keith, a writer in search of a quiet place to hang a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. The last thing we need around here is a writer. Lady, I am planning to live here. Not if I can help it. Okay. Uh, I've answered your questions. How about answering one for me? Who are you? None of your business. Since you claim the house is yours, let's see you open the door. That's just what I was about to do. Now, I understand it takes two keys. And here they are. Both of them. Where'd you get those keys? Now, do you believe me? <laughs> Big deal, you opened the door. And now I know who you are. You're a policeman. They sent you here to spy on us. Well, I'm not going to stand for it. When the supply boat comes around tomorrow, I'll send a message back to my lawyer. No penny anti flunky is going to be spying on me. I assure you, I'm not Don't going to Don't bother to unpack your things, Robert Keith, because tomorrow... Oh, really, Miss... Uh... Mrs. Walsh. This is Barbara Walsh. And you'll find that I have protection against people like you. The gorgeously suntanned Mrs. Walsh slipped her feet into sandals, picked up her beach towel from the deck, and started along the path which led from the north side of the cottage. You must understand that during our entire conversation, Barbara Walsh was completely in the buff. No bikini. Nothing. Except around her neck and dangling in long loops over her well-formed body. Not pearls, but necklaces made of those decorative native seeds strung together. Ropes and ropes of them. Robert Keith may have thought he was prepared for anything... But this introduction to his new home was an unsettling experience he hadn't counted on. He has now had a most revealing look at one of the three suspects. We'll be there for his encounter with the others when we return shortly with Act Two. Robert Keith found the cottage very much to his liking. He had expected something rather dark and sinister. But 
One wall of the living room had a big picture window. And in the bedroom, there was a slanting skylight directly over the bed. It was certainly no place to hide. And Keith realized that whatever he did could be watched at close range, if anyone cared about what he was doing. He spent the first evening getting settled, and after a late supper of canned goods, he turned in for the night. At about three o'clock in the morning, he was sleeping soundly when... What the devil? Hey, hey, who's out there? Well, bless my soul. Hey, would you mind pointing that gun in another direction? Not until I find out what you're up to. Oh, look, I, I was sound asleep. I, I, I'm living here. No one lives in this house. Put up your hands. Now put down your gun, would you, sir? Sir, I'm a man of honor. Colonel George Madison's the name, army retired. And no one sets foot on this island without reporting to me. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know that, Colonel. And uh, if you'll come in, I'll, I'll show you my credentials. Uh, what the hell's that? Is, is there someone else out there? No, no. Wait a minute. I'll check you out later. Right now, I recommend you go back to bed. Oh. There's a wild boar under the deck, and I aim to get him. <laughs> When the sun came up, it was another cloudless day. And after breakfast, I decided to pay a visit. (laughs) Not eager to encounter either the gun-happy colonel or the wild-eyed lady with no clothes, it seemed wise to seek a formal introduction to the third island resident. The path to her property was overgrown with luxuriant shrubbery, but it opened up into an area dotted with palm trees surrounding a small stone house. Squatting in the midst of a flower bed was a gnome of a woman wearing one of those loose garments the Hawaiians call moo-moos. I wondered when you were coming. You were you were expecting me? Of course. You're the writer who's moved into the death cottage. Uh, moved into the what? Well, surely the rental agent told you that the three former tenants died there. I think you're just trying to frighten me, but I don't scare easily. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you, Mr. Keith? Well, you know my name. Well, since we're going to be neighbors, perhaps you'll tell me... I'm Nora Babcock. And if you'll help me up, we'll go to my porch where the coffee's perking. I assisted Miss Babcock to her feet. The aging body was stooped and slow-moving, and her hands were badly crippled. Yet she used them capably to pour the coffee when we were seated at a wicker table on her porch. Oh, yes, Mr. Keith. I've lived on this island for a long time. That house was just a shack when the poor man, a writer like yourself, was stabbed to death in a ghastly pool of blood. The cottage was rebuilt before an unfortunate woman was strangled there. And then it was fixed up with all that glass to let the sun in. But nothing could save the last dear lady who simply wasted away. Well, here's hoping I'll have better luck. That depends. When were you born, Mr. Keith? You mean what year? No, 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 the date. The day, the hour. Oh, um, I, I was born in August, uh, 14th of August. Oh. You sound disappointed. You certainly don't look like Leo. The lion. And I would have thought that a writer... Ah, oh, but no matter. There may be other factors. You belong to the northern sign of the zodiac. The middle point of the magnet of the fire triplicity. <laughs> Is that a fact? Oh, you'd better not laugh at me, Mr. Keith. I'll tell you right now that you and I are destined to be enemies. You belong with Sagittarius, Libra, or Aries. Ah, come on, Miss Babcock. I'm really not so bad. Now, tell me about your sign. I'm Gemini, the positive people of the air triplicity. You mean, you mean air and fire don't mix? Dangerously, Mr. Keith, very dangerously. Your sign is governed by the sun, and your gems are carnelian... And sardonyx. I wouldn't know a sardonyx if I stumbled over one. My governing planet is Mercury. Emeralds, moonstones, and pearls are my sign. And I have a very special affinity for pearls. Mrs. Walsh had obviously passed along word of my arrival, which was why the colonel had come trying to flush me out, and the reason Miss Babcock knew my name and occupation. So, that afternoon, I became a spy, hidden in the underbrush with binoculars trained on the three of them walking along the beach. 
I was darn sure they were planning some strategy to get me evicted. Then, Colonel Madison left the two ladies and headed up the trail toward my house. I went quickly to the typewriter and pretended to be busily at work. Hello there, Mr. Keith. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, uh, that it is. How are you, Colonel? Oh, couldn't be better. Say, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry about last night. Wouldn't want you to think we're not hospitable around here. Do you mind if I sit down? No, no, please, please do. I was beginning to feel like an outcast. <laughs> I gather you've met the ladies. Yes, they didn't exactly give me a warm welcome. Uh, oh, pay no attention. Batty old Babcock won't be a problem. She's usually off in outer space, you know, talking to the stars. I gather she's hipped on astrology. Oh, mad as a hatter. Even though she does play a good game of bridge. <laughs> Uh, you say you're also acquainted with uh, Barbara Walsh? If you mean, have I had a good look at her, you're darn right. Uh, <laughs> stunning, isn't she? <laughs> you said it. Well, look, tell me, Colonel, what's a woman like that doing all by herself way out here? <laughs> but if this were a British colony, I'd say she's a remittance woman. She's being paid to stay away? Yeah, being paid very well. The big man in her life is a, well, a, a mafia type. They nabbed him. My guess is the family's afraid she'll talk unless she's kept well out of the way until he's released from jail. What's he in for? Oh, drug traffic, I think. I don't know. Dealing in stolen goods. Uh, <clears throat> let's let's talk about you, Mr. Keith. You writer fellows interest me. What's your special subject? Well, I'm a novelist. Uh, science fiction sometimes, but mostly light stuff. Hmm. Know anything about pearls? <laughs> Uh, no, not much. Uh, How would you like to come over to the other side of the island and watch the pearl divers? Pearl divers? Uh, here? Oh, well, it's, it's not like Ceylon or the Sulu Sea, but they go through the motions here twice a week during the season. Occasionally they come up with a creditable pearl. Come along if you want to. Well, I'd like that very much. Fine. Oh, wear some stout walking shoes, and I'll pick you up in about, about an hour. The colonel arrived in his old army uniform carrying a sturdy walking stick. We started off on a barely marked trail and I marveled at the beauty of the place with its lush flowers and brightly colored birds. Not that way, Mr. Keith. We take a sharp turn over here. Go up the hill. Uh, uh, just a minute. Th this island must be more populated than I thought. I, I hear music. Oh, that's just Barbara Walsh with her radio going. She has it on all day long. That or a stereo. Come along. Get ready for a steep climb. The path went straight up, and I had to scramble to keep the colonel from getting too far ahead. But quite suddenly, all the lush greenery ended, and we came out on a rocky promontory overlooking the sea. Uh, uh, we made it. <laughs> That's quite a view. Hey. Now, you see those small boats way out there? Yeah. Those are the oyster fishermen. The, the flat-bottomed boats are dragging nets. Uh -huh. And from those kayak-looking things, you may be able to see the young men diving. Won't they come closer to shore? No, not, not much closer. It's too treacherous for the tides are running as high as they are today. Go on, out on that big rock so you can get a better look. Uh, is it steady? Oh, like Gibraltar. Go on, Mr. Keith, out further. Don't be afraid. But, uh, watch your uh, step, Mr. Keith. Uh, ah, ah, oh, merciful uh, heaven. Uh, help me, Colonel. Help, help me. Hang on, Keith, hang on. I'm trying to get a foothold. Here, here. Grab my walking stick. I grabbed the stick because I had to, even though I knew it was the same stick that had been pushed into the middle of my back. Just a moment before. Well, I'll say you're a brave man, Keith. I like the way you handled yourself back there on the rocks. I wouldn't say I had much alternative. Uh, it was all the fault of your shoes, Mr. Keith. That's what it was. I, I warned you to wear walking shoes. Uh, I say, Mr. Keith, why don't we stop by to see Barbara? Right now? 
Why not? We need a drink. <laughs> and she has a good liquor supply. Oh, I think I better get back and tend to these scratches. <laughs> Let's take a look at my clothes. I'm in no condition to go visiting. Well, as you wish. I'll leave you then at the foot of this hill. And, um, oh, yes, yes, I, uh, I've been meaning to ask you, Keith. Do you play bridge? Well, I'm not the world's best, but yes, I play. Oh, splendid. I'm rather out of practice. Well, heavens knows, so are we. Well, uh, let's say my house, Friday evening. Come for supper, round seven. Oh, thank you. Tell me, Mr. Keith, you did get scratched up. Your hands are still bleeding. Uh, perhaps I should go with you. No, I'll be all right. Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm off then uh, to tell the ladies the good news. Good news? Why, yes, yes. The good news that we found a new bridge partner. Uh, and I might as well warn you to bring our fat wallet. Our stakes are high. After a shower and some soothing applications of witch hazel and ointments, I rested on the big bed under the skylight. The front door was wide open for the benefit of a magnificent sea breeze. But suddenly I was on the alert. Someone, someone was on the steps leading to the deck. Then there were slow, heavy footfalls and the tap of a cane. Mr. Keith? Mr. Keith? Are you all right? Oh, why, hello, Miss Babcock. Yes, uh, come in. Oh, I heard you'd had an accident and I thought you might not be able to fix your own supper. So I've brought you some nice oyster stew. Oh, well, that's very thoughtful of you. There. It's one of my specialties. Just warm it up. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sit down. Uh, won't you share the stew with me? No, no, no. no. I, I've had my, my dinner. Uh, let me see your injuries. Oh, they're nothing but scratches. I was oh, lucky. Oh, I could be serious. And you are not lucky, Mr. Keith. I looked at the stars last night. And the heavens do not bode well for anyone born under the sign of Leo. But you see me alive and well. I could have crashed all the way down those rocks and into the sea. Look out for more danger ahead. That was simply the first warning. Miss Babcock knew what she was talking about. And it had nothing to do with the stars. I heated the oyster stew and it was delicious. In fact, the best I've ever tasted. But about an hour later, I began to feel drained of all energy. I thought it was just a reaction from a rather strenuous day and decided the best thing to do was go to bed and sleep it off. It was a tremendous effort to get undressed, but I managed to drag myself, partially clothed, onto the big bed. In a prone position, I, I felt as though I were being suffocated and panic was setting in. I'd been poisoned. And no one was going to save my life this time unless I did it for myself. Literally, I crawled into the bathroom for the well-stocked medicine kit. Yes, I was prepared with antidotes for poison, but time was too short to figure out which one would be appropriate. By now, my hands and feet were growing numb, and breathing was getting more and more difficult. I mixed up a heavy pink liquid in a and a glass of water, and just before blacking out, I was very, very sick. When I came to, I was lying on the bathroom floor, weak but grateful to find I was still alive. Very slowly, I got to my feet and staggered toward the bedroom, hoping at last to sleep off the effects of whatever had been in that poisonous stew. But my whole body sagged, and I knew I'd never make the bed, so I eased myself down on a narrow couch in the living room and fell instantly into a heavy slumber. Once again, it, it must have been about three o'clock in the morning when there was a sound which would have awakened the dead. The skylight in the bedroom, back flat against the wall. I waited for minutes that seemed like an eternity. No movement. Absolute silence. So I crept into the next room, armed with a flashlight, and cupping the beam, examined the bed. It was a mass of shattered glass. 
In the darkness once more, I moved stealthily to the front door, opened it without a sound, and stared into total blackness. Slowly I raised the flashlight and then snapped it on full beam, pointing straight down the path. Facing directly toward me stood the statuesque Mrs. Barbara Walsh, fully clothed in a long, dark kimono. And over her breasts hung a necklace of gems which burst into life like Fourth of July sparklers. I must warn you not to jump to conclusions. If you imagine that Mrs. Walsh was wearing the stolen pearls, think again. Diamonds are the jewels that glitter when exposed to light. A pearl is sometimes a gem of great value, but it is not a precious stone. And one can scarcely say that pearls sparkle, while radium... Remember the dial on your watch or bedside clock? Radium glows in the dark. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Mercifully for Robert Keith, the next two nights and three days were totally uneventful. He dozed in the sun, occasionally pecked at the typewriter, and did a great deal of thinking. Keith looked forward eagerly to the evening of bridge, and as he approached the colonel's house for the first time, he found a charming, sprawling building with a table set out of doors on what the Hawaiians call a lanai. He was glad he had purchased a colorful sport shirt in Honolulu, although it paled beside the one Colonel Madison was wearing over his white slacks. Even Miss Babcock looked festive in her flowered muumu. Hi. Ah, welcome, my boy, welcome. You're looking much better, Mr. Keith. Yeah, quite recovered, thank you. Now, this island air will cure anything. Anything but my arthritis. Where's Barbara? Oh, always late. I suspect she's getting herself decked out. <laughs> Ready for the kill. Oh. You expressed things so aptly, Colonel. <laughs> if it's like old times, Barbara will come prepared for murder at the bridge table. Oh, I'm speaking... Hello, hello everybody. Oh. oh, Barbara. Well, you've outdone yourself. Hey, dazzling. Simply dazzling. Oh, Colonel. And, uh, Nora, dear. Oh. Uh, I believe you've met Mr. Keith. My lawyer has verified that he exists. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Mr. Keith, you may have the right to live on this island, but that doesn't mean that I have to love my neighbor. Oh, no, 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 Barbara. However, since we have so little opportunity for social occasions, I propose we declare an armed truce. But I'm not at war with you, Mrs. Walsh. Speak for yourself. Peace for the evening. <laughs> Dinner began with oysters on the half shell. Six enormous oysters for each of us. And I shall be interested in your opinion of these, Keith. D delivered by my favorite fisherman, fresh from the beds this morning. Colonel, look. My horoscope said this would be a lucky day. Well, bless my soul. Oh, Nora has nothing on me. I found one, too. But I suspect you, Colonel. Come on, confess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I confess. <laughs> Party favors. There's a pearl in every oyster oh, shell. Oh, <laughs> rogue. I must say, this is rather a good one. Nice sheen. Oh, I love them. Every one. They feel so good. I thought the surprise was just for the ladies, but I see you've included me. Very pretty, Colonel. Well, let that be the beginning of your collection. Uh, I hope you won't mind if some of them are already pierced. You mean a pearl like this one has been removed from a string? Yes, that's right. Part of my hobby. I seldom find a string that meets my standards for matching, so I, I rematch them and mix them. Uh, but come, let's finish our dinner so we can get on to the battle. Afraid I'll have to pass. Uh, I say three no trump. Uh, well, four hearts. Five no trump. Barbara, do you have a ring on every finger? Uh, only on eight. Oh, I wish I could wear them. But my poor crippled hands. Oh, shut up, Nora. You're just trying to distract me. I have a contract to make. It was a cutthroat game, no question about it. 
Only, strangely, we were quite evenly matched. We played three rubbers, so I had my chance with each one as a partner. By this time, we were on a first-name basis. Well, that's it. And as usual, top honors go to the ladies. In points, let's see. Barbara's first, then Nora, followed by Bob. <laughs> and uh, as he's proper for a gracious host, I, I'm last. Uh, it'll take a minute to figure out who owes what here. I think the prize should go to Robert and me for that last small slam. <laughs> I wouldn't have dreamed that Leo and Gemini could work so well together. And tell me, Mr... I mean, Robert. Never Bob. Isn't there some way you could find out the hour of your birth? What rubbish. Well, if it would please you, Miss Nora, I suppose I could write and ask my mother. Oh, you do that. It's very important. Oh, Nora. Uh, speaking of my mother, you've all given me a very good idea. Look, I'd like to send her a present. A present for your mother? <laughs> You'll think I'm sentimental, but... Many years ago, my dad gave her a string of pearls as an anniversary present, and, well, they were her greatest treasure. Dad's been dead a long time now, and she was heartbroken when the pearls were stolen from her New York apartment. Oh, well, well, say no more. I'll fix you up. How much do you want to pay? Oh, now, just a minute, Colonel. I'm afraid you deal in merchandise that's too rich for my blood. I'm, I'm talking about a simple string of cultured pearls. A couple of hundred dollars? <laughs> now you're on the right track. Ridiculous. Yeah. Excuse me, everybody, but I'm very tired. Time to go home. Well, I'll be happy to escort the ladies. Don't bother with me. Perhaps you're not aware that I spend most of every night wandering around the island alone. Oh, go with them, Barbara. Or you'll have to help me with the dishes. Oh, that does it. Walking with Nora Babcock was a tortuous business, and I had a feeling she was in pain every step of the way. And we lost sight of Barbara, although she had an unsettling trick of appearing on the path, sometimes in front of us, sometimes behind. And when we reached the door of Nora's house... She's out there somewhere, and I don't want her to hear. If you'll come to my house tomorrow afternoon... I'd like to talk to you about those pearls for your mother. Fine. Uh, what time? Around two o'clock. Okay, be seeing you. Good night. And now you may have the pleasure of seeing me home. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a pleasure uh, and a surprise. You want to know what I have against you, don't you? I am curious. Well, come to my house for a nightcap and I'll tell you. What do you think of my pad? Exotic luxury. Mm, you writers have a way with words. But you don't fit the pattern. And what pattern is that? Oh, novelist, I despise them. Oh, come on. We're no different from anyone else. My husband was a woman hater who wrote about women and knew nothing about them. Oh, that man crucified me in his books. Well, I know, you're different. I could tell from the way you talked about your mother... Uh, come over here. Sit on the couch. Hmm. That's better. Hold my hand. You know... You know, it's been frightfully dull around here. Pretty hands. But uh, don't your fingers get tired under all those rocks? Take the rings off. It'll make you feel any more comfortable. Uh, now let's see. Rubies, diamonds, sapphires. <laughs> Suppose you'd never stoop to wearing something as simple as a pearl. On the contrary, my most prized possession, I own a string of priceless pearls. Over there in that velvet box. May I see them? I don't put them on display for just anybody. Uh, <laughs> if you're a good boy, I'll show them to you. Here. Let me freshen your drink. You have some fascinating things in this room. That uh, Buddha, for instance. It's carved from jade. And, uh, ah, are these the pearls? Put down that box. Oh, you said you'd show them to me. But it's locked and I, uh, I have to get the key. Oh, yes, Bob. I said I'd show you the pearls. If you're a good boy. And I will. Tomorrow morning, after you spent the night. When I was
was having breakfast next morning in the sunshine on my deck. Uh, yes, I was alone. I had not spent the night with Barbara Walsh. In my line of work, it has to be business before pleasure. <laughs> there was no need to accept a bribe. You see, when I picked up that purple velvet jewel box, it was light as a feather. But, as I was saying, while eating breakfast... Well, good morning. You're a late riser. Yeah, I went to a big party last night, Colonel. Come on, have a cup of coffee. I brought you something. Uh, don't pay any attention to the looks of the box the velvet's worn. <laughs> it's been around for a while. It's what's inside that counts. I'd be glad to sell you the pearls. Hmm. Open the box. Oh, they're beautiful. But these are not the ones we were talking about last night. I mean, this is a double strand. Obviously far more expensive. I know, I know. They can be sold for several thousand dollars someday. But my price to you still stands. Oh, no, 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 Colonel. I, I just can't accept it. My good man, I'm offering you the kind of bargain that comes once in a lifetime. But it'll never do for my mother. Don't you have something else? Yes, of course I do. I thought I owed you a favor. Oh, you owe me nothing. Oh, please, Colonel, if you'll let me go to your house, perhaps you could show me another string that would be... I, 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 I'll I, show you nothing right now. Good morning, sir. The Colonel stomped off, and I knew I would have to change my approach if I wanted to look at his collection. Then I'd think about that later, because my next appointment was with Nora Babcock. Come in, Robert. Didn't we have a good time last night? You can be my bridge partner anytime. That's very sweet. Uh, I, I meant to ask you, how did you like my oyster stew? Well, the taste was superb, but... Uh, uh, didn't it help you to go to sleep? <clears throat> Look, I'll level with you, Miss B. You put something in that stew, didn't you? Oh, I, uh, the usual dash of chili sauce and, and, and plenty of rich cream. No, 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 I mean... I mean something... something bad. Oh. <laughs> I don't understand. That stew made me deathly ill. Why, I, I wanted you to sleep well after your accident, so I did put in a drop or two of my sedative. The kind that helps me. Uh, from one of those bottles. Uh, perhaps it shouldn't have been combined with the seafood. Yeah, perhaps. I thought you were trying to poison me. How could you have such thoughts about a poor old lady? I take them all back. Mm -hmm. When is your mother's birthday? Oh, sir, it's in June. Like yours. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. My pearls were a present, and nothing would please me more than giving them to a Gemini. Oh, that's that's very generous of you, but oh, I... Please, I just... get the pearls for me, Robert. On that cabinet over there. Okay. You, you'll find the box is rather heavy. You say these pearls were given to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. By the dear lady who lived in your cottage. I took care of her, poor thing. And before she died... She gave me her dearest treasure. Open the box and tell me what you think. I think they're perfect. Oh, you don't know the best part. These pearls have a magical quality. Just wait until you see what happens to them at night. Uh -huh. Pick uh, them up, examine them. Yeah. I like the way they look against the satin. Oh, how I love them. Nora, just... When do you wear these pearls? Oh, they're not for wearing. At least not for me. I like to fondle them. And before my hands got so... so bad, I used them the way the Greeks do. You, you know, worry beads. <laughs> I've often taken them to bed with me. Nora, these hands of yours... Oh, it's, it's not my hands. You see how hard it is for me to get around. Yes, I know. Uh, have you been to a doctor? No use. I have my medicines, though they don't do much good. I know a fine doctor in Honolulu. I, I think he can help you. Will you let me take you to him? Oh, I couldn't let you do that, Robert. It's not in the stars. How many times have I told you? I've been warned never to trust a Leo. Look, Nora, for reasons I won't trouble you with... And... <laughs> that, of course, I wouldn't want the colonel or Barbara to know. I'm not the person I've pretended to be. Would it make any difference to you if I told you I was actually born on January the 2nd? 
Why, all the difference in the world I should have known. We were destined to be friends from the very beginning, Mr. Keith. Yes. Uh, just Keith. That's my real first name. I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. Case closed. Miss Babcock's destiny was not written in the stars, even though she went to her grave believing it was. The deadly pearls were taken out of circulation, and Nora Babcock was given the best of care in a hospital where they did what they could to ease the pain during the short time she had left to live. It was thought best not to shatter her dream, so she never knew that Keith Spencer was an orphan or that her treasured pearls had been anything but a comfort. I'll be back shortly. Keith Spencer found a good deal more on that island than the missing pearls. He stepped into the lives of three people whose philosophies did not agree with his, yet with each he had at least one point of mutual understanding. Our mystery was solved with the apprehension of a victim rather than a culprit. Our cast included Kate Reed, Paul Hecht, Grace Matthews, and Kurt Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... G. Marshall. You've come to the right place. Here we present a unique kind of drama. Drama that uses your ears to stimulate your fears. The story you are about to hear concerns another part of the human anatomy. It's a tale about a very frightening pair of hands. Not because they're ugly or mutilated or because they do evil things. On the contrary, the hands of our heroine do nothing at all. And therein lies her terror. But there's one other subject our story deals with. And it's the most mysterious of all. The human mind. Our mystery drama, The Hands of Mrs. Mallory, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way. Because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, 
Well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? What's for dinner? ShopRite suggests lean, savory smoked ham. Shank portion, just 69 cents a pound. Butt portion, 79 a pound. Choice grade first cut chuck steak, 69 cents a pound. Pen Dutch noodles pound package, 49 cents. Crown top white bread, just 39 cents for a 22 ounce loaf. For a quick meal, serve banquet frozen 10 ounce dinners. All varieties except beef or ham are just 39 cents. Check the store wide values at ShopRite. You'll find a lot more for a little less. She loves her family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right to the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. Think of the most beautiful day you can imagine. A day so perfect that the birds are singing its praises. And even the people who line the park benches, those roosting creatures who seem to exist in a vacuum without emotion, seem happy and contented today. But there's one exception. A lady of middle years who sits alone on a bench. Is it her glum expression that has driven away other people? Or well, perhaps it's the obvious elegance of her mink stole and the glistening perfection of the diamond on her finger. Hey, lady, is this seat taken? No. It's okay if I sit here and wait for my brother? He's playing in the ball game. How nice. He plays first base. Hey, you want to see my baseball? Uh, not especially. It's got Reggie Jackson's autograph on it. Here, look at it. No, please, I, I, I really don't know. What? Uh, what's the matter with your hands? Nothing. It's... They're just a little stiff, that's all. Now, why don't you go watch your brother play? Well, he says I jinx them. Gee, your hands look funny. I mean, can't you move them at all? No. As a matter of fact, I can't. Gee, that's funny. I never saw anything like that. How come you can't move your hands? It's a kind of a sickness. You wouldn't understand. But maybe if you explained it to me, I would. Yes. If I could explain it to you, son, I would be very happy to do so. You don't know how happy. Come in, Ida. Have a seat. I always feel so guilty when I take your time. Each examination seems to produce exactly the same result. Well, that's no reason not to keep examining you. Then there isn't any change. No, Ida... No change. Well, what have you been doing lately? Well, I've been sitting in the park a lot. <laughs> I see. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I have this glamorous terrace. I could sit there like a queen and view the whole park and all the people in it. But I prefer to sit on a bench and watch the squirrels and listen to the children. Well, I think that's a good thing, frankly, to be on the ground... In touch with things. Herbert never believed in that. Herbert liked to get away from the smell of the crowd. Yes, that was the phrase he always used. The smell of the crowd. My husband knew a great number of unkind phrases. Well, I never knew him, of course. No. Oh. Neither did I, I suppose. Even when he was lying in his coffin. I felt as though I were saying goodbye to a stranger. And after Mr. Mallory died... How soon after that did the paralysis set in? Oh, it was about a month. Yes, a month after, I suppose. That soon? Yes. And now it's been how long since you haven't been able to move your hands? Five years. Can you believe it, Doctor? Hmm. I can't. After the first six months of this terrible paralysis, I thought I, well, I couldn't go on living with these stone fingers of mine. I thought it would be preferable to be dead. But you never lost hope of a cure. No. I mean, that's what's kept me going. The hope of a cure. Oh, and something else. I suppose one must say a kind word for money. 
If there was one thing Herbert did in his life, he managed to leave a very rich widow behind him. Ida, I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to say. Doctor, you don't have to say it. I know what comes next. You're going to advise me to get out of myself, to stop thinking about my poor hands and think about other people. Charity work. Well, Ida, that's one suggestion. Oh, if you knew how many charity committees use my name, or how many thousands of dollars I give to every foundation with an impressive name. Ida, I was going to talk about going back to that psychiatrist. Oh, that. I honestly think you gave up too soon. If you'd given the man a chance... Dr. Merritt, my hands are paralyzed. I'm not imagining it. They're paralyzed, frozen, insensitive. You've made all the tests yourself. Do you think I've been faking? No, 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 of course not. The illness is genuine, but but sometimes the origin of an illness of this nature can... It's all in the mind, yes, of course. All in the mind. So easy to say that, isn't it? So many doctors have told me the same thing. It's so much easier to blame my mind than their own failure. Ida, please. Doctor, excuse me. It's time for me to go. You've got lots of patients waiting for you. Some of them you might even help. Hey, hi. Oh, it's you again. Waiting for your brother? Nah, he's not playing today. Oh, that's too bad. It's a lovely day. He broke his leg. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, is that what happened to your hands? I mean, did they get broken? Mm, something like that. Well, do you feel anything at all? I mean, like your fingers? You're a very curious boy. Did anyone ever tell you that? Can I just catch him, lady? Please? No, please don't. Hey, hey, you kid, now cut that uh -huh. out. Well, Stop I... bothering this lady, you hear me? I wasn't bothering her. All right, was... now go on, get out of here, leave her alone. Okay, okay. I just wanted to touch her hand. I'm sorry, ma'am. I just couldn't help overhearing. Uh, thank you. He was getting a little too bothersome, although I'm sure he didn't mean any harm. Well, I could see that you were getting annoyed. Ted? Ted? Yeah, oh, yes, I'm over here, Melinda. Lend me a hand, huh? I can't manage two hot dogs and a bag of peanuts and two crutches at the same time. Oh, sure, honey. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, this one's yours, with the mustard. Thanks. Do you think I could sit down? Of course. Ted, would you grab that crutch? Yeah, I got it. Listen, I told you that I'd get the hot dogs. I mean, you didn't have to be quite so independent. <laughs> That's funny. You're always complaining that I'm not independent enough. Oh, am I crowding you, ma'am? Oh, no, no. Plenty of room. Ted, who, who was that boy I saw running off? Oh, I drove him off. He was uh, bothering this woman. Oh, dear. Oh, are you all right? Oh, yes, I'm fine. As a matter of fact, he was telling me about his brother's accident. He hurt his foot. I guess this must be the season for accident. You mean these crutches? I'm afraid that was another season. Hey, you know, gee, it's warm, isn't it? Huh? For this time of year? <laughs> of course, you're warm. Saving fair damsels and all that stuff. I didn't know you were a regular St. George, Ted. Yeah, sure I am, with kid dragons. <laughs> uh, would you like some peanuts, ma'am? We've been trying to give them away to the squirrels all day, but we haven't seen any. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I don't like peanuts very much. I can't imagine what squirrels see in them. <laughs> don't worry. My brother will happily eat them all by himself. Your brother? Uh, oh, I'm Melinda West. This is my brother, Ted. And my name is Mrs. Mallory. How do you do? Uh, haven't I seen you two here before? Oh, you probably have. We live close to the park. Are you from around here, Mrs. Mallory? Oh, yes. I live in that building right there. Oh. What a view you must have. Uh, can you see the park from your window? Oh, yeah. Oh, if I had a window like that, I'd never come down to the park. Well, of course, these crutches sort of discourage you walking around very much. Do you both live in the city? No, no, we're from Ohio. We've only been here about two months, but uh, I guess we'll be going back soon. Don't say that. Don't even think that, Ted, please. I'm sorry, Melinda. I, I didn't I mean to... I gather that uh, you don't want to leave. Well, not if it means that... Well, the truth is we came here to see a doctor, a, a surgeon who specializes in cases like mine. You... See, I was in an automobile accident two years ago. I haven't walked since. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you must feel. You know, people always think they do, but they really can't... Ah, uh, Melinda. What? I think your brother is trying to signal you, Melinda, about me. What do you mean? He means... These... My hands. Oh. oh. 
I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't even realize. No, some people don't realize that I can't move them. See, as long as I sit here very quietly, my whole body is as immobilized as my hand. Yes. Now I know what you mean. I know how tempting it is to just want to sit, be a statue, so that for a little while you can forget that part of you is dead. Oh, come on, Melinda, please. Let's cut this out, huh? Please. Tell me more about this surgeon. I can tell you what he said in one word. One two-letter word. Oh, dear. He won't operate, then. He said it wouldn't do any good. Now, he turned us down flat. That's why I want Melinda to let me take her back home. Oh, well, do you have parents there? No. No, no, we have no one. Uh, but I don't want to go back. I, I don't. I want to see... What were you going to say? Never mind, Mrs. Mallory. Now, come on, Melinda. You finished your hot dog. Let's, let's go home. Ted, let me tell her. Let me ask well, for her. For Pete's sake, what kind of nonsense is this? What do you want to bother the woman for? Because there's no one else I can talk to about Dr. Griff. I, I can't talk to you about him. You just get red in the face and stomp away from well, me. There's nothing to talk about, and I'm sure Mrs. Mallory isn't interested in fairy stories. I really don't know what either one of you is talking about. Who is Dr. Griff? Oh, he's a quack, a phony. Ted. Well, that's all he is. A two-bit faith healer who robs every cripple he can get his hands on. You don't know anything about him. You only met him once. Yeah, well, that was enough. I could tell in one second that the man is a fake. He can't cure a broken spine. But why not let him try? Somebody has to try. I don't want to be the way I am. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, I don't want to be this way. Help me. Help me, please. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory's physician would be very pleased right now. At last, his patient seems to be taking his advice to interest herself in the outside world, in problems other than her own. But how involved will those problems become? We'll wait to find out until I return shortly with Act Two. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for do me. I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, huh? that's easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself... I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be car. sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a G small island in the South Pacific. Guam. Guam. <laughs> There's a very special deal going on at all offices of Suburban Savings throughout North Jersey. It's called Suburban Special Interest Deal. And you'll be especially interested in the savings you get. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum deposit $2,500. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is subject to a substantial penalty. Suburban compounds interest continuously from day of deposit paid quarterly. So you not only get interest on your savings, you get interest on the interest. And Suburban offers you the highest interest rate allowed by law. Here's your chance to get a great savings deal. A top 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate. Why not deal yourself into Suburban Savings special interest deal at any Suburban Savings office in northern New Jersey? Located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne. The good weather is holding in the city, and Mrs. Ida Mallory has returned day after day to her bench in the park. A bench which seems to have become her property by right of eminent domain. But even Mrs. Mallory would have to admit that her interest in these daily visits is no longer restricted to sunshine and green grass. Each day, she hopes for another glimpse of the young couple. 
the scowling brother, and his pretty, pathetic sister. And then, on the fourth day, there they were. Excuse me. I don't know if you'll remember me. Why, of course. You're Mrs. Mallory. The lady with the view. (laughs) Yes, that's right. How are you both? Oh, we're okay. Well, I really didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. Don't be concerned about the way Ted looks. His face always is like a thundercloud. Especially when we discuss the forbidden topic. I suppose you mean that doctor. Yeah, she talked me into seeing him again. You know something? Every feeling I had about him the first time was confirmed. That's really impossible, Mrs. Mallory. Tell me something. Is he a real doctor? Well, I'm not sure he's a medical doctor, Mrs. Mallory, but I'm sure he's entitled to the degree. Maybe a, a doctor of psychology or something like that. I'll tell you what he's entitled to. A good swift kick in the... I'll tell you one thing about Dr. Griff. He's the only one, the only one who said he could help me. He didn't promise. He just said he was hopeful. Well, that's something anyway. Yeah, I'll tell you what he's hopeful about, getting your 500 bucks. He says he's very hopeful I can be cured. And that's worth a great deal more than $500. All right, go on. Tell her the rest. Tell her the real clincher. Are you afraid to? What do you mean? Mrs. Mallory, you're an intelligent woman. So listen to how Dr. Griff plans to cure my sister. I know it sounds sort of melodramatic. Oh, it's but... idiotic. That's what it is. Please. Please, I'd still like to know. Well, he says he uses something called the water of faith. See what I mean? The water of faith? Yeah. Sounds sort of, um, hmm, religious. Like, um... Uh... The holy water at Lourdes. It's it's related to that, yes. Oh, now do you see why I say the guy is an out-and-out fraud? The water of faith. Where are we? Back in the Middle Ages? Well, I must admit it does sound sort of odd. Just the same. He said that it works. That it's worked for dozens of people. He wants $500 for the treatment. With but... no guarantees, you understand. Hmm. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, will you help me, please? Will you talk some sense to this woman? Oh, my dear. I mean, I have to admit, it really doesn't sound reasonable. You mean the $500? Oh, but it's a very special treatment, Dr. Griff said. Well, I meant it's not reasonable to assume that such things can do any good. I see. So I'll never know. Is that it? I'll just turn around and take a plane back to Ohio and live out the rest of my life as a cripple. And for $500, at least I might have had a chance to live. Yes, I see what you mean. Ted. Oh, I hope you don't mind my calling you Ted. Oh, no, no, of course not. Your sister, well, she may have a point there. I mean, even if it is a waste of money, perhaps she'll never be happy unless you let this man try. If not, she'll always wonder about it. Always. Yes. Yes, I know that. That's what his whole bag is, making you wonder if it just might work. And, well, about the money, I don't know how to say this, but you see, $500 may seem like a lot to you, but it isn't to me. So if I can help you... Oh, no, no. Oh, no, please. Absolutely not. It's not really a problem, Mrs. Mallory. We've got the money. Besides, it's not the money so much as, well... Seeing Melinda disappointed again. I've had so many disappointments, you see. Yes. Yes, I know all about such things. Oh, dear. Yes, of of course you do. You see what a selfish person I've become. I keep forgetting that you have your own affliction. I'm not sure that it isn't even worse than mine. To lose the use of your hands. Well, never mind about me. What, What are you two going to do? Oh, I don't... It looks like I'm outnumbered on this thing. Dad! Does that mean you... You'll let me do it? You'll let me? Well, if you go back without trying this dumb water of faith, you'll always regret it, so... Okay, let's get it over with. Oh, Mrs. Mallory! Oh, thank you, thank you. You're the one who did it. Oh, my dear. I just hope your miracle happens. All my life, I wanted to believe that miracles happen. Melinda? Melinda? Wait a minute. Oh, oh, Mrs. Mallory. Well, you move faster on those crutches than I do on my two feet. You're, You're not here alone, are you? No, Ted's with me. 
I just wanted to take a little stroll by myself. No, that isn't true. We just had another fight, and I had to get away from him. Oh, dear. Now, that doesn't sound too good. Well, you know how Ted is. Well, I haven't seen you for two days. How are you? The truth is, I don't really know. But I've I started treatments, Mrs. Mallory. With Dr. Griff? Yes. I started about five days ago. And it's... It's nothing at all like what I expected. Well, tell me about it. Well, do you remember how silly it all sounded, this water of faith business? Well, it sounded a little theatrical. But it isn't. It's scientific, Mrs. Mallory. That's the most wonderful part of it. Dr. Griff only used that phrase as a, as a convenient description of, of the, the drug. What drug is that? Well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I I have the feeling that, that there might be something slightly illegal about it, the, the drug oh. he uses. A psychedelic suggestion. Psychedelic suggestion? Now, what on earth is that? Uh, it's the technique Dr. Griff uses. He, he uses it to, to liberate the mind from its control over the body... Whenever that control is negative. I'm sorry. You know, I really don't understand that kind of talk. Well, I'm not saying I understand it myself. Completely. But it does sound to me as if he believes that your illness is psychosomatic. I don't know, Mrs. Mallory. All I know is that I have to go through with it. Kill or cure. It isn't a dangerous treatment, is it? No, no. I, I'm sure it isn't. It, it's, well, it's more like a sort of... A hypnosis. I go to his office, he administers the drug, and then he talks to me. And that's all there is to it. And has it helped? I I think I'd better go back to Teddy. He, he he's probably getting worried about me. Melinda, please tell me if Melinda, look out! The bicycle! Oh! Melinda. Melinda. Melinda, oh. are you all right? Oh, you let, let me help you. Let me? Oh, you idiot. I mean, can't you what? see that that girl is crippled? Quick, give me that crutch. Oh, yes, sure. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I think I, I can manage to pick myself up this way. Now, just, just take it easy. Mrs. Mallory. What is it? Are you hurt? No, no. No, it, it's my leg. D did you see that? My leg... Bane slightly at the knee. No, no, I didn't see Look, it. Look, Miss, if you're sure you're okay. Oh, get out of here. Go away and be more careful next yes, time. Yes, oh, Miss Ma Mrs. Mallory, I'm sure it happened. I, I saw it happen. My leg moved. For the first time in two years, it moved. <laughs> I can't find any reference to this Dr. Griff in any medical directory. But that doesn't prove he's a fraud, though, does it? No, no, of course not. And as you say, the man may not be a medical doctor. I certainly hope he isn't. Well, why do you say that? Pride of profession, my dear. We don't like to have faith healers bearing the same credentials. And that's what you think he is, a faith healer? Well, of course. Oh, I'm not knocking the power of faith far from it. Very often, it's simply another way of getting at psychosomatic difficulties. Oh, I hate that word. I know you do. Oh, I've been through all that psychosomatic nonsense. All those doctors who tried to tell me that my paralyzed hands weren't, well, what they are. That there's something in me, some emotional problem. You didn't give them much chance to prove or disprove it, either. I did. I submitted to their therapy, even if I didn't believe in it. And it didn't do the slightest bit of good. Well, maybe if you had believed them, it would have. Flesh is flesh, Doctor. Bone is bone. That kind of therapy can't make my hands move any more than it can make that poor girl walk. And I have a good mind to tell him so. Please come in, Mrs. Mallory. Thank you. Won't you have a chair? All right. Well, 
Do you mind if I ask who referred you to me? Well, actually, it was one of your patients, Melinda West. Yes, yes, of course, a very charming young woman. Have you known her long? Just a few weeks. See, I haven't seen her for the last ten days or so. How is she coming along? Well, actually, you'll get a chance to see her soon. She has a three o'clock appointment with me, which is only a few minutes from now. So, if you wouldn't mind telling me what's on your mind, Mrs. Mallory. Well, I just thought it would be um, worthwhile talking to you, Doctor. About yourself? Well, as you can see, I am afflicted. Uh, do you mind if I look at your hands? Yes, frankly, I'd rather you wouldn't. Not just now. I'd, I'd rather hear something about yourself, about this uh, treatment of yours. Melinda said something about a technique you used called uh, psychedelic suggestion. Now, just what is that? It's a medical principle. As old as mesmerism, as new as chemotherapy. The power of mind over body. Uh, psychosomatic. Well, who knows what afflictions is psychosomatic. Some illnesses start with the emotions, some with the body. And more often, it's a combination of both. Really? Germs aren't imaginary. Viruses are very real little creatures. Yet the mind has strange powers over them to make them hurt us or to render them harmless. All right, then. What about a broken leg? Can the mind cause that? Of course. If you use your head, you wouldn't break your leg in the first place. Oh. <laughs> You're thinking of Miss West, of the fact that she suffered a spine injury. That's right. I hardly see how you can correct something like that. You've seen her x-rays then? Mm, no. You believe the damage is neurological? Well, I know nothing about it. That's strange, Mrs. Mallory. You certainly seem to have an opinion. <laughs> Be careful, though. You don't have a medical degree. Someone might call you a quack. Listen, Doctor. I came here... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Mallory. Ah, Melinda. I'll be with you in just a minute. No. No, come to think of it. Why don't you come in now? There's a friend of yours here. A friend? Oh, it's I, Melinda, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, how nice to see you. Come in, Melinda, please. Melinda... Your crutches. Where are your crutches? Look at me, Mrs. Mallory. I can walk without crutches now. I'm not very steady, but I can walk. Well, there goes at least one of Mrs. Ida Mallory's cherished notions that the mind can't cure the body. But she sees the evidence of her own eyes. And something tells me that this is one prejudice she's willing to give up. After all, she wants to believe in miracles. And don't we all? Mrs. Ida Mallory has spent a sleepless night, dreaming of things she never thought possible. But when the sun streamed in her windows, her first thought was to get out into the park and with only one hope, of seeing Melinda West again and seeing her miracle confirmed. It's true. It's really true, Mrs. Mallory. Even Ted has to admit it. Well, I guess there's something to it, all right. I haven't seen my sister off those crutches in two years. But how did it all happen? I don't really know. As I told you, he, he used this drug. He made me go to sleep. And then he simply talked to me. At first, there was nothing, and then I started feeling life in my legs again. Well, you saw me that day in the park when I fell down. Oh, Melinda, Melinda. I, well, I just can't tell you how happy I am for you. Well, and what are your plans now? Oh, go home, I guess. I've got to get back to my job if it's still there. The treatment costs much more than we thought it would. Yes, the oh. 500 went in no time at all. Then he asked for another thousand. He said it couldn't be helped. The drug he uses is so horribly expensive. Now, listen. I told you once that if there were any way I could help you out financially... Uh-uh. No, no. No, that's out, Mrs. Mallory. We'll we'll manage okay. Of course we will. Well. <laughs> and I can go back to work now. I can do anything I want now. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that must be a wonderful feeling. To be able to do anything you want. <laughs> Uh, 
Ah, Mrs. Mallory. Please come in. Thank you, Doctor. You know, it was really very good of you to see me on such short notice. That's quite all right. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I don't quite know where to begin. Well, suppose I begin for you. You've been thinking about Melinda West. Yes, I saw her only this morning. She really is cured, isn't she? Yes, Mrs. Mallory. In my opinion, the young woman was cured. But you realize that all I really cured by psychedelic suggestion was the illness that existed in her mind, not her body. But I still don't fully comprehend it. I'm sure there was no real neurological damage to the girl. Oh. I think her bones and muscles and nerves were all in the proper place and functioning normally. Only her mind wasn't. But she seemed so sensible. Mrs. Mallory, do you know the story of that accident? I beg your pardon? Did Melinda ever tell you exactly what occurred that caused her injuries? No. No, as a matter of fact, she didn't. She simply said it was an automobile accident. That's correct. And she was the driver. Oh. There were two other passengers, her mother and her father. Both of them were killed. Oh, dear Lord. She did sustain some injuries in the crash. But it was apparent to me that they were not sufficiently grave to cause her the total paralysis she suffered. Ah, uh, you mean she felt that guilty about what had happened? Mm. Guilty enough to seek punishment for herself. And she did. She punished herself by losing the use of her legs. And, and so, your treatment was able to cure her. Yes, I'm happy to say. But, of course, it couldn't cure... Someone like me. What was that? I said it couldn't cure me. See, I didn't lose that use of my hands for any kind of reason like that. I mean, it's just some sort of nerve damage. Doctors could never explain it. Well, if that's the diagnosis of your physician, that it's purely physical and incurable... Oh, but I didn't say that. See, I mean, my doctor has never used the word incurable. I have been hoping for years that it would just heal itself. I can't go on living like this. So helpless and so useless. Uh, Mrs. Mallory, have you come here to talk about Melinda West or yourself? Myself. Hmm. I want my hands back. Oh, dear God, I want my hands. Yes, I was afraid that's what you had in mind. Afraid? Why? Because if you had any idea of becoming my patient, I, I regret to say that it's not possible. But why not? I mean, you accepted her as a patient, and, and you cured her. I mean, you really did. Unfortunately, Miss West is the last patient I can accept, at least in this part of the world. Doctor, I, I don't understand. Are you... Do you have to go somewhere? That's correct. But where are you going? Abroad. And my plans will keep me abroad for at least a year. Oh, no. I mean, listen, if you're going to Europe, I, I mean, I was thinking of taking a trip no, there myself. No, no, Mrs. Mallory, my destination isn't Europe. I'm going to North Africa, a case of some importance. Well, since when is one patient more important than another? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it that way. Oh. It's simply that this is a prior commitment. But maybe then, maybe I could go with you. I mean, I could take up residence there. I'm afraid that's impossible, too. Why? Well, the country I'm going to is a Muslim country. My patient is the son of, well, a, uh, a notable Arab leader. Oh, why would that make any difference? What does it matter? I'll be living within the bachelor section of the official residence. It's an area restricted by Muslim law. You wouldn't be allowed near the place, my dear lady, even if I were free to treat you. And I'm not. But I have money. I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything you want to stay and treat me. I mean, I'll, I'll meet this Arab leader's offer. Mrs. Mallory, the fee I'm about to receive, I wouldn't ask of any individual... I've been asked to remain with him for a period not to exceed one year. A year? For that year, in a Swiss bank, there will be deposited for me $150,000 in Swiss francs. 
50,000? I'm very sorry that you made me reveal that confidence. No, I, I trust that it goes no farther. I'll pay you the same. What? You heard me. I'll pay you the same. I mean, not in a year's time, but as soon as you've cured me. I'm sorry. Your offer is very generous. But it's also conditional. What do you mean, conditional? You will pay only for a cure. That's something I've never guaranteed a patient. Not Miss West, not my Arab friend. No one at all. All right, then. Suppose it isn't conditional. Suppose I agree to pay you in advance. Well, that, of course, would be something worth consideration. Well, hello, Dr. Merritt. This is certainly a surprise. I think it must be the first time that a doctor ever made a voluntary house call. Well, I, I didn't come here to see you as a patient, either. Only as a friend. Well, that's very kind of you. Ever since I saw you last, I've been thinking over what you told me about this Dr. Griff. Oh, yes. Well, what about him? I thought it would be worthwhile just to ask around about the gentleman. And last week I was attending a joint conference of my medical association and psychological group. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I did learn something that I thought you might be interested in. There is no Dr. Griff. Oh, what was that? Oh, maybe he has a Ph.D. and tacked that in front of his name, but I'm quite sure that the man is not a medical doctor. All right. Be that as it may, he's still not necessarily a fraud. Well, I... I didn't say he was anything. But I suspect that your original judgment was correct. But... That he's not someone to be trusted. But you don't know the whole story. Well, what I do know is... You're more impressed with a man than you were willing to admit. Isn't that right? Dr. Merritt, he cured that girl. What? You know that girl I told you about, the crippled girl? She's walking again. I saw her walk. Well, I suppose that could be true. Faith healing does have its successes. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss this any further. Oh, wait a minute. I don't like the way you sound. Ida, have you made any sort of arrangement with this charlatan? Dr. Merritt, I appreciate your interest, but I refuse to say another word about this matter. I mean, do you understand? Not another word. That's right, Mrs. Mallory. Just relax. Close your eyes. And let the water of faith flow through your bloodstream. You can feel it tingling through your body, bringing you peace and tranquility, total peace and happiness. Do you feel it? Yes. Yes, I feel it. And now, I'm reaching out for your hand. You see me reaching out for you. Yes. Yes, I see you. And now... Oh, of all times. Who's that now? Yes, what do you want? Are you Dr. Helmut Griff? Yes, who are you? The name's Barry, Doctor. Lieutenant Barry, Racket and Bunko Squad, Police Department. May I come in? No, you can't. I happen to have a patient with me right now. Would her name be Ida Mallory? And who are you? I'm her physician. You might say her accredited physician. I demand to know what this intrusion is all it's about. It's not an intrusion, Dr. Griff. It's an arrest. What? Doctor? Well, Dr. Griff? So, uh, may we come in now? Ida. Ida, are you all right? Yes. Oh, what is what is it? I it's mean, what's happening? It's all right, Ida. Everything's going to be fine. They've got them all now. All of them. Well, what are you talking about? Uh, is this a lady, Doc? Yes, this is Mrs. Mallory. 
I don't think she's in any condition to talk. He's obviously given her some kind of drug. It's a, a legitimate drug, a, a perfectly legitimate sedative. Yes, yes, of course, doctor. I'm sure it's nothing very unusual, second all or something of that nature. No mysterious water of faith. Please, please, won't someone tell me what's going on? No, I'll tell you, Ida. But it may hurt just a little. You see, I told the police your story and they investigated. He is a fraud, Ida. How dare you Be say quiet, that? mister. You're no more a doctor than I'm police commissioner. His real name is Michael Lanning. Alias Dr. George Watkins, alias Dr. John Wilson, and that's his modus operandi, Mrs. Mallory, posing as a fake doctor, offering miracle cures, usually for sick widows with lots of money. Oh, but he cured her. I mean, he cured Melinda. This is the part that may hurt most, Ida. He did not cure Melinda West. Because Melinda West was never crippled to begin with. I know. It was just psychosomatic. Oh, no. She... No, no. No, Ida. Just crooked. What? She I... was in on the racket with him, Mrs. Mallory. Her real name is Anna Fraser. Oh. Her so-called brother is Tony Fraser. And I'm sorry, they're not brother and sister at all. They're man and wife. No. And I believed them. I believed them. Well, we haven't caught up with those two yet, Mrs. Mallory, but we will. Oh, I uh, brought some pictures for you to identify. No, no, I don't want to look at them. I can't bear to look at them. Please, Ida, you must. But I don't want to prosecute them. I don't. Why really? not? They're crooks, plain and simple crooks, all three of them. I don't care. You have to help us now, Ida. You have to identify these parasites. Now, please, look at the photographs. You know something, Doctor? Sometimes people set out to do good and end up doing harm. And sometimes... It works the other way around. What do you mean? Hey, now. Hey, now, stop that. Now, don't rip up those photos. Ida, 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 what are you... What? Well, for the love of heaven, you're tearing up the pictures. You're tearing them up. With my hands, Doctor. With my own hands. <laughs> Well, they say that it's an ill wind that doesn't blow someone some good. And in this case, it looks like three evil people have managed to be very good to Mrs. Ida Mallory, in spite of themselves. If there's a moral to this tale, I'd frankly hate to be the one to say it. No, we're not recommending that the best way to cure your ills is to fall into the hands of confidence men. Myth included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Bud. Bit suspicious, okay? Our cast included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? are drastically altered, and two people become lost in... Well, you hear. It'll all come out as we go along. Norma and Hal, he's Harold Glenford III, have inherited an ancient brownstone on New York's East 58th Street. Hal hasn't seen the house or the uncle who left it to him since he was a little boy. 
He doesn't know what to expect any more than Norma does, as they inspect the old house now for the first time since it became their own. Yeah, you need a machete to get through these cobwebs. Well, nobody's lived here in 10 or 15 years, he said. But it's going to be beautiful. A little belt tightening, maybe, but we can make it. <laughs> I don't advise tightening your belt. No kidding, Norma, the baby's due in April. You're going to have to stop working pretty soon. It's not going to be easy on my salary alone. Oh, nobody said it was going to be easy. And there are the ghosts, of course. Cut it out. Well, now, according to Uncle George, that's the reason nobody's been living here. The ghosts drove Uncle George himself out. That's what he said. And he couldn't keep the place rented, so he just gave up. Okay. A house like this needs a ghost. <laughs> mystery drama, The Fatal Connection, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington, and stars Jennifer Harmon and Nick Pryor. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Scientists and philosophers see time as a road along which we pass, or a river along which we drift, the future waiting for us just around the bend ahead, the past obscured but not obliterated by the turn we just made. The rest of us, ordinary mortals that we are, find the moment in which we are currently trapped just about all we can handle. Norma and Hal Glenford have moved into their old house on East 58th Street. The furniture from their former three-room apartment only half fills the first floor. The second floor and the attic-like third floor will have to wait. Except, Hal, we'll have to have a nursery. You know, our baby's bedroom. <laughs> you stand there, the living proof of it. And there's no place for it on the first floor, so we'll have to find a place on the second floor, right? Logical. Then our bedroom will have to be on the second floor, too, don't you see? I mean, we have to sleep on the same floor with the baby. Hey, you're right. I hadn't thought of it before. The back room on this floor makes a very small bedroom, anyway. We could use it as a sort of, uh, well, I don't know, music room or study or whatever. You make it sound very prosperous. It will be. Lawyers are always rich when they get a little older. I like the sound of that, Norma. doesn't make any sense, but I find the simplicity of it comforting. So shall we go upstairs and see what's there for a bedroom and a nursery? Okay. I'll go first and clear away the cobwebs. Oh, we'll carpet the stairway. Later, of course. When we're rich. <laughs> now, that's an old bedroom, as I recall. One of the drawers is a linen closet. There are five doors, so that leaves just three rooms. One more than we need. Well, this would be all right for our bedroom. It's much nicer than the little room downstairs, don't you think? Okay. Bedroom here. That takes care of us. Now about Junior. Hey, this door is locked. Well, just stuck, probably. No, it's locked. Why would anybody lock an inside door? That's odd. Where did I put that bunch of keys the lawyer gave us? In your jacket pocket, dummy. You think maybe there's a treasure hidden in that room? Or a ghost. It's been locked for a while. It's all furnished. Son of a gun. Right out of the 19th century. It, it looks like what used to be an upstairs sitting room or something of the kind. Oh, Hal, just look at that secretary. He must be a hundred years old and it, it looks just as solid. Oh, as my gosh, a telephone. One of those old wall phones. I, I've seen pictures of them. Well, shouldn't it have a crank? Oh, I'd like to furnish the whole house just like this. You know, everything to match the house itself. I wouldn't change a thing in here. Well, I could live without the cobwebs and the dust. Well, I'll speak to the upstairs maid about it. Good help is so hard to come by lately, my dear. Have you noticed? <laughs> oh, I have indeed. It's the times, I'm afraid. <laughs> everything seems to be going to pot. What? Darling, would you believe it? The butcher today wanted 18 cents a pound for steak. Just plain old beef steak. 
15 cents a pound. Well, they might as well eat at Delmonico's if it costs that kind of money to cook it all. Oh, let's shall we? This evening? Well, why not? I'll order a hat. Uh -huh. Excuse me, my dear. Operator, I'd like a handsome cab sent to 621 East 58th Street at once. At once, understand? We'll be going to Delmonico's. <laughs> Let's go back downstairs where the 20th century is and see if there are any hot dogs in the refrigerator. Uh, actually, though, I, I guess 18 cents was hard to come by in those days. as two dollars is today. Uh, not for old Grandpa Glenford, it wasn't. Great-grandpa, that would be. He was filthy rich. Was he the one who built this house? No, I don't know that he built it. He was the first Glenford to own it. Whatever happened to all that money? Gave it away. Gave it away? That's what my father told me. Maybe it was just a figure of speech. You know what we ought to have? We ought to have a bottle of champagne to break over the bow of the house. Or the stern or whatever they break it. If houses had them. Well, now, if you look in the refrigerator, just to the right of the meat drawer, you'll find a quart of excellent domestic champagne cooling. To be taken internally, though, not broken over anything. Oh, what a doll you are. Shall we have it now? Well, I thought after dinner, but if you'd rather... What was that? Well, it sounded like somebody's the door. Well, what's the matter with the doorbell? Well, honey, I don't know. Maybe it's broken. Maybe somebody likes the knocker better. I'll see who it is. Yes? What can I do for you? Your handsome cab, sir? For Delmonico's, I believe? It was a joke of some kind, Norma. Who played it if it was a joke? I mean, who knew you made that nutty pretend phone call upstairs? I don't see how it could be a joke. Well, then, a coincidence. There are handsome cabs still operating over at Central Park. Oh, sure. And one of them just happened to drive all the way across town. And as long as it was in the neighborhood, the driver just thought he'd knock at our door and tell us our cab was here to take us to Delmonico's. Oh, come on, Hal. Well, okay. You, you explain it. I can't. That's what's bothering me. Well, you you don't think... No, you, you surely don't think... No. No, of course I don't. What did the driver say when you sent him away? Well, something about it was a funny mistake for the office to make if I didn't order a hansom. He he was grumpy about losing a fare. Did he look like a real hansom cab driver? I mean, did he, did he look like somebody you've seen driving a hansom around the park today? Or, or was he, well, you know, dressed like the real old-timey ones? I didn't really notice. Look, now, why don't we just forget him? Why don't we just have dinner and see what's on TV and drink our champagne and go to bed. I've got to go to work in the morning, even if I do live in a mansion. <laughs> Especially since I do. Here's to great-grandfather Glenford. Look, take it easy with that stuff, will you? The bottle's half gone already. You're a novice at this, remember? And here's to handsome cab drivers everywhere. <laughs> hey, you know what we ought to do? There isn't any more champagne, if that's what you mean. I only bought one bottle. No, no. What we ought to do is something about that phone upstairs. Yeah, like have it taken out. No, I, I want to order something. A, a new dress. Something like that. I mean, if they send over cabs when you order them, why not? You'd better let me finish this bottle. Bring it upstairs. Come on. Four years it's taken me to find out I married a lush. There it is. Our fairy godmother compliments of the telephone company. <laughs> you want to go first? No, you go ahead. I'm just along for the ride. What shall I ask for? Well, look, don't fool around with one dress. Ask for a whole new wardrobe. As long as you're going to be a kook, you might as well be kooky in the grand manner. You're a genius. Hello. I want a whole new wardrobe. Oh, no, no. Two wardrobes. One for myself and one for my husband. Everything in the latest style and everything must fit perfectly. Oh, and have everything finished and delivered by the time I get home from work tomorrow afternoon. Uh, that's, I guess, it for now. Do you want to order something, Hal? Well, sure. Why not? Here, give me that. 
Uh, hello. Uh, I want the house completely redecorated. Completely. Uh, restored, I should say, exactly as it was when the place was new. And I don't mean just when you get around to it. I want that finished by tomorrow afternoon also. By the end of the working day. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's finish this bubble water and get to bed. Hey, what do you bet you have a headache in the morning? You'd have lost that bet. No headache. All I want is a cup of coffee, though. Me too. That's all we have time for anyway. Well, pick me up after work this afternoon. Sure. I may be a little late, though. That's okay. A secretary's work is never done. So, after I spend the better part of three weeks working on this brief, and it's brilliant if I do say so myself, who do you think is going to take it into court? Mr. Fuller? Old J.C. himself. Who else? How was your day? Oh, you know. Once you've typed one letter, you've typed them all. You know something? We ought to walk home from my office every evening. Hold my briefcase while I unlock the door, will you? I wonder if they finished. Who finished what? The decorators, you know. You told them it had to be finished by the end of the working day. How? Now, this... This is... This is too much. I, I mean... What kind of a joke? It is, Hal. It's all been redecorated and restored. Just like you ordered. Oh, Hal. Hey, where's where's our new television set? Now, 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 that, now that is going too far. That that set cost color TV. That, that was a 21-inch screen. But how did they do it? Who did it? I mean, I can't fix it. How? What? The refrigerator's gone. Look at this thing. What is it? It's an old ice box. It's, it's full of ice. I don't think you can get ice like this anymore. There's, there's something. Th this is all wrong, Norma. It's not a joke, is it, Hal? Nobody makes this kind of a joke. A coal range. An old coal range. My grandmother Scott had one of those out in her summer kitchen. Nobody used the things even then. The toaster, the... The blender, everything, Hal, it's all gone. That telephone. That damn telephone. It's real, isn't it? It really is real. You tell the telephone you want something and you get it. it it's like a, a... Like a genie in a bottle. You just order it and a... I think I'm scared. All right. All right. If it'll work one way, it ought to work the other two. In reverse. What are you going to do, Hal? Come on. I'm going up there, and I'm going to tell that lousy telephone to put our own stuff back in this house and then leave us alone. That's what I'm going to do. Now, listen, you, whoever you are, I want you to Number stop... Number, please. Number, please. Oh, my God. How? Norma. Norma, let's get out of this place. A telephone, redecorate and completely restore a 19th century house, and all in the course of an eight-hour day? It seems impossible, doesn't it? And yet there it is. And somebody did it. Or something. We'll look into it further when I return shortly with Act Two. Time. One of the many things we still don't understand about our universe. Now here, in an old house on New York's east side, Hal and Norma Glenford have found an antiquated telephone that seems to constitute some kind of flaw in what we consider the natural passage of time. At least in the incredibly short objective space of eight hours, the house has somehow become its original 19th century self. The past... If Hal and Norma can believe what they see and hear has been trapped within its walls. The eeriness of it has sent the two of them frightened out onto 58th Street. It's so quiet out here. And so dark. I don't remember it being this dark before. Well, we haven't been around this neighborhood much at night. I guess east of First Avenue, the city just doesn't waste money on bright lights. Let's walk up that way, Hal. 
I just... Right now, I don't want to go back into the house. Okay. Up towards 3rd Avenue or Lex? You know, I don't think I ever heard New York this quiet before. East side, west side, day or night. It's, 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 it's like a tomb. How? How do you hear it? I don't hear anything, just... Now do you hear it? Well, yeah, I hear something like a... It's like a... It sounds to me like an L train. A few blocks away, like the 3rd Avenue L. Which was torn down. When? 15 years ago. Well, listen to it. Hey, this I've got to see. But how is it the old 3rd Avenue L? And that means that everything... No, everywhere. no, listen, we don't know what it means. Some nostalgia freak with a recording, probably. Something like that. Come on, let's go see. Now, if that isn't an L stopping, I've never heard an L stopping. <laughs> you haven't in a long time. But I've heard plenty of them when I was a kid. Wait a minute, Norma. What do you hear now? A horse. Don't tell me that's not a horse. That sure sounds like one. Mounted cop, most likely, or, or maybe that same nostalgia bus. If that's a recording, then it's some recording. I've never heard a record. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. That horse is no recording. It's, it's either a mounted policeman or... There's your nostalgia bus. All four hoofs. Well... Some companies must still use horses. You, you know, you know, late at night. And... It's not that late. Anyway, look what's in the wagon. I see them. Those big milk cans. They used to... Well, look, I don't know. Maybe they still use them. I'm scared. Well, it's spooky. I admit that. So still and no traffic except that, that, that horse and wagon? Well, look, Norma, there's got to be a logical explanation. I mean... If there's not, what's happened? Have, have we lost our minds? Oh, no. Well, no, 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 Norma, don't get upset. No, Hal, that's not what I mean. Look up there. Up where? At the light. The street light on the corner. It... It looks like a... It's a gas light. That's what it is. I think maybe we ought to get back to the house and, and, uh, and see if, if we can't get organized. It's back there, too, Hal. Okay. But if everything... If... Everything's gone back to the 19th century or something. Let's at least go back and face it in our own home. If we still have a home. The key seems to turn easier. What if there's somebody in there? I mean, we didn't live here and... What year do you think it is, Hal? It's... Oh, Lord, I'm so mixed up. How can it be anything but 1974? That's what it is. Or was, or will be. Now, we've got to stop this foolishness. The first thing we need is some dinner. Maybe with some good solid food inside us, we can take a more reasonable view of this mess. I don't know how to cook on a coal range. I don't even know how to make it burn, do you? Well, we were lucky there was some stuff in the icebox already cooked. I, I wonder who cooked it. Maybe my grandmother. What do you suppose happened to them? Your great-grandmother and grandfather. Are they supposed to be living here? Are they going to come walking in and... Listen, what's that? It's that phone upstairs, Hal. You mean the one that... Oh, Lord. Let it ring, Hal. Just let it ring. I can't. If it's somebody from... Whatever year this is, I've got to talk to him, Norma. I've got to. All right, but I'm going with you. I put carpet on the stairway. Or had it on the stairway, whichever. Hurry up, will you? I don't want whoever it is to hang up before we get there. It's actually a new house now, isn't it? You don't see the signs of age anymore. It doesn't look like a thousand coats of paint on everything. Hello? This is Bill, Harold. Where have you been all day? Well, I practically camped outside your office all afternoon, and you never did show up. Uh, uh, uh who, who did you say this is? Uh, are you all right, Harold? It's Bill, Bill Voigt, your partner. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I, uh, I, I was wool gathering. I guess you were. Listen, I've got to talk to you bright and early tomorrow morning. You're in a jam, Harold. A jam? 
Well, ca- ca- can't you tell me about it now? You'd better get in here tomorrow for your own good. It's nothing to do with me, but for your own good. Oh, well, if, uh, if it's that important... It is. It's to you, Harold, not to me. To you. All right. Th- th- thanks for calling, Bill. What was that about a jam? He didn't say. But you want to know something weird? He thought he was talking to my great-grandfather. That man called me Harold, and that was his name. I, I, I can't remember anybody ever calling me Harold my whole life. He thought he was talking to my great-grandfather. I can't see. How did they read by these silly gas lights anyway? There's an oil lamp right there on the desk. I, I think they used oil lamps to read by at night. The gas fixtures are all up on the wall. Well, do you know how to light one of these things amid the lamps? Well, just take the chimney off or the glass thing. Then you hold a match to the wick like a candle. Because if this is my great-grandfather's desk, I mean, the way he left it only yesterday, I, I want to know what's in it. Is is this what you mean by the wick? Yes. Do you think we'll ever get back, Hal? I don't know if I could stand it stuck here forever. There's no way of knowing, Norma. Everything's written in longhand. This looks like a deed of some kind. Most likely for the house. No. My gosh. What? This is a deed to an office building on Fifth Avenue. Way downtown, but that's where the action was in those days. These days. Your great-grandfather owned an office building? I told you, he was loaded. There goes that lousy telephone again. Don't answer it, Hal. Look, you can come with me. It's no good just letting it ring. It's got to be somebody important. There weren't many phones in those days. These days, damn it, only rich people could afford telephones. It'll just mix things up all the more, though, answering it. Look, it's our only contact the way things are. I wish. I wish. Oh, it's no good wishing. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Glenford? Uh, yes? Uh, this is Maud Spencer, Mr. Glenford. Is Norma in? Just, just, just a minute, I'll see. Norma, do you know a Maud Spencer? I don't know anybody here. She asked for Norma. Norma. Now, m- maybe it's a link of some kind. You'd better talk to her. Oh, Hal, I don't want to talk on that thing. Look, this could be the breakthrough. Here, talk to her. Uh, hello? Norma, my dear. We were all expecting you at Sarah Aldrich's tea this afternoon. I do hope you're not sick. Sarah who? Aldrich. Sarah Aldrich. Well, you were invited, weren't you? Sarah said you were. Oh, well, yes, I, I guess I was. I, I, I mean, yes, of course I was. I, well, I, I've been having these uh, spells, you know, headaches and that kind of thing. Oh, dear. No trouble about your delicate condition, I hope. Well, it, it's related, I guess. Nothing to be concerned about. I'm just supposed to get a lot of rest, you know, stay at home and take it easy. Oh, dear. Is there anything I can do? I'll come and see you tomorrow afternoon. No, no, don't do that. What? I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I I didn't mean it the way it sounded. All all I meant was I'm perfectly all right. I I really don't need a fuss made over me or anything like that. It just isn't necessary. That's all I meant. I'm sure I have no wish to intrude where I'm not Look, necessary. I, I wish you wouldn't. Hello? Hello? She hung up. It wasn't anyone you know? No. I, I was supposed to have gone to Sarah somebody's tea this afternoon and didn't show up. Well, it, it, it could have been the breakthrough. One thing. Whoever was supposed to have answered this phone is called Norma. And she's pregnant. I'll tell you this. My great-grandfather was not a very popular man. How do you mean? Well, if he had any friends, they sure didn't write to him. These letters are all from people who hated his guts. Claim he stole them blind. Stole? Do you think it's true? 
I'm beginning to believe that old Harold Glenford Esquire was mixed up in some pretty shady enterprises. What kind of shady? Kickbacks, near extortion, character assassination, embezzlement, or something very like it. If a third of these letters are right, you name it, and old great-granddaddy Glenford was into it. Oh, that's shocking. Listen, you want to hear one? I'm not sure I do. Uh, Glenford. This guy signs himself James Blakely. Glenford. You are unfit to breathe God's pure air. The ways of God are beyond understanding, but justice is inevitable either in this world, which you be foul, or in the next, where never fear the punishment you deserve has been prepared for you. To hasten you into that world would be an act of the highest nobility. If I do not do the deed myself, rest assured that another will in good time. Wow. A sample. Only a sample. How? Well, well, what is it? Look at this. It's a... This... This is a picture of you and me. That sure is what it looks like. But in those clothes? Well, well, where did you get this? In this desk drawer. Look on the back. Mr. and Mrs. Harold W. Glenford, on the occasion of their wedding, June 18th. 1894. And look at those signatures. Except for a couple of curly cues, they're yours and mine. I can't help it, Hal. I'm scared. I don't see how it's possible, but it must be. I have somehow become my own great-grandfather. Not only that, but you're... You're my great-grandmother. And that child you're carrying, due to be born next April is my grandfather. Paradoxical? Well, yes, of course. You presuppose paradox the moment you start moving about in time. How do you know you aren't your own great-grandfather or grandmother? If tomorrow you found an old telephone in your attic, (laughs) well, how do you know? I'll return shortly with Act Three. If I had my life to live over, that's not an uncommon expression. We've all heard it. But have you ever heard anyone say, if I had my great-grandfather's life to live over... That's exactly what has happened to Hal Glenford, if his conclusions are correct. He has not only gone back in time to his great-grandfather's day, but he has also taken on his great-grandfather's identity, and the wife he loves is now, as he must believe, his own great-grandmother. A situation of many complexities. Hal has broken open the strong box he found in old Harold Glenford's desk and has gone quickly through its contents. Well, there's one comfort. If we actually are my great-grandfather and grandmother, we're very rich people. What difference does that make? A lot. If we're stuck in this time. I want out, rich or not. Well, honey, so do I, of course. But there are securities and deeds in this strong box representing well over $1 million in assets. And a million dollars was really worth something in 1897. Is that when it is now? Mid-November of 1897, according to the dates on those letters I read. How can't you do something about it? What? Invent a time machine? I Look, I don't know. Maybe it'll just happen. Like the other time, only in reverse. Norma, I'm sorry. That's the best I have to offer. Meantime, I think we ought to get some sleep. Sleep? In the middle of a thing like this, sleep? Try to, anyway. I wish we had that bottle of champagne we drank last night. Oh, Lord. It wasn't last night. The grapes that went into that champagne haven't even been planted yet. Oh, uh, uh, hello there. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you had someone in your office with you. Never mind. I was just leaving. Sit down, Harold. You were, uh, wise to shave off your beard. My... Uh, oh, yes. Well, my uh, my wife never really liked it, and I, I thought... Well, it served you well. Blakely didn't recognize you. Was that James Blakely? 
What are you talking about? You know perfectly well it was James Blakely. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I had a letter from him yesterday. I could have... Uh, you, you know I could have him in court for some of the things he said? <laughs> yeah, that's rather funny, you know. You, you having James Blakely in court instead of the other way around? That's really very funny. I... I don't think I, I know what you mean. Well, that's neither here nor there. I, uh, I, I want to dissolve our partnership, Harold, uh, as of this moment. Oh? Do you mind telling me why? Do you really think that's necessary? I wish you'd tell me... Oh, all right. All right. I've had my fill of being a thief's associate. Now, wait. Oh, I know. I, I, t- I took my share in the beginning. You're not the only fool in the room, but... I'm through with it now, and thank God I have no part in the Blakely thing. All right. Uh, uh, I was checking things over last night. I was thinking things over. Some of my business tactics have been, uh, all right, shameful. I, I admit that. But, but I decided last night to change things. I mean, no shady dealings of any kind from now on. I see. Change things. And make restitution. Well, where where it's reasonable, where where it's possible. Without costing you money, you mean. I don't believe you, Harold. Not for a minute, I don't. How are you going to make restitution to Jim Blakely? I don't... Would you mind refreshing my memory on the Blakely thing? Oh, now, really, No, Harold. I've been lately... Lately, I've been reassessing. I've been reevaluating, and 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 there are just so many details. I'd, I'd just like to hear the Blakely affair clearly stated. Objectively, you know. Oh, nonsense. Well, all right, if you want to hear it all over again, if you if you really want to wallow in that miserable can of worms a second time. Please. Bill, it would help me. Well, Blakely came to you in the first place, looking for a handout. On the tape, granted, I'm sure you haven't forgotten that. Uh, th- th- no. You were still under 30 at the time, but you were already under, under my guidance, damn it. That's what I hate. You were already a power in the construction industry. Blakely was sure you gave kickbacks, and he wanted one. Then he was as much to blame as I if he came to me. At the time, you managed it so that you had his signature on a dozen damaging documents. And you, you never signed so much as a letter to him. You remember that. Well, you've always worked that way, and you gave him a low bid on that job, and good value, too. The State Parks Commission building, wasn't it? I, I, I don't remember. And Blakely got a promotion because of it. And another, and another. Until he was made State Highways and Buildings Commissioner. It wasn't until then that you started blackmailing him. Blackmail? Well, it's, it's not an uncommon practice. Ah, to... and you bled him white. No more kickbacks, but every contract out of Blakely's office has gone to you for... What's it been, two years now? Well, if I put him where he is in the first place... They've caught him, Harold. He's going before a grand jury next week, and they'll indict. He's finished. There isn't a shred of evidence against you except his word, which, of course, isn't worth a tinker's damn now. You never signed a thing, did you? A man who signs damning documents is nothing more than a... A fool, like Blakely. Well, does that refresh your memory? It... It puts things in perspective. Well, as I've told you, I'm very happy that I had anything to do with the Blakeney business. Right now, he's thinking about killing you. No, seriously. That was just what he was telling me. Oh, God. What's the matter? Nothing. I I, I, I just remembered something. I'll have to leave now. There's something I must do. But uh, before you go, about dissolving the partnership, I don't know how you feel about it, but anything I... you say, anything you say, it doesn't matter. We'll do it any way you like. It isn't important now. Oh, oh, Hal, I'm so glad you're home. Yes, listen, we have to get out of here. It's so awful, Hal, being in a place you're so terrified of and being even more terrified of leaving it. I've never in my life... Norma, before... Norma, we have got to get out of here. Out of here? Where to? I mean, all together out of this time. We've got to get back to the 20th century. How something's happened, hasn't it? No. Yes. Norma, there's no time now. Let's try the telephone again. I want to know. Tell me, Hal. Tell me. Number, please. Listen, I want you to get off the line. Do you understand? I want you to just unplug yourself or whatever it is you do and just get off the line. Just for a minute or two. Will you do that, please? Number, please. Oh, for God's sake, shut up. If you can't get off the line altogether, at least shut up. Don't talk. All right. Listen, you. 
whoever you are. We have had enough of this nonsense. We want to go back to the 20th century, and we want to go back now. You're the one who got us into this mess. Now get us out of it. Do you hear me? Number, please. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? Pulling the wires out of the wall. Can't you see? I'm trying to get the lousy telephone back the way it was when we first moved in here. All right. Can you hear me? You in there in your damn stupid telephone? I want you to put us back. Do you hear me? We didn't ask to be brought here. We're not responsible for anything that happened before we got here. We want to go back. You can't punish me for something my great-grandfather did. Do you hear me? All right, don't answer. You don't have to answer. Just do it. I don't know what else I can do. Oh, the phone isn't hooked up. You pulled the wires out of the wall. It wasn't hooked up before when all this started. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll get us out of here before... Before what, Hal? Okay. Come on downstairs. I guess you'll have to know. And he's threatening to kill me. Blakely is. That's what my great-grandfather's esteemed partner told me this morning. Well, then what are we sitting here for? We have to get out of this house. It won't do any good, Norma. It will. There must be a thousand places to hide. You're, you're just a, a, a sitting duck here. No, there's no hiding place but the 20th century. Back where we're really Hal and Norma Glenford. There's, there's, there's no hiding place at all in this century. I just don't know what you're talking about. The thing is, I remember now. I remembered while I was sitting there in Boyd's office. Remember what? I remembered hearing my grandfather. Was he my grandfather or my son? I, I, I remember when I was just a little boy hearing my grandfather telling my father about it. About what, Hal? My great-grandfather was shot to death by a business associate. By a man he'd cheated, ruined. That's what my grandfather told my father. All right, all right. That was your great-grandfather. But it's already happened. To whichever one of us was here, it's already happened. It's can't be changed. I don't believe any of that. I, I don't. I want you to do something. I've done all I can do. It's up to that, that, that telephone upstairs. Maybe if we just sit here and, and think 20th century, it'll work. Close our eyes and, and just know we're in the 20th century. Listen for auto horns. Think about the Pan Am building. Try to decide what we'll watch on TV later. Breathe the polluted air. Mightn't it work, Hal? It couldn't hurt. Close your eyes. That'll be Blakely. Don't answer it. Do you think, do you think I'm crazy? Now listen to me. If, if he's got a gun, he can get at us through the front window. I want you to head for the coat closet as fast as you can and get in there and stay in there until I tell you to come out. Have you got that? Yes. Norma, get in the closet. No. Not as long as you... Get down, Norma. Get down on the... Oh. Oh. How? How? Don't... Don't move, Norma. He may still be out there. How you... You bleeding? I am. I don't feel anything. But I can't seem to... All over your shirt. I'm going to call an ambulance. Now, don't move. I'll be right back. Don't move. I can't... I can't call an ambulance. I... I pulled the wires out. Remember? I'll... I'll go out, Hal. There must be a cop or something. I'll go, Norma. Please. It, it wouldn't do any good. It's already happened. But I can't just... I'm... I might... Not be here when you get back. Oh, wow. I want, I want to tell you something important. All right. The, the kid next April. I'll, I'll name him Harold and, and I'll call him Hal. No. <laughs> Anything but that. Oh. Anyway, his, his name was Edward. My grandfather. Oh, don't you think I ought... No. No, tell, tell Edward. Tell him when he's old enough. Understand? Tell him. Get rid of the money. All of it. Dirty, 
filthy, <laughs> dirty money. <laughs> Justice must be served. That goes without saying. But how many times? It's unlikely, of course, that anyone listening to me at this moment will ever find himself unexpectedly living in the 19th century. But just in case, how much do you really know about your great-grandfather? I'll be with you again in a few minutes. Edward Glenford, Norma's baby, was born in April 1898 and lived a long and, in some respects, fruitful life. He never made much money, but he gave away several millions of dollars, according to the instructions left by his father. But was it his father or his grandson who gave him those instructions? I leave you to puzzle it out for yourself. Our cast included Jennifer Harmon, Nick Pryor, Robert Maxwell, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, that's exactly what I've come to talk with you about, Arthur. Your niece. Oh? Something important? Very. I'd asked Amelia to marry me, and she said she would. Oh, no. I've never lied to you, Arthur, and there's certainly no reason for you to... Don't be a fool, Gerald. I didn't mean that Amelia had turned you down. Of course, she accepted you. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, I know, and I'm reluctantly forced to explain. When you hear why, you won't want to marry Amelia. Impossible. There's nothing you can say about Amelia that would make me love her any less. She's the perfect woman. She's not a woman. What did you say? I said Amelia is not a woman. She's a robot. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Come in. What's that? Yes, it is rather dark in here. You see, we never turn on the lights. We don't need any. At the Radio Mystery Theater, all we illuminate is your imagination. We fill it full of ghostly radiations, mysterious emanations, the eerie glow of terrifying images. And now we have a most unusual image for you. The image of a doll. Yes, I said doll. And a very pretty one, too. Long, silky blonde hair. Innocent, round, blue eyes. A charming dress of taffeta and lace. This is the central character of the story you're about to hear. Of course, you're asking, what makes a doll an image of fear and horror? You've got to find it, Jimmy. You've got to get that doll away from him. Okay, honey, okay. Give us a little time. I don't have any time. If something happens to that doll, I'll die. 
Our mystery drama, The Doll, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Joanne Linville and Ross Martin. Our story begins in the classroom of a small co-educational university. Not a very unusual setting. But today, these young men and women are hearing an unusual lecture. The guest speaker is Professor Eric Douglas, and the subject of his address is written in chalk on the blackboard. Let's step a little closer and see what it says. Homeopathic magic, ancient and modern. Let's be quiet and listen. For thousands of years, people believed they could injure or destroy their enemy by injuring or destroying an image of him. And so they made likenesses in cloth, in wood, in clay. The ancient Egyptians used wax. The wizards would take a drop of a man's blood, clippings from his hair or parings of his nails, and knead them into a wax figure. You mean like a voodoo doll, Professor? A uh, voodoo belongs to the modern era, but the idea is exactly the same. Once the doll was made in this fashion, the victim was at the mercy of the sorcerer. So, you see, the doll is really man's oldest toy and perhaps his deadliest. You mean that stuff really works? Well, that is the strangest part of all. Sometimes it works very well. You've got to be kidding, Professor. Young lady, I wonder if you'd like to help me with a little experiment. Me, Professor? Yes. Will you come up front, please? <laughs> Now, uh, just for the uh, the fun of it, uh, shall we uh, shall we make a doll? Huh? All right. Now let's see what shall we use. Um, yeah, now this little towel will do fine. I'll just tie a knot to make the head. Yeah. Uh, and now let's dress it up a little. Can you help me? How? Well, with some part of you. A um, a hair from your head, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, how about uh, something you own? Uh, that ring, maybe. May I borrow that? Well, I... Uh, well, yeah, thank you. Now, we'll put that around the neck. And voila. We have an instant voodoo doll. Fascinating, isn't it? To know that the doll is meant to be a representation of you? Now, look at it. I'm looking. Yeah, well, keep looking. Now don't take your eyes off of it. You can almost see your face in the cloth, can't you? It's almost as if the doll is you. Whatever happens to the doll happens to you. You, the doll. You, the doll. Sharing one body between you. One life. One destiny. I, I still think it's silly. All right. And let's see what happens when I take this letter knife. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm merely going to plunge this knife into a meaningless piece of cloth. No, don't! Prudence? 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 You called me Professor? Yes, I uh, want to know what you think of this record. Fred Cartwright sent it to me. Claims it's an authentic Dumbala ritual march. I could not say, Professor. Hmm. I think it was probably recorded on Oliver Boulevard. Well, that's enough of that. Well, what's become of Laura? Isn't she home yet? She's just arrived, sir. She's in the living room. Oh. Laura, darling... I didn't hear the door. You're very late. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. I, uh... The match wasn't over until six. It went to five sets. And, uh, who won? You know you don't care the first thing about tennis. Ah, uh, it's a young man's game. Not for old birds like me. Oh, come on, stop that. You're far from old. Oh, Prudence, I hope I didn't spoil your dinner. It's all right, Miss Fletcher. I'll go see to it now. 
Eric, why won't she ever call me Laura? Oh, it's just her way. You know how it is in the islands. A servant's place is a servant's place. Tradition. Mm, it's more than that. It's resentment. You've got your father's sensitivity. Harry was always thinking that people resented him. Maybe he had good reason. He wasn't very popular among his colleagues. Your father was a renegade. That's why. It's one thing to investigate primitive cultures. That's an anthropologist's job. But to spend your life among them, to raise your child among them... No, I never complain. <laughs> well, you managed to turn out pretty happily. But you're uh, still half-savage, of course. Am I? You can't fool me, Laura. You're still a child of voodoo, just like Prudence. No, don't be silly, Eric. I know you all right. When the full moon rises and the drums start to beat in the jungle and the serpent god Dumbala raises his hooded head... Eric, stop it. What's the matter? I'm... I'm sorry. I have that... that awful headache. Again? Well, come on, let's take care of it. No, don't bother. I'll be all right in a moment. Best time to stop it is early. Right now. You listen to Dr. Douglas here, and we'll get rid of that pain in two minutes. Come on now. Lie back. All right. Now, oh, just relax. Just remember how we've done this before. Yes. I remember. That's right. Now, shut your eyes, Laura. Think of your mind as a large, empty cavern. And in the cavern, you hear my voice. Very faint, as if I'm speaking to you from far, far away. Yes. You feel at peace, relaxed, happy. Your head is clear. Your pain is gone. Yes. It's gone. Oh, you're happy now, Laura. You're happy to be here with me. With me, my darling. Aren't you? Yes. I'm happy. You love me, Laura, don't you? Not in the way you loved your father. You love me as a man. Now, say it, darling. Say, I love you, Eric. I love you. Say my name, Laura. My name. I love you, Jimmy. What is the matter with you, Prudence? I'm sorry, Professor. The dish fell from my hand. What is it? What happened? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, my dear. You're fine. You're just fine. Prudence just dropped something. I came to tell you that dinner is ready. Well, so you had a good tennis game, did you? Was it uh, mixed doubles? It was, as a matter of fact. Oh, who is your partner? Now, someone named Jimmy, by any chance? Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, well, no mystery. You spoke his name while you were hypnotized. Uh, who is Jimmy? Well, his full name is Jimmy Collins. You known him long? Papa, three months. Three months? Well, you never mentioned him before. Oh, I'm sure I did. I'd love for you to meet him, Eric. I'm sure you two would get along. What's he do for a living besides mixed doubles? He's in Wall Street. Well, well. Maybe you've started choosing your friends more carefully, darling. I'm glad to see that. But, uh, just the same. Eric, I wish you would stop talking to me like a scolding father. I am not your father. I was talking to you as a friend. I'm sorry. Do you wish dessert now, Professor? Uh, no. No prudence, no dessert. Um, gotta stay in trim. <laughs> Who knows, I might take up tennis yet. 
Laura, I'll tell you what. Why don't you bring this Jimmy around? I'd love to meet him. No, I'm afraid I don't know much about Haiti, Professor Burnside. I've never been to the island. Oh, but of course Laura has told you of her life there. Oh, yes, she's told me all about it. In fact, you spent some time there yourself, didn't you? Yes, a few years. That's where I met Laura and uh, her father, as a matter of fact. You can see that Eric brought back half the islands. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have my uh, souvenirs, like uh, this thing, for instance. What is that? Looks a little tacky to me. Well, they call it an Oanga packet. It's a charm the voodoo men use for every purpose. Some good and some bad. We should throw out that awful thing, Eric. Well, it was a gift made for me by an old mamaloy in uh, Port-au-Prince. It's a protective charm, guaranteed to ward off the devil. And, of course, uh, Laura can tell you more about it. Laura's much more of an expert on voodoo than I am. You mean just because she was raised on the island? Well, it's an interesting primitive study, otherwise... Sheer nonsense, of course. Oh. Well, uh, you shouldn't have said that. You've offended Laura dreadfully. Laura's a believer, you know. She played with voodoo dolls the way other children play with Chatty Cathy and Betsy Witsy. Harry, please (laughs) stop it. Ask her, Jimmy. Go ahead, ask her if that isn't so. Oh, I'd feel very foolish asking that question. Oh, Jimmy, of course it isn't so. Well, that's good to hear, frankly. I mean, it'd be a heck of a thing on our honeymoon, waking up and finding an Awanga bag in my slipper. Did you say honeymoon? Yes. Did Laura tell you? Laura and I are engaged. We're going to be married next week. <laughs> Professor. What do you want? It's late, Professor. After midnight. Leave me alone, Prudence. Go to bed. There is no chain strong enough to hold her. What would you say? The girl is not of your blood. Why do you struggle to keep her? Prudence, I can't lose her. You hear me? If I lose Laura, I die. No, Professor. Oh, you've got to help me. If you want me to live, you've got to help me. There is nothing anyone can do. There is. There is. There is There is something that you can do. What is that? I've been thinking about it all night. Prudence, you can make a doll. Well, what have we here? A four-sided triangle? Professor Eric Burnside, young Laura Fletcher, Jimmy Collins, a servant named Prudence. Or is this going to turn out to be a five-sided triangle with the fifth member of the equation, a doll? We'll find out what Prudence can do to help the professor in his emotional dilemma when I return shortly with Act Two. What a... A week has passed since Laura Fletcher made her earth-shaking announcement to Professor Eric Douglas. The announcement which turned the professor's world completely upside down. But for a man who has looked into the future and found it bleak and empty, Eric seems like a happy man at the moment as he listens to the sound of the Dambala ceremony and waits for Laura Fletcher to enter the room. Eric? I'm here. Laura. Well, let me stop this racket. Well, don't you look lovely. Hmm. And don't you look well. Eric, I can't tell you how good it is to see you smiling. Well, I've got something to smile at, all right. Myself. I uh, don't know what came over me that night, Laura. I, I just was not myself. I couldn't let you run off and get married without my blessing. And a suitable present, of course. A present? Eric, you shouldn't have. You've always admired this ivory charm, and I, uh, I want you to have it. You and Jimmy. Oh, Eric. It's beautiful. It must be priceless. Well, it's not as priceless as our friendship. I, 
I wouldn't want anything to happen to that. Oh, thank you so much. Jimmy will be as thrilled with it as I am. I think we should talk before you go away, darling. I think we should talk about uh, your father. What about him? I have to ask you this, Laura. Whether or not you've ever told your fiancé the full story. I, uh, I've told him quite a lot. Including the way it ended for him? Don't talk about it now, Eric. Please. You know, I still blame myself. I knew that Harry wasn't right in the head. I, uh, I could see the signs. And I shouldn't have let it go as far as I did. Please, Eric. You know that I, I cannot bear to remember that time. I know, I know. You were only 14, but you witnessed it all. His mad delusion. Don't. Oh, my head. Laura, what is it? It's a... The pain again? Yes. Oh, poor darling. Here, come on, lean back. It happens every time. I remember my father. Shh. Now, 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 don't talk. Just lean back, relax, close your eyes. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Now, breathe deeply, darling. Deeply. Now, you remember how we do this together. How we make the pain disappear. How you clear your mind of everything but the sound of my voice. Yes. You can't hear anything but me now, Laura. Just my voice echoing in your mind. You're asleep now. You're so deeply asleep that you won't waken until I tell you. You won't know anything but what you hear me say. Do you understand? Yes. I understand. That's it, my darling. Deep. 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 Prudence? Prudence? Yes, Professor. I'm here. Bring it to me. No, Professor, this is wrong. Bring me the box, Prudence. Very well. Here. Yes. Yes, Prudence, a beautiful doll. That's a beautiful likeness. <laughs> Laura, Laura, open your eyes. Yes. What do you see, Laura? I see. I see. Nothing, nothing at all. You were asleep and you had a bad dream. Asleep? Yes. You had one of your headaches, do you remember? And I put you under hypnosis. And then I decided to let you sleep it off. You seem so tired. Mark, I feel so strange. I know. The truth is... Well, I'm not sure that you're well. What do you mean? When do you and Jimmy plan to get married? This weekend. I can't help wondering if that's wise. What do you... What do you mean? I wonder if you're well enough. You seem so run down and the headaches are obviously worse. It took a long, long time to make you lose the pain. Eric. Jimmy and I are getting married. This Saturday. We're driving to Crompton Lane. And we're getting married by the Justice of the Peace. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing. You sure you feel okay, Laura? Yes, I'm all right. You've hardly said a word since we started out. Well, a girl doesn't run off to get married every day of her life. Thank you, sir. 
time to reflect. Haven't changed your mind, I hope. No. I haven't changed my mind. Well, what's that cold sweat all about? It's not another one of your headaches, is it? No. It's just nerves. It's bridal jitters. Now, maybe... Maybe if you didn't drive so fast. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm in a hurry. Rip the bell off the door, young man. I'm sorry about that. Uh, my name is Collins. I called this morning about the wedding. Oh, the judge is inside. He's near death as a post, so better make the I do's good and loud. <laughs> I intend to. Oh, <clears throat> come in. Come on, come, come, come in, folks. Mom will act as witness. Fine. Uh, young lady, you stand uh, here. Next to you, young man. Honey, are you all right? Huh? Oh, yes, I, I'm fine. You sure you wouldn't like a glass of water? Oh, no. no thank you. Steady, honey. It only hurts for a minute. <laughs> Dearly beloved, <clears throat> we're gathered together here in the sight of God in the face of his company, trying to gather this man what? and this woman, holy matrimony, What's wrong? which is an honorable estate instituted by God. It's a little shortness of breath. Signifying unto us, Mr. Laura. Union, as the church Christ and his church. Oh, which holy just... estate Christ adorned. Oh, and Jimmy. Oh, yes. What's the friends. matter? Fine, uh, what's the matter? I, uh, what? I've got this... This awful pain. This terrible pain. Uh, oh! Oh! It's raining. Oh, Jimmy. I'm so sorry. Oh, honey, now, come on. Don't be sorry. Just... Take it easy, that's all. That's what the doctor said. I do feel better now. Much better. Oh, who would have thought the day would turn out like this? Stuck in a cheap motel across the street from the Justice of the Peace. We're not even married yet. It would be deliciously sinful if it weren't for this miserable room. Jimmy. What is it? Oh, God. Jimmy. Help me. What's the matter, honey? Is the pain again? No. No, it's something else. Jimmy, I, I have to get up. Oh, come on, I stay have in to get bed, up. darling. You heard the... I have to. I have to move. Laura! Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy! God, Lord, you hit the wall. I can't stop myself. Oh, Laura, oh, stop. Hold me, Jimmy. Hold me. I can't stop oh, come myself. Come on, darling. Don't fight me. Don't fight me. Stop. Flinging yourself around this way. Oh, I can't yourself. help it. I can't tell you how sorry I am, Jimmy, but I uh, also can't say that I'm surprised. Well, what do you mean? Well, my field is anthropology, but I'm not a complete stranger to the psychological sciences. In my opinion, uh, Laura's problem is the result of a conflict, the difference between two worlds, the world of everyday reality and the dark world of superstition. No matter how much she laughs about it now, Laura grew up Believing in devils and zombies and voodoo dolls. Oh, come on, I just can't believe that. Well, that's why I feel so strongly that Laura... Well, she just isn't ready for marriage. Well, here, let me show you something. What is that? It's a doll. Now, as you can see, it's a uh, very good likeness of Laura. Uh, Prudence is an artist of sorts. Your servant made this? Yes. It's her hobby. It's a sort of sculpture. But um, what do you suppose Laura did when she saw this doll? She screamed. She was horrified. She thought it was a voodoo effigy. And whatever happened to the doll would happen to her. No, Professor, I'm, I'm sorry. I just can't buy that explanation. Yes, I... Was afraid that you wouldn't. Laura's too sensible. This is all such childish would stuff. Would you care to test the theory? Test it? How? Yeah. Well, would you be willing to conduct a little experiment? 
Well, it might depends on what it is. All right, I'll tell you. At exactly 9 o'clock this evening, I will take our little doll here and bring it to that fireplace. And I'll hold the doll over the flames, high enough so that it won't be scorched, but low enough so that it can feel the heat. Oh, the dolls don't feel. No, no. Dolls don't. But Laura is another matter. You tell her what I'm doing. Tell her about the experiment. And then see how she reacts. I'm sorry, I don't like politics, Professor. I just want you to know what you're up against, Jimmy. Now remember, exactly nine o'clock. I don't understand you sometimes, Jimmy. I mean, I know you saw Eric. You told me you were going to. All right, I saw him. He just told me a lot of nonsense, that's all. About me and my father? About you and voodoo dolls. What did he say exactly? Laura, why did he have that doll made? What doll? You know, the one that looks like you. What are you... What are you talking about? You said you saw it, didn't you? No. I never saw any such thing, Jimmy. He must have been joking. He must have been putting you on. I saw the thing, darling. You what? I saw the doll. It was about this big and obviously hand-carved and... Well, it did look like you, Laura. Same long blonde hair, blue eyes, very much like you. That woman knows how to carve. Woman? You mean... Prudence? The servant? Yes, that's what he said. She made the doll that you actually think... Laura, you can't believe in voodoo. Not really. Oh, dear God. Then that explains it. That explains everything. What? The pain. In my chest, it was like a... Like the thrust of a needle. Oh, now, come on. And the way I lost control as if I did... Like I was being flung about like a... Like a doll. It was exactly... Like a helpless doll. Oh, cut that out. You know that isn't so... You're just convincing yourself of this nonsense. It's all in your mind. But what else explains it to me? What else? As long as he has that doll, he has me. Shh. Oh, honey, please. That's crazy. You've got to find it, Jimmy. You've got to get that doll away from okay, me. Okay, okay, honey. Just give us a little time. I don't have any time. If something happens to that doll, I'll die. No, Laura. You can't really believe that. I want you to prove that isn't true, and you can tonight. What do you mean? That nutty friend of yours said he was going to try a little experiment tonight just to prove the point to me. Well, I want you to disprove it. What sort of experiment? He said that exactly nine o'clock he was going to take the doll and bring it to the fireplace. Oh, no. He said he was going to hold it over the flames high enough for the doll to feel the heat. And he said you'd feel it, too. Oh, Lord, Jimmy. What time is it? It's uh, 20 of nine. We'll get out of here. No. Well, go back to my place and we will prove no. him wrong, darling. Prove him a liar. Oh, God. I, I'm getting warm. I'm getting terribly warm, Jimmy. That's your imagination. No, but it... Oh, honey, he said nine... Wait a minute. The watch isn't going. Jimmy, look. That clock on the wall, it is not... Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, Jimmy, it's happening. It's really happening. No, no, don't. No, we've got to fight this. It's the only suggestion. It's oh, he's killing me. Oh. He is burning me alive. Honey, no, darling, no. Oh, stop it, Jimmy. I'm on fire. I'm on fire. Yes, the mind is a powerful weapon. And when it's turned against ourselves, it's the most dangerous weapon on earth. Can Laura Fletcher find a way to stop her own mind from tormenting her and possibly ending her life? At least she isn't alone in the struggle. We'll find out what Laura and Jimmy can do about the deadly doll that menaces her when I return shortly with Act Three. Professor Douglas's experiment has succeeded only too well. 
And it's also succeeded in convincing Jimmy Collins that something has to be done to save the sanity and even the life of the woman he loves. And that the best place to be in would be the home of Eric Douglas, his servant Prudence, and the doll itself. Oh. Hello, Miss Fletcher. Hello, Prudence. Is Professor Douglas home? No, miss. He's gone. Gone where? On a lecture tour. He took the early morning train not half an hour ago. When do you expect him back? Not for days, he said. Prudence, I have to talk to you. Please let us in. Yes, miss. Prudence, when my fiancé was here the other day, the professor showed him a doll. A doll, miss? He said you made it. I made no doll, miss. I saw it, Prudence. It was in a black cardboard box about this big. And he took it out of this break front here. I know nothing of a doll, sir. All right. Suppose we look for ourselves. Please, sir. Jimmy, is it there? No, it's empty. Please. I cannot allow this. All right, where's the doll, Prudence? I don't know. Please, you have to help me, Prudence. You don't know what he's doing with that doll. He's making voodoo magic with it. Do you understand? I am a Christian, Miss Fletcher. You know what I'm talking about. He's putting a spell on me, Prudence. He's using that doll you made to make me do his bidding. He wants to stop me from marrying. He thinks only of your happiness, miss. You are like his daughter. He is torturing me. Would a father torture his own child? You've got to help us find him, Prudence. You must know where he's staying. I'm sorry. I know nothing. All right. Then the least you can do is give him a message. You tell him for me, for both of us, that his game isn't going to work. That Laura and I are leaving too, and we're not coming back. He'll never see her again. Did you get that? No matter what he does, he'll never see her again. Did you get that? No matter what he does, he will never see Laura again. <laughs> Prudence? Prudence? Where are you? Dear Professor, did you have a good tour? Yes. No. But I don't remember. It was endless. Seems like far more than three days. They were here, Professor. Who? Miss Fletcher and her young man. They came to see you and to find the doll. You didn't let them? No. It is still hidden. Good. The girl says you are torturing her. Only for her own good, Prudence. I swear that. This man Collins is wrong for her, and I had to prevent the marriage. Why, Professor? Because her father asked me to watch over her to protect her. That's why I asked you to make the doll, so that I could trick her into believing that I had some control over her. Nothing else would have worked. It was not a trick. Of course it was, Prudence. No, Professor. The doll was made because Dambala commands with her image, her hair, a drop of her blood. Now the girl and the doll have become sharers of the same soul. Prudence, you are slipping back into the jungle. Doll has no powers. Laura reacted only to suggestion. The doll is her. She is the doll. Only the sorcerer can break the spell. I'm tired, Prudence. I can't cope with mumbo-jumbo tonight. Professor, lift the spell from the doll. Oh, for heaven's sake. There is no such thing, Prudence. Call the girl. Tell her I will ask Dambala Uida to unchain her spirit from the doll. No. I will not do anything of the kind. Why? Because you don't want her to marry? That's right. Because you want her for yourself? What kind of talk is that? I'm more than twice her age. But you still want her. I have eyes. I have ears. I will call the girl. I will tell her that the doll is here. And that you will lift the spell from it. Stop that. Put that phone down. Now, you stay out of this, you hear me? I made the doll for you. Now I will unmake its evil. I told you to put that phone down. Oh, Shishana. 
Here, now stop. You're scratching my face. Look what you've done, you witch. You've drawn blood. I'm sorry. I didn't mean... You have meddled enough in my life. Now get out of here. I don't want to see your ugly face again. I want you out of here by tomorrow morning. Do you hear me? Yes, Professor. I heard you. A moment. Laura. Hello, Eric. You know Jimmy Collins, of course. What are you doing here? Sorry to be such early arrivals, Professor. We wanted to make sure you didn't go off to another uh, lecture this morning. I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Collins. Don't plan to stay long, Professor. Only until you give us that doll. The doll? That's right. <laughs> but for heaven's sake, you're, <laughs> you're really serious, aren't you? You really believe that doll has some mysterious powers. It doesn't matter, Eric. I'd just feel better if you... If you'd let me have it. I know it's here. How do you know that? Who told you? Prudence called me. Prudence? Yes, very late last night. She told us that the... The doll is in the hall closet. In a black box. She lied to you. Woman's gone crazy. I had to fire her. Want me to look in the closet, Professor? How dare you! I could have you arrested for what you're doing. Eric, please. We've been friends. Friends for such a, a long friends. time. Friends. That is a beautiful word, isn't it? Friends. Almost as good a word as father. That is all I ever meant to you. Oh, Eric. Let's have the doll, Professor. Oh, yes, the doll. The voodoo doll. Mr. Collins, I think that you are as mad as she is. Maybe I am mad, Eric. But I am afraid of the doll. I can't help myself. So please, please let me have it. I'll give you one minute to lead us to the doll, Professor. Oh, and then what will you do? Pump me full of lead? And I'll find it myself. In the course of it, I might break quite a few things. Quite a few things in the process. Things you may value. All right, I will show you the doll. There. Is that what you're after? It does look like me. I think I... I think I remember seeing it once before, but it's, it's as if it was in a dream. I'll take that, Professor. Stop right there! What? Now, suppose I didn't give you the doll. Suppose I smashed its head instead. Eric! All I have to do is smash the head against this wall. One sharp blow, and the head is broken. The skull... <laughs> Caved in, the pretty blue eyes shut forever. Huh? Shall I, Laura? Eric, why are you doing this to me? You smashed my life, didn't you? You didn't care what happened to me? Oh, Eric, but I do care. You walked out with him. You left me for him. Well, here's what he... Uh, then... Oh, uh, have a, you, what who, Laura? Eric, what's the matter? Uh, Jimmy, uh, what's the matter with him? Uh, my... Just... It's a heart attack. I think he's dead. Oh, my God. Are you sure? Look at his face. Oh, no. There's no sign of a pulse. He's gone, Laura. Oh, no. Lord, just like that. Must have been the excitement. No, it was not. Prudence. The spell is lifted, miss. When the sorcerer dies, the spell dies with him. What's that in her hand? Prudence, what are you doing with that knife? It was the only way, miss. Wait a minute. She's got something else, some some kind of doll. Prudence, you... You didn't... His skin and his blood from my fingernails. His curse from my lips and heart. Oh, Jimmy... Oh, horrible. She killed him. Oh, no, no, Laura, no. It, w it was a coronary. Only a coronary. I think. 
Well, personally, I don't think I'll ever trust a doll again. Not Raggedy Ann, or Betsy Wetsy, or even that paper doll they used to sing about. Of course, there's no question in my mind that Professor Douglas died of natural causes as opposed to supernatural. There's a great deal to be said for the power of suggestion, which, of course, is why you're about to hear the following suggestion. We hope that the story you just heard hasn't given you any ideas. That you're not all rushing out to the local toy store to buy up their supply of dolls in order to try some grisly experiments on your least loved ones. Take our word for it. It doesn't really work. But on the other hand, why do I have this sticking pain in my left shoulder? Our cast included Joanne Linville, Ross Martin, Virginia Gregg, and Carl Swenson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. No breath of it yet as we begin our tale and meet Stephen and Simon Fairley. The occasion is solemn, as death should be. But all else for these identical twins is a wild sense of freedom and expectation with no hint of the dark disasters already forming as they listen to the words of their father's last bequests. And that the whole of my estate shall be disposed of as follows. To Stephen Fairley, my firstborn son, I leave all my worldly goods in entirety. Well, thanks a hunk for nothing, dear old dad. Uh, there, there is a clause that refers to you, Simon. Then let's hear it. To my secondborn, Simon, I leave only advice. Mend your ways. It is inconceivable to me and has been most of my life that you could be brother to Stephen, much less his identical twin. Now, that's enough, Mr. Holcomb. Uh, there are some small bequests. Uh, no, we can take them up later. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, sir. Well, so am I, Stephen. I never expected the old crook to outfox me. I hope he rots in hell. That's a damnable thing to say. Precisely. Since this family long ago decided I'm the devil's own, why shouldn't I be his advocate? Or apostate? To hell with us all, Stephen. And may I be the last to join you. Our mystery drama, And Death Makes Even Stephen, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan, and Paul Hecht. It was true of the Fairley twins. Physically, no one could ever tell them apart. 
but their personalities. That was something else again. Stephen, the quiet, the considerate, the steady, the accountable. Simon, the wild, the unpredictable, the often cruel, the man of success in nothing. Except for physical resemblance, these two men from the same mother seemed the antithesis of each other. Aren't you going a bit heavy on that, Simon? Oh, just getting all I can, brother dear, while the getting is good. Now that I'm a pauper, I must make the most of every opportunity. Now, don't be a fool. Here, oh, give me that. Oh. oh, such a waste. But then you can afford it. You've had enough today. Besides, I must talk to you. Oh, well, you mean there may be a chance that I'm not to be cast out and told never to darken the door again? Knock it off, Simon. I got to talk to you, seriously. And for Pete's sake, sit down. No, I think I prefer to face the coup de grace, standing back to the wall, unblindfolded and unafraid. Well, suit yourself, but quit clowning and stay away from the booze. Okay, okay, Stevie, forgive me. It was just Dad's will. I know he didn't exactly approve of me, but wow. <laughs> Finding out how much really threw me for a loop. It isn't as bad as it seems. There was a letter to me. He didn't want to leave you with nothing, Simon. And he's asked me to set up a trust to be administered by me to provide you with a decent income. Well, now I think I I will sit down. How much? The trust or the income? No, the money in the pocket, my one-hour older brother. That's what I get while you're alive, right? Yes, a thousand a month, tax-free. <laughs> Twelve thousand shimmering simoleons a year. <laughs> That's a generous bequest from a man who could have bought Rhode Island and still have had enough left over to cut the national debt in half. Well, what would you have expected him to do? What he should have done, considering who we are. What? Cut the estate right down the middle. Left us each a half. You know why he'd never have done that. Oh, yes, only too damn well. I was ten before I was old enough to latch on to the truth. Why, you were always the favorite. No, no, favorite isn't even the word. You know he always blamed me for Mother's death. He hated me. That isn't true. Then why do the you suppose... The shoe was somehow on the other foot. Your whole life, Si. Expelled from school after school. The girls, the car accidents, robberies, beating up women. All the things he had to cover yes, for you. Yes, to save the precious fairly name. All the things I did to get his attention. To have him treat me like a human being instead of a murderer. Yeah, you've been drinking too much. Oh, no, Stevie boy. This is Simon Cold Sober. Simple Simon, who couldn't have his only parents' love, so he didn't know any better thing to do than to reach out any way to get him to even notice we me. We spent most of our lives in boarding schools. Do you think he offered me so much Yeah, more? only the whole ball of wax. I was talking of love. That's a word with no meaning in this house. Even between us. What do we really know about each other? Except as children, we've been separated most of the time. And I always managed to get the short end... <laughs> Who was drafted while you and Dad lived at home and you joined the business while I crawled on my belly with the V.C. trying to do what my father didn't have the nerve to do? Get rid of me. None of that was my fault. No. But Becky was something else again. You were missing in action. Reported killed. It was over two years, Si. I loved Becky, too, and she turned to me. Yeah, too bad I returned before the marriage had taken place. Still, in my condition, then, it was hard to think of us as identical twins. Forty pounds difference in weight made quite a difference, huh? So she stuck with you, and you won, as always. Which brings us back to the immediate problem. Are you ready to cut the estate right down the middle and give me half? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. But you are the brother who is all love. The money isn't dollars and cents, Simon. It's the shipping business, the holding company, the import-export exchange, a hundred interlocking parts. All right, then buy me off. A million, a couple of million, <laughs> out of those nice, anonymous, numbered Swiss bank accounts. And then you can do what my father longed his whole life to do. Forget I ever existed. Or that I still do. No way. Now, in three to five years, you'd blow it all on women and every grifter who got next to you with his get-rich-quick scheme. No. Father was right. I may have found him hard to love. Oh, you worked but... hard enough to toady your way into his affections. Uh, perhaps I was... Perhaps I was sorry for him. Now, who is to say which of us caused Mother most harm? Caused her to die in childbirth? Ah, uh, past history. Oh, now there are only two of us. A couple.
Come on, Cy, won't you accept Dad's suggestion and mourn him in some decency? 12000 a year? I can't live on that. It's free and clear. You have the house to live in, food, no living expenses. All right, suppose... Suppose I accept. We'll make it all legal. The trust can revert to you, if you will, by your 35th birthday. And Becky? She's already made her choice. But, but what? Well, since your unexpected return and father's death have delayed our marriage, well, perhaps it's only fair. Look, there's no way I can prevent you seeing her again, and now that you're back to yourself physically, I suppose you ought to. You know our engagement party is a week from tomorrow, but she won't be back from New York till then. In spite of father's death, we've decided not to call it off. You're invited. And if you think you can replace me as the prospective groom, <laughs> what can I do to prevent you? But as far as Becky is concerned, if you hurt her in any way, twin brother or not, I'll kill you. Oh, now I must see about the funeral arrangements. Huh. Not you, dear brother. I. I'm the one with everything to gain. If only I knew the way. Steve, why are you so late? Uh, would you believe a flat tire tonight of all nights? And, oh, and Becky, well, it, it, it doesn't matter now. Now that you're here. But you've got to help me, darling. We're, we're going to have to make a decision. About what? Kiss me first. I don't need any invitation for that. Uh, you, you've never kissed me like that before. There's never been an occasion quite like this. Uh, well, it, it looks as though it isn't going to be the occasion we planned it to be. What does that mean? It's father. You know how uptight he can get over nothing. Nobody better. I grew up with one of my own. I never heard you talk like that about your father before. Oh, I just... I just meant the generation gap. Well, maybe that, that's what it is with Father. He's, he's just laid it out flat. No engagement tonight, no announcement, nothing. Then what's the party supposed to be for? It isn't even a party anymore. It's a sort of memorial service for his old friend. He said it would be an insult to just his memory to have gaiety and fun so soon after his funeral. But I want us to be engaged. I don't want to wait. Look, I have, I have an even better idea. What? Let's you and me slip out right now. Forget the engagement and get married. But uh, how? We have no license or... Look, we're less than 20 miles from a state where all we need is the fee and two witnesses. Oh, oh you, you really bowl me over, Stephen. That's more the kind of thing Simon would do. Well, Simon was a bit of a whack, I guess. Simon was a lot worse than that. There are things I could tell you about your brother that... Well... That's past history. How is he now? The very picture of health. It's unbelievable. When he got back from prison camp, I, I could hardly recognize him. He'd had a rough time. I know. And that's why I was so ashamed of myself for... For what? Don't... Don't tell this to anyone, Steve. But I, I always used to be so scared after... After Simon and I had broken off and it was you and me. Scared of what? Just hold me. You would, you're so uncannily alike. Even I, who know you both so well, was scared I, I might not be able to tell the difference. Oh, darling, what a terrible thing to have to say or even think. Don't think it. Put it out of your thoughts. I can't. It's eerie. It's terrifying to even consider I could ever mistake my kind, gentle, loving Stephen for that wild, brutal twin who would have destroyed us. Shh, darling. Don't look back. Kiss me, and then let's take off together. Oh, Steve, I can't. With, not with the gift. Then kiss here. me. No, not, not with I the... Said, kiss <laughs> me. <clears throat> you... You're not Stephen? Stephen would never... Stephen. I've been looking for you everywhere, Becky. Oh, I wish you'd found me sooner. What's going on here? Well, it... It doesn't matter now, now that you're here. Seeing you together, there's, there's no doubt but a pilot... What is it? 
Look, if that lousy no, brother of mine... Stephen, don't be silly. He... he was just congratulating me. It's a little enthusiastic for just an engagement, wasn't it? I haven't told you the news yet, Stephen. It isn't our engagement we're announcing tonight. What? It's our wedding, and as soon as possible, unless you object. Oh, of, of course not, but your father... Uh, you leave him to me. I'll arrange everything. Oh, you lead, I'll follow. When's the day? Just as fast as we can get the license. Like, day after tomorrow, or the one after that at the latest. <laughs> I wish you didn't have to go, Steve. We should have been the party tail enders. I gotta get Simon home. He's practically out cold. Yeah. Come on, Simon. Uh, Come on, get in. Yeah, no, no. The driver's seat. You're in no condition to drive. Well, you're a lousy driver. I'm better at the wheel than you, drunk or sober. Now, would you get in the car? Uh, yeah. He's out cold. I hope someone's up to help lug him up to bed. Well, good night, darling. Good night. Drive carefully. The fog coming up. Yeah, I will. Goodbye, my uh, my almost wife. <laughs> Goodbye, my almost husband. I'll show them all. What? Yeah, I'll have her if I want. I'll take everything if I want. You can't do it to me. Well, just shut up, Simon, will you? Just go back to sleep. Huh? Hey, the VC got a roadblock, Lieutenant. Huh? Yeah, I feel it in my bones right around the next bend. To stop the convoy. I'm going to stop the... Oh! Steve, where, where are we? It's all right, all right. Take it easy, Simon. We're just on the way home. Huh? How come I'm not driving? Because you're passed out. Well, the, the road. Where's the road? We're, we're off the road. Cut it out, you fool. It's just far. No, no. Off the road. Back, what? back to the left. Look what you like. You to get back to the left. Get a full kill. After the protesting scream of rubber, the quiet in the forest is a stillness so thick it could almost be touched. A rabbit stands frozen before flight. The birds perch on the limbs, heads cocked, as if waiting to decide which direction danger will come from. The only thing moving now is one of the twins, climbing from the twisted wreck. But which one? I'll return shortly with Act Two. have risen and are off in a whir of wings. The rabbit has long since reached the safety of his warren before Simon Fairley has determined that the blood dripping in his eyes is from a minor gash in the forehead, and the rest of his aches and pains are just contusions and bruises. Only now does he go to look at his brother, pinned between the steering wheel and the seat cushion. Steve? Steve, are you all right? You're not dead. You can't be. Dead. It would solve everything. It would all be mine. And no blame for me. He was driving. Steve. Steve, can you hear me? I... Damn, it's so difficult to get at your heart to hear. I can't feel any pulse. He's dead. No more second-class citizen. I'd be number one at last. The house, the money, even... No. No, not Becky. She's beyond me. Unless... I could get away with it. I already did before I got careless and Steve turned up. Yes, that's it. That's the way. Make an exchange. Just get Steve out of his seat into mine. The wheel hasn't got him pinned too tight. Uh, no. There. He's coming loose. That's it. Uh, it's going to work. It's all going to be mine. Uh, what? 
What happened? Steve, you're... Uh, you're alive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess so. How are you? Hey, you're bleeding. Huh? Oh, I just... I, I, I just cut my head a little. It's it's nothing. Uh, oh, I can't get up. I think I sprained my ankle. Maybe broken it. Hey, here, give me a hand, Si. Uh, some sort of jagged rock under my back. Uh, c- could you move it or, 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 or help me up? Yeah, let, let me see. Oh, it's just it's just a rock. Let me get rid of it and then get rid of it or use it. What are you waiting for? I uh I'm not waiting any longer. Well then for the love of <laughs> This time you are dead. But not Stephen. Simon. No time to wait around. There's plenty to do before someone finds you. Go around and break the windshield. No, no, not not from the outside. The inside. Now, get Steve into my seat and get into the driver's seat till someone finds me. All right, fellas, finish up with the pitches and then get those two guys free. (laughs) Now, don't try to move them. The ambulance will be here any moment. It, okay, we're just it can, uh, it can back down there. Okay, miss, nothing for you. Move along. Oh, oh Sergeant, please. You, you've got to let me get through to Stephen. Stephen who? Stephen Fairley. I, I heard about the accident. You know Stephen Fairley? We're going to be married next week. Okay, cut your motor. Come on out. Now, uh, look, Miss... Uh... Uh, Elizabeth Rundell. Oh, sure. I thought I recognized you. Uh... Well, what is it, Sergeant? Can't you take me to the car? Well, he's not badly hurt. Look, he... uh... Look, Miss Rundell. Do you happen to know who was driving the car? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. It... It was Stephen. You sure of that? Quite. They'd only just left a, an engagement party at my house, and Simon had had too much to drink, so Stephen took the wheel. They look so like each other, I can't blame you for not They being... don't look nothing like each other now, lady. Well, they're not... Stephen isn't dead. The passenger is dead. The driver is alive. Oh. That's your guy. How bad off he is, we won't know till we get into the hospital. Nurse? No, Steve. It, it's me. It's Becky. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Do you want the nurse? No, no. It's, it's just this bandage. It's, it's half over my eyes. <laughs> You'll be able to tell me from Simon from now on easily with this scar I've got over my eyes. Haven't they... Haven't they told you about Simon yet? What do you mean, told me? He wasn't... Oh, my God, now... Now I remember I was... I was half out when they found me, but I... His head must have gone right through the windshield. Is is he dead? Yes. That poor, foolish kid. It's all my fault. I should have put the seatbelt on him. Oh, darling, don't blame yourself. Just tell me what happened. It was the damn fog and Simon's drinking. I... I was taking it quite easy, but you know that big hollow on Hillsdale Road shortly after Gray's Corners? Mm-hmm. Well, just just as we hit that, the fog was like a smoke screen. And at the same time, Simon woke up from some drunken dream about Vietnam and went crazy. He grabbed the steering wheel and threw us right off the road and into the tree before I had a chance to break. The wheel and the seatbelt saved me. Although I did take a pretty good crack across the forehead, but Simon... Well, forget about that now, dear. It's over and done with. Just let's get you well. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, Becky. I've gotten a clean bill of health. Nothing broken, just a few bruises and a little embroidery above my eyes. You think you can manage a slightly piebald groom with a bandage headband? Oh, now look, Steve. We, we can't have the wedding as we planned it now. Why not? Well, how would it look? I don't care how it looks. It was my father and brother, and there was little love lost among us. I can tell you the truth now, dear. But I I thought you and your father... My father was a hard man, 
selfish, domineering, insensitive. He was more like a machine than a man. He was proud of me not because I was his son, but because I was his heir. Something to perpetuate the fairly name. Some sort of pseudo-immortality. Well, I'll make it up. I'll make it up to you. The past, Steve. Our future will be a long and lovely one. Huh. With no twins? Oh, well, I can't promise that. Well, they, they skip generations. Now, look, you, you run along and plan something lovely to wear for tonight. Tonight? Yes, darling. I've already arranged the whole thing with Cook and Butler. You and I are having our engagement dinner alone at the house tonight. I'll send Gray with the car to pick you up at 7.30. And uh, please forgive me for troubling you with uh, uh, affairs of state, so to speak, the very day you're out of the hospital. That's all right, Mr. Holcomb, but I am a little short of time. Yes, of course, by all means. Now... What I need is a number of signatures from you. Signatures? No, just some legal papers and certain uh, certified checks which can't wait. Damn. Well, look, you'll you have to give me a day or so until they can take the bandage off this right hand of mine. I, I can't sign anything until they do. Oh, my apologies. Of course, I hadn't realized. Of course, everything can be delayed. <laughs> Except for one thing. What? Well, there's a piece of correspondence I don't quite understand. Apparently some sort of a private deal between you and uh, Pessin, Joglu and company. Who? Uh, Pessin, Joglu and company, a Turkish import-export firm with whom we have some dealings. You know, Persian rugs, tabarets, ancient jewelry, inlaid cabinets, silk screens. Object are of many descriptions. Yes. But I don't know what consignment this letter, opened by mistake after your father's death, refers to... Uh, well, damn this forehead bandage. You, uh, read it to me. Oh, yes, very well. <coughs> oh, omitting the formal address. It reads, um, <coughs> Dear Stephanos, we are still awaiting payment consignment YB382-7. We are informed that delivery has been received. Unless your check for $48,000 or equivalent uh, reaches us within the week, we will be forced to take action against you. We know this must only be an oversight. Yours sincerely, Demetrius, the peasant, uh, uh, Joe. Well, why don't you just pay it? Oh, Mr. Fairley, no one else in the company knows anything about this consignment, except you. Me? Oh, well, of course. Look, it, it's a perfectly normal deal. Just... Just pay him the money. Oh, a check that size would have to be countersigned by you, sir. And with your hand... Well, by condition... tomorrow, I may be able to manage. Have we Have we time? Well, according to the letter, to the end of the week or from the beginning of next. I don't think it's that important. All that puzzles me is the nature of such a, an expensive secret and, uh, <laughs> shall we say, a, a personal consignment. I don't think I have to account to you for that. Oh, well, not to me, but eventually when the books are... If you must it, know, it was a wedding present for my wife. Wife-to-be, that is. It, uh, it was my father's idea. A, a necklace. Apparently he got sick before he issued the check. Is there any reason why I can't close this matter? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Everything is yours now, Stephen, eh? <laughs> well, now, I, I mustn't delay you. You, you uh, will be postponing the wedding this Saturday, I suppose. No. Well, but there's scarcely time for your brother's funeral. It was Simon's it? desire to be cremated. It's already been done. There will be no funeral. Ah, oh, I see. Perhaps you're right, Stephen. There's been enough sorrow for you in the past few days. You have a right to some happiness. Uh, that briefcase is very heavy. I'll carry it to your car for you. Well, perhaps it's better I leave it here. Then you can sign at your leisure. Good idea. And now, uh... Oh, yes. Now, of course, I must be off. Well, I expect you'll be taking a honeymoon, you and Becky... <laughs> so we won't be seeing you at the office for quite a while. No, not for quite a while. <laughs> uh, here you are, Mr. Holcomb. Let me help you in. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, call me as soon as you're ready with those signatures. 
A signature. I'd better get up to Steve's room and start learning to copy it. And what the devil is that business with the truth? I've got to get away from here fast. There are too many things I don't know about Steve. Everything's working too well to make any mistakes now. I uh, guess I have time to go through Steve's desk before I have to get dressed. Damn, it's locked. Naturally, Simon. Among your other unpleasant characteristics, you've always been a sneaky little snoop. Steve. Not exactly in the flesh, of course, thanks to you, but Steve, just the same. We're something rather special, you and I. <laughs> Even though you've somewhat altered my appearance, I am still your twin. <laughs> Only the mouth and the chin and the hair, matted now with dried blood, would serve to identify Steve. The rest of the face is a horror of torn flesh and the white shards of shattered bone, out of which wreckage stares the one uninjured eye, boring with deadly intensity into the terrified face of the man who was once his image. I'll return shortly with Act Three. fear and fascinated by that single hypnotizing eye, Simon is forced for what seems an eternity to focus on his twin's ruined face, the mocking smile and the white even teeth, a ghastly contrast which multiplies the horror of the broken skull above them. At last, with a supreme effort, he tears his eyes away to find himself staring at the reflection of his own countenance in the mirror above the desk. No. Oh, God, no. Don't cover your face, little brother. Leave me at least with a memory of how I once looked. You're dead. Cremated. You can't be here. As I said, not in the flesh, but uh, we are hatched from the same egg, Simon. You can't get rid of me so easily. I shall always be with you uh, in spirit, shall we say? No. No, leave me alone. I will. When it serves me. Or you. Steve, I... I didn't... I didn't mean to... Of course you did. I might possibly have done the same if our positions had been reversed. What? You have a lot to learn about me, little brother. Which you would have in time. <laughs> to avoid breaking open my desk, let me offer you the key. Steve, I, I... I can't rummage through your things now. The key? Take it. Why not? And since time is short before the dinner, I'll even help you understand a little better. Open the desk. Yeah. Left-hand pigeonholes are a false front. No, no, here. Let me. There are all my secrets. Now, while you read them, I'll tell you about the most important items. But why, why are you helping me? Because I want you quite as thoroughly damned as I am. I'll make it brief as you read. Now, Demetrios is in the drug business. For years, I have used Father's impeccably accredited import firm to cover for deliveries. You? You in drugs? You'll find the evidence in the papers you're leafing through. <laughs> Wicked Simon, the black sheep. Stupid Simon, really. We were twins in more than the outward look, believe me. The difference was that you didn't have enough sense to bury your faults. I was smart enough to keep them covered up. But not smart enough to realize you had as little scruples as I had when it came to the point. All right, so you lost. Why not let me have my innings now? Why not? I'll even be of help. Until you have studied my signature enough to mask it, I'll even sign your papers for you. <laughs> oh, don't worry. The hand that guides the pen may be of the spirit world, but the pen and ink are finite enough. Go on. Get ready for romance. This... This letter that came from your Demetrius, shall I... Shall I pay this? Ah, uh, let me see. Oh, that double-dealing crook. Nah, don't pay him a cent. I've already made arrangements so that he will be paid in full. 
Yeah, forget it. And you? <laughs> I will not be so easy to forget, dear twin brother. We are bound together by special hoops of steel. As long as I haunt this house, I shall be unavoidably hard to escape. Well, go on. It's time for you to be all that Becky expects of me. Of you? Aren't I what you hope to become? <laughs> It's really too hot for a fire, but I, I couldn't resist it. I'd find it irresistibly romantic, even if I were bathed in sweat, which I'm not. <laughs> can, I, can I make you another drink? No, oh, thank you. I want to enjoy this dinner and remember it. The champagne. I'd be disappointed if there weren't. I don't want ever to disappoint you, darling. Oh, my darling Steve. Not you, ever. <sighs> I'll try to live up to your expectations. Do you love me? I love you. I've always loved you. Now that I came so close to losing you, I love you even more. Oh, it's a terrible thing to say, I know, but... Thank God it was Simon instead of you. Shh, darling, let's not spoil the evening. I've sent all the servants out, you know. We're all alone. You sure you don't want another drink? No. But can I make a confession? Of course. I'm famished. <laughs> Mademoiselle A. <et> Selby. <laughs> May I escort you to your table? Thank you, monsieur. Oh, Stephen. How pretty the table is. My favorite roses. But why... Why what, Becky? Why is it set for... for three? You don't mind my joining you, Simon, do you? Suitably dressed? White tie and tail? And, uh... The face mask, I thought, was a stroke of genius. It hides the damage so nicely. Did you say something, Steve? That damn Joseph, he's in his dotage. I suppose he's so accustomed to setting for three that he just... Don't blame the poor butler. I set the third place. Damn you! I won't have it! There's only... Uh... Steve! Steve, what is it? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Becky. I, I can't help it. It's all spoiled now. Let's get out of here and eat somewhere else. I've got to get away from this house. Steve, you're not eating a thing. I'm, I'm sorry, Becky. I, I know it must seem foolish to you, but that extra chair set for our dinner, it, it threw me. Well, it was unfortunate, I know, when you wanted everything to be just right. But don't blame poor old Joseph too much. After all these years of setting the table for you and your father and... and... Simon. That's what did it to me. See, I could, I could see him sitting in that chair with his face. You didn't see him after the accident, thank God, but he... Steve, it wasn't your fault. He was the one who grabbed the wheel and pulled you off the road into the tree, wasn't he? Simon. Yes, Simon was, was the one, all right. That, that's true enough. So you mustn't take the blame. As long as I live in that house, he will haunt it. The memory of him, the battered face. Well, we'll solve all that. You won't live in the house. You'll move out to a hotel tonight, and after we're married on Saturday, when we come home from the honeymoon, we'll buy a new house. Hey, wait. I, I have an even better idea. Maybe we'll never come back. Never? Maybe we'll, we'll settle in, in Rome or Paris or the Costa del Sol. Or, or just travel. I've always wanted to see Mont Saint-Michel and... The Tivoli and Taj Mahal. That's my girl. That, that's what we'll do. Free souls with never a look behind. Becky, Becky, we've got it made, you and me. From here on in. Off for the honeymoon. Huh? Oh. Oh, God. You again. Always, always, my dear twin. We're prisoners in the same jail. What does that mean? This house. <laughs> well, I know you think you're escaping it for a while, but that's only temporary. Take it from me. Becky and I are off for a honeymoon. Of course. Not till Saturday, though. Does seem a little early to be packing. Might as well start sometime. And you seem to be planning to take quite a wardrobe. Well, on a ship, there's plenty of room. Plenty of distance between here and there. What do you mean, there? Oh, wherever. 
What were they, Rome? Paris, Mont Saint Michel, the Taj Mahal, the very poetic one. Damn you! Do you know everything? One of the few advantages of being a ghost. And you. You can go everywhere? No, there are limitations. No, I'm tied to this house. And you're welcome to it. Thank you, Simon. Or should I call you Stephen? Oh, it's so confusing since you switched identities. Which, by the by, reminds me, while you were dining and making all your escape plans, I signed all the papers old lawyer Holcomb left, so you are free to go. I, uh, I suppose I should say thank you. <laughs> call it my wedding gift. What, what about the check for that Demetrius or whatever his name was? Oh, forget about that. That was a private deal. He doesn't need your check. Other arrangements have been made to satisfy that debt, believe me. So, this, as the word goes, is goodbye. Yes. I'm sorry I won't be able to attend the wedding and give the bride away. I never intend to come near this house again. Pity. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. You like the cabin all right, Becky? Oh, it couldn't be more perfect. How about your new husband? Ditto. Well, just keep feeling that way. <laughs> uh, darling, you, you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Why? Oh, I don't know. The, the assistant purser just told me someone from the office needs an okay or something before we sail. He doesn't have a pass, so they wouldn't let him aboard. I'll be back in ten minutes. Well, uh, don't miss getting back on the boat. Don't you worry. It took me long enough to catch it. Mr. Hood? Yeah. You from uh, Fairley Company and Sons? Yeah, right. You uh, Stephen Fairley? Yes. Good. I got a message from you from my boss. Uh, can we step over here to my car? Well, the boat's too near sailing. You just tell me here. At the car. I just play it real cool, Mr. Fairley, and don't make any sudden moves. The jab you feel is the muzzle of a short barrel 38. Okay. Shall we step over to the car? Where? Where are you taking me? A little spot on the Jersey Flats. Ain't exactly quicksand, but you'd be surprised how fast that slime sucks up a body that ain't moving. You're... You're not going to kill me. You know, dope is a funny game. Using your business as a front was a great way for us to get the stuff in. But when you try the old double O, Mr. P, oh, that was crazy, Stephen. No, look, you don't, you don't understand. I'm, I'm not Stephen. What? Stephen is dead. I'm Simon. I had nothing to do with this. Yeah, sure. See, sure. no, look. When we had the automobile accident, all I did was change places. Sure. I mean, Stephen was driving, and I was. Oh, for God's sake! Look, I just got married. My wife is. Please, you've got to listen. Okay. Dump him in the swamp and let's get out of here, Giorgio. Well, here we are, Simon. Back home again. Table set for two this time. That's all there is. The rest are gone. Just you and me. Oh, I know how it feels. But you might as well face it. Eternity is such a long time. And since we were twins, it seemed a shame that Simon was alive and Stephen dead. This way, I'm still dead. But even Stephen. A footnote to the tale you just heard. Mr. Hood's quagmire proved less effective than its reputation. And Simon's body was recovered. Since he had served in the army, an examination of his fingerprints established the deception about the death of the twins. The tangled result of the estate is unimportant since there was no heir. But at least Becky gained a measure of peace in finding out that she had not tied her life to a man who would have ruined it. I'll be back shortly. Whenever the dead try to control the living, the seeds of disaster are sown. At the beginning of our tale, Justine Fairley lay in his bed, whitened with the wax of death. 
his stubborn mind at peace with the thought that he had settled the future of his twin sons. Sick transit gloria mundi, so passed the triumphs of this world. He could no more control the accident of their birth than he could their deaths. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Paul Hecht, Joan Lovejoy, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying? Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said... Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where, Where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise... The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box, although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family, and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. 
It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, uh, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's, it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits. Mr. Rogers says that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, what's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. Come in, sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me... Who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For, for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's $50. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the $50 enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... Here's a pencil. I have my own. Now, the shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's... It's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Right. Hinges. You see them here on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... It's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh... All right, now leave... Enough... Room... For y your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. Bill! Bill! Are you in there? Just a minute. I'm opening the door. Lucy! What are you doing here? Are you all right? Is he still here? What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I'm just so frightened and... All the way over here, I was just worried about you and, and, and scared, but but I came anyway, and now... I'm... Oh, Bill, I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will we live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand? I don't want hands touching me. That have been touching death all day. <sighs> all right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving.
Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Well, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not, but I heard it from the barber. Some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. It looks something like a carrying case for a, a, a bass fiddle. Yes, sir. It looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? <sighs> yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh... I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset. She's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Uh, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't, but Mrs. Rogers can now ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. Uh, I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven... Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I've thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had I've in his I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. <laughs> that coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay $50? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here, I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two.
I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful, but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Matt, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, That won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin, and we don't know who. We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door? Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there, there's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. You'll catch cold. Where's my coffin? Ah, that's it, in the corner. Mm-hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. The make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir... It's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it off. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers... If there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go, for the love of heaven. Let him go, Mr. Rogers. He... He lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, I'll... All right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that... That spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry! How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes, around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. Locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? Uh, A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Uh, Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Uh, He must have gone in. Gate's locked. Uh, Well, I have my key. You you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on. Come on. Uh, No, sir. There. 
There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I... I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who could lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man... Ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg of you. Close the gate. I beg of you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. At this point, Bill Spindle stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far on a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. (laughs) Don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here, I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up, wake Uh, up, man. Well, uh, well, Bill... Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed, and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh. It's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right... What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. 
It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of I this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music. And I thought I saw a light. I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside... The lid slammed shut, and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. I can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, we really have to go on. It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. That's yeah, the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. Uh, there's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? Uh, we'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose, suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right, all right, I'll come with you. Good Lord, there he is, lying across that coffin and... So still. Is he... Is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation. But I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard... I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. But he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account, not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers? My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. 
Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music and my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. Either I'd go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the Prince of Darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering... You'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time, when suddenly I thought I'd lost my mind because... Not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined. Joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? <laughs> There's one thing I know, darling... I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestors, girl. Lucy. Emphatically. 
Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. Why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindles family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business, and he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, the date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. Right? I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if you've forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy, I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely. Why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here. I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Aha! Uh -huh. Then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in 10 20 and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place. Remember... Our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but... That would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and, and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one, how in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. <laughs> you mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin. What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jerry. You're not going to try to tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head. Well, it's, it's possible. Maybe, I don't but... believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me. Let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, 
It all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. All right. Ah, dear. <laughs> it's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom where it's widest? Okay. There. <gasps> right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. That's got it now. <sighs> now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay. Let's open it. All right. Now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I... I can't. You got it. You got it. Ah, Jerry was right. It's yes. a compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money. A $20 bill. Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. Well, what does it say? Wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found this secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family. Signed, Edward Rogers. What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs, and he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts, and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. WCCO Radio, you Las Vegas for three days and three nights. G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. What do you think about witches? Not the bony hags and atrocious crones of Shakespeare and legend, or the poor unfortunates of Salem, but witches who are young, witches who are beautiful, witches who even fall in love. Excuse me. 
Who let you in here? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing you. I'm only trying to make a deadline. Well, if you're in the news business, I've got something for you. It better be good. I... I'm going to have to kill my wife. That won't be news till you do it. I know. I want you to know why. Okay. Why? Because... She's a witch. Our mystery drama, I Warn You Three Times, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Joan Loring. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of those miserable, stormy nights in the dead of winter. A thick, clinging, wet snow seems determined to smother the entire earth and everyone on it. You'd think that most people would choose the cheerful indoors, a warming fire, a relaxing drink, a comfortable bed. That's the problem with most people. You can't figure them. For instance... Consider that line of cars crawling down Main Street, bumper to bumper, skidding, sliding. Where is everybody headed on a night like this? Have we become a race of lemmings? Do we follow some mysterious, unconscious drive? An interesting speculation, but we won't pursue it. We'd better consider the traffic, which has come to a complete standstill. A car seems to be stuck at the intersection. Let's go, sister. That light's green. Oh, officer. Well, what are you waiting for, lady? Uh, my, my husband. Your husband? That, uh, the light is red, and he said he wanted to step out and clean off the rear window. Uh, hey, mister. You finished back there? He just stepped out. It was a moment ago. Tom? Well, maybe he slipped in the snow. Uh, Tom, are you all right? Lady, there ain't nobody around the back. He just went out. Yeah, just to yeah, clean the... yeah, yeah, to clean the rear window. Uh, that's what you said. But what could have happened? Uh, just sit there a minute, lady. Hey, lay off of that horn. I know you got one. Now, what's wrong, officer? Did you see a guy get out of that car up there? Did I see a guy get yeah, out of Yeah, 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 did you? Huh? Are the police after someone in the skate car? Oh, come on, Buster. Just tell me. Did you see a guy cleaning off the rear window of that car up front? Well, to tell you the truth, I wasn't paying any attention. I was listening to the radio. Now, there could have been somebody, but then again, I, I couldn't say there was. It's not that I'm not trying to get involved. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a citizen. I know my duty, but... but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Officer, where is my husband? He was just there. Lady, he uh, disappeared. How could he disappear? I don't know. I do know he ain't here. What am I going to do? Well, you can't keep blocking traffic, lady. you got to move on. Where? Well, I... it beats me. But you must find him. Look, you got troubles with your husband. That's your problem. But when you hold up traffic, but... that's my problem. Will you feed her a little gas, please? Come on, let's go. Let's but go. I can't. Lady, you got to go somewhere. I can't go anywhere. I don't know how to drive. Desk, Lieutenant Carroll. Yeah. Nobody wants this guy, you say? Well, technically, that isn't true. His wife wants him. Okay. Well, look who's here. Lieutenant? You won't win any Pulitzer Prizes around this joint tonight, Peterson. I was hoping you might have a little bone to throw me. Page one? I'll settle for two inches on the bottom of page 38. If you promise to remember two R's and one L. First name, Irvin. Not Irving. Lieutenant Irvin Carroll. We may have something shaping up. Ah. I don't know where it can go. Everywhere or nowhere. What have I got to lose? Sitting over there on the first bench. Ooh. That's nice. And married. Well, you win, you lose. A very, very weird story. Tell me about it. No. Let her tell you about it. Why don't you ask her? Excuse me. Up. Uh, My name is Fred Peterson. I, I'm a reporter for the Union Messenger. Oh, no. I don't want to talk to a reporter. Why not? Because I... Because you're afraid? Why? Could you put Tom's picture in the paper? Well, that depends. Has Tom done anything? He's disappeared. Well, we'd need the how, the when, the where. 
When? About an hour ago. Where? On Route 986 at Main Street. How? I don't know. You see, we were driving south. It was snowing hard, and he said, I can't see out the rear window. The light was red. He stepped outside to wipe it off. He didn't come back. Where, where did he go? I don't know. Well, where could he go? I don't know. In that snow. And, and there's nothing around there? Could, could you give me a why? I... I can't imagine. I don't know what to do. I sit here waiting. Look, my name is Hetty Parsons. Tom and I, we've been married five years. We don't have any problems. I mean, we're very happy. If you print his picture in the story, maybe someone will see it who can help us. Excuse me a minute. Well? Yeah, I think I'll run with it. I don't blame you. I was always partial to girls with honey-colored hair and baby blue eyes. Ah, so you noticed, too. Have you run a check on her husband, Tom Parsons? Well, he's not one of the known bad boys. No record at all. And what did she say he did? He's an accountant. He has his own business in the Barstow building. You looked him up in the phone book? Checks out. They were headed south, huh? That's what she says. If it was a trip, there should have been bags. There were. His and hers? His and hers. How does it look? What do you want from me? I don't solve crimes. I sit here behind the desk. Come on, Lieutenant. Now, this is one for you, Fred. How could a guy disappear just like that? In that storm. Hmm. There's no place to go. He could have had a car following in back of them. A friend was driving it, maybe. Well, he had to go somewhere. But why? Right now, we're treating it as missing persons. It's all we can do. He's not wanted for anything. He's a legitimate citizen, as far as we know. He hasn't even done anything to her. At worst, he left her in a car. He hasn't even deserted her. Yet, who was driving? He was. She can't. Well, that's abandoning her, isn't it? No. At best, we'd have him for abandoning the car. Yeah. Yeah, excuse me a minute. Listen, Mrs. Parsons. Yes. Why, why don't you go home? I've got my oh. car outside. Oh, no, no. I, I, I want to be here in case they find time. They'll let you know if they find you. No, I don't want to be home alone tonight. I... I... Just want to stay yeah, here. But it may be hours. It may be even days. Don't say that. I'm sorry. I. I'm just so jumpy and so nervous. I can't believe what's happened to me. Well, if you're going to sit here, you should have some coffee and a sandwich. Oh, I couldn't think of food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Dennis. Well, look who's here. The friendly reporter. Yeah, listen, that girl. Yeah, I was going to ask what girl, but yeah, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I want to start at the beginning. Oh, well, you know, Lieutenant Terrell's got two R's, but Patrolman Dennis got two N's. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did happen? Well, like she said, he went out to clean the rear window and he was gone. Yeah, anybody see him? Uh, I checked the car in back, but who looks? Who notices? Yeah, where could he have gone to around here? Well, on the south side, you got open fields. On this side... A couple of warehouse buildings locked up. Night watchman? Yeah, he's a retired cop. No sign of anybody trying to break in, to hide, or whatever he may have wanted to do. Okay, so what could have happened to the guy? Well, it's all very interesting, but in 15 minutes I go off duty, and I won't have to worry about it. I didn't think I could touch a thing, but I must have been starving. Has there been any word? Yeah, you'll hear the minute they know. Now, listen, Hetty. I can help you, but you have to help me. I'll do whatever I can. We have two basic roads to explore. One, somebody was out to get your husband. Oh, no. No! Tom is the mildest, sweetest, most obliging guy on earth. He has absolutely no enemy. That you know about Tom and I have no secrets from each other. Everybody has at least one enemy. Tom is incapable of hurting anyone in any way. He sounds too good to be true. If he does have a problem, that's it. All right. The second road to explore. He wasn't pushed. He jumped. What does that mean? It means he walked out on you. Oh, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. Why? I've had a liberal education tonight, Mr. Peterson. Call me Fred. No, not yet, or maybe never. I've been introduced to a new world. I've been thrown in with people who... 
basically don't believe in anyone. Don't trust anyone. And perhaps they have good cause. Perhaps that's how life is in their world. Perhaps their world is the real world, but it isn't my world. May I ask, do you come from another world? It's entirely possible. I won't call you Fred unless and until we become friends. But that's just a little thing. The policeman who brought me here is a confirmed cynic. So is the lieutenant. And so are you. I must plead guilty as charged. All of you propose two basic hypotheses. A, my husband was ambushed by enemies. B, my husband abandoned me. You can't conceive of people who... They simply don't make or have enemies. You can't conceive of people who are completely in love. I'm not a fool, Mr. Peterson. I read these attitudes. What a wonderful world you live in, Mrs. Parsons. I hope you can stay there always. We're so dependent on each other, Tom and I. We need each other. We're... We're so complete together. But we still have the basic fact of his disappearance. Yes, but all you can see are two alternatives. There is a third, you know. Really? Perhaps he was taken ill suddenly and he just wandered off. Oh, maybe I should go back there. Uh, I've and... already been back there. There's no place he could have wandered off to. Tell me, does he have a history of any sort of illness, amnesia, oh, anything like that? No, nothing like that. Well, then, where are we? Nowhere. Perhaps you are nowhere, Mr. Peterson. Okay, tell me where you are. I have faith. I believe Tom will be found, or he will find himself, and he will have an absolutely reasonable and rational explanation. I hope so. Hey! Oh! Hey! Tom! Oh, Tom, darling. Tom, what happened to you? I was so scared. Oh, darling, you're all right. Teddy, are you all right? Yes. I don't understand. I happened to tune in the news, and there it was. Tom Parsons' accountant with offices in the Barstow building had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Tom, I was so worried. Mr. Parsons was driving with his wife. He stepped out of the car to clean off the rear window, and... Teddy, what did you tell them? I wasn't in the car with you. I was at home. <laughs> Well, here we have the story of two people who love each other deeply, who trust each other completely. It sounds like the Garden of Eden. But we all know what happened back there in the traffic and the snow. We shall return shortly with Act Two. You've seen these couples, or rather heard of them. They dwell in a sea of perfect harmony, never a ripple of discord. But when they do have a disagreement, well, it's a beaut. Here we have Fred Peterson listening to Hetty and Tom Parsons having a fantastic difference of opinion. Tom! Tom, how can you say that? Hetty, darling, I was not in the car with you. I was home. Home. You said, let's get out of this miserable cold and snow. Let's head south for a couple of weeks. Hetty, when did I say that? How could I say that? Uh, you know I'm swamped with work at the office. You came home this afternoon, Tom. You said, how would you like to leave for Florida tonight? And I said, give me an hour to pass. Uh, excuse me. Who's he? Oh, he's just... A... I'm just Fred Peterson of the Union Messenger. A reporter? Oh, please, 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 don't be alarmed. I assure you it's a thoroughly respectable profession. Well, I... I see no point in... Well, emblazoning this all over the newspapers. Is there anything to emblazon, as you put it? This is a private affair. Tom, tell me what happened. What happened to you after you left me? Eddie, I told you I never left. Tom. How could I have left you? I wasn't with you. Oh, no, Tom. This time I have witnesses. The police officer, he knows you went out to clear the rear window. How does he know? Because he... Because you told him. Mr. Parsons. Now, obviously, your wife seems distraught. I would suggest... Keep your suggestions to yourself, Mr. Peterson. Don't you dare imply that I'm overwrought or nervous or hysterical. I am completely calm, extremely rational, and absolutely in command of myself. I know what happened this evening. Mr. Peterson, this is obviously a private matter between my wife and me and nobody's business but ours. What did you mean, Mrs. Parsons, when you said that this time you had witnesses? Have there been other times when... Hetty, it doesn't do us any good to air this in public. All right, Tom. Take me home. Uh, let me talk to that officer at the desk there. 
find out if there's anything we have to do. Well? Well, what? Friend, husband, Tom. He didn't turn out to be quite as advertised. And what is that supposed to mean? He isn't quite the sweetest, mildest, most obliging guy on earth, is he? He is to me. I guess it's all a matter of how these words are defined, isn't it? And about this oh-so-complete understanding between the two of you. Won't you at least admit you're having a difference of opinion right now? I don't have to admit anything. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'll go quietly. Are you sure you really want me to go? Please. Regardless of what you say to me, you are in trouble. No, I... no, don't deny it. Well, what if I am? I'd like to help you. Why? Because... because... Would you want to help me if I were... Middle-aged and fat and sloppy and ugly? It isn't ten minutes ago. You accused me of living in a world where no one trusted the next fellow or believed in him. You accused me of being a confirmed cynic. Is it possible you don't remember what you say from one minute to the next? I'm sorry. Don't be. There's a great deal to what you said. You're kind, but no one can help you. I could try. And no one should try, either. Why not? It's too dangerous. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I'm warning you. You're only getting me in deeper. Please, Fred. For openers, my business is to take chances and get myself into... Hey, you know what happened? What? You called me Fred. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. But you did. And that means we're friends. Look, I only want... You're the one who set up the ground rules for this thing. First names are for friends only. Please, forget what happened here tonight. I warn you. You already warned me twice. It won't work. I can only warn you three times. You mean you keep score? Please don't joke, Fred. You keep saying the wrong word, or I should say the wrong name. The wrong name is Fred. You can't call me Fred and expect me to forget everything. I warn you. I warn you for the third time. Forget all about tonight for your own sake, for your own safety. And after saying all that, you still expect me to forget about it. I... Tell my husband I'll wait for him outside in the car. Wait a minute, Hetty. I warned you, Fred. I warned you three times. Now, goodbye. Where's my wife? She said she'd meet you in the car. Uh, Mr. Peterson, if I were you, I'd forget everything that happened tonight. Is that a threat? No. A warning. That's all I've been getting around here. Warnings. Well, for your own good, take them seriously. And if I don't? You'll regret it for the rest of your life. Which may not be a long one. You still insist that you're not threatening me? I'm only trying to help you. Really? And why should you do that? Why? I don't know why. Maybe it's because the last guy tried to help me. What last guy? I didn't listen to him. The last guy? What do you mean? Uh, Nothing. Forget it. You know, with you and your wife, it seems, everything turns out to be nothing and forget it. I don't think it matters now. I have an idea. It's already too late for you. I'm sorry. Good night, Mr. Peterson. Hey, Fred. Fred. Yeah, Lieutenant, I'm coming. Well? Well, what? There's nothing there for us boys in blue. What's in it for the fourth estate? Looks like he's trying to drive her nuts. It could also be the other way around. I don't think so. Because of that honey-colored blonde oh, hair? Lieutenant, Lieutenant, you always know where the exposed nerve is. Just stop and figure it. Couldn't this also be her way of trying to drive him nuts? As a reporter, I would have to say yes. But, uh, as a man? I don't know. Well, you got a problem, Fred. How are you going to tackle it? As a reporter? Or as a man? <laughs> Morning. Oh, Fred, what are you doing here? Won't you ask me to come in? Well, I... You could also offer me a cup of coffee. It's been a long drive on a cold morning. Oh, well, I suppose you might as well come inside. How gracious. I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, well, I'm, I'm still upset and you should know why. Come into the kitchen. I was just pouring myself a cup. Thanks. Charming place you have here. Thank you. 
I suppose Tom is generous enough when it comes to money and things. The implication being that he is not generous when it comes to what? Fred, if you insist on talking about Tom, I'll have to ask you to leave. Okay, let's talk about you. No. We can't talk about me either. What can we talk about? The weather, politics, sports. You'd be surprised I'm a very well-informed person. We could talk about art. Or literature? I didn't come here to talk about those things. I know why you came here. Do you? Fred, I'm a married woman. But you're not a happily married woman. I'm happy enough. Okay. Let me tell you why I'm here. As a reporter, that is. It doesn't happen very often that you get a chance to be in on a story before it's a story. You follow me? No. Last night, all I could have gotten out of it might have been a squib on the back page. Or maybe nothing. But something's happening here. Something's building. I don't know what it is. But one of you is lying. One of you is trying to destroy the other. And you think you can stop it? Oh, no, that's not my job. But there's going to be an explosion. And I want to be there when it blows. Because then I'll have a story. And that's all this is. That's all I am to you. A story. I was talking as a reporter... But as a man... Yes? As a man, I'd... I'd like to help you, Hetty. Even if it meant losing your story? Yes. I'd like to believe that. Why can't you? I tried to warn you, Fred. Look, we had all that last night. I can't warn you anymore, but remember, I did warn you. Yeah, sure. Don't brush it aside, Fred. Hetty, on the general subject of warnings... I've had a few in my day. From gangsters, from politicians. I mean from people who had clout. But I did warn you. Look, if you want me to, I'll sign a receipt. Let the record show that you warned me. You were right. He is trying to destroy me. Ah, finally. Why? I don't know. Okay, let's go through the standards. Is he after your money? I don't have any. Another woman? I don't think so. Is he tired of you? I don't know. Well... None of this is very helpful. I'm sorry. What was this business you were giving me back in the station house about your perfect marriage, about your perfect husband? Because he is. It's just... Well, now and then he he imagines things like last night. What's now and then? Oh, every few months. One time he stranded me up in Maine. Another time we were supposed to go to Europe. He told me he would be delayed and to get on the plane he would make the next one. And there I was, all by myself in Paris. He denied everything. Has he seen a doctor? Yes. And? It hasn't done any good. Is he overworked? Oh, yes. Well, maybe he needs a long vacation. I'm sure of it. It all sounds pretty simple to me, except for one little item. Why have you insisted on warning me? Because it was the right thing to do. I don't understand. First, you imply that everything is so simple. Then when I start to believe it, you drop a little suggestion that throws me off balance. I I can't seem to get anything definite out of you. Oh, but you did. What was that? A warning. Lieutenant Carroll. Hey, Lieutenant. Yeah, how goes the Parson case? How did you know I was going to ask you about the Parson? That honey blonde hair. Does it really show that much? Pal, you are hooked. You know something? That's true. And she may even be playing me like a fish. So what can I do for you? Well, no crime has been committed yet, but you can bet there's one on the way. Well, till then, we're handcuffed around here. Sure, but you got all the facts. What facts? I mean... I mean, you can get at them in a routine way. Work up both of them, some past histories. That's spending the taxpayer's money. You spend the taxpayer's money every day. Something's ready to blow up there. Just be ready for it. That's all I'm asking. Actually, Fred, if you want the truth, we've already started. And? Keep in touch. Yeah? They said you're in this office. Well, look who's here. Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. Come on in, sir. Mr. Peterson, I've decided to tell you everything. Because... Because I know you're in love with my wife. Wait a minute. Now, there are all kinds of meaningless expressions. Wait a minute, see here, hold on, or if you... Let's dispense with them. You can't accuse me. I don't accuse you. 
I state a fact. Well, let, let's be fair. I only met your wife last night. I, I admit she's attractive. Uh, I don't even know her. <laughs> That's what I told him. That's what you told who? And the last guy. The last guy she was married to. <sighs> I wish I knew how to start this. Well, start at the beginning. Okay. I'm an accountant. You're a reporter. Both of us are men of the world. I, I mean this world. You live on facts. I live on figures. So how can I tell you? How can I expect you to believe me when I say that Hetty isn't a human being at all? She isn't? No. She's a witch. <laughs> Yes, that's what he said. A witch. But how can it be? Wasn't all that witch business over and done with more than 200 years ago? Well, that's what we intend to find out shortly when I return with Act Three. Tom Parsons and Fred Peterson sit in a newspaper office. Both are young, alert, stylishly dressed, every bit the modern, sophisticated men of today. And yet, the subject, the very serious subject under discussion is witchcraft, of all things. Well, it isn't every day a man accuses his wife of being a witch. It isn't every day a man finds out he's married to one. I can only say it's incredible. I know. That's what I said when he told me. When who told you? The last guy. Tell me about the last guy. I met Hetty on a cruise ship about five years ago. She said her husband had just somehow disappeared. She was distraught. <laughs> you know, she does the distraught bit to perfection. I know nothing of the kind. What happened? Had he, had he fallen overboard? Well, that's... That's what she made everybody think. Till we got a radiogram from shore. He claimed he knew nothing about the trip. Well, either he had boarded the boat or he hadn't. Okay, let's get all of that cleared away. There was a ticket in his name. There were some people who claimed they had seen him. The trouble is, there was a pretty drunk bond voyage party. Most everyone was in no shape to remember anything. Oh, yes, yes, the steward did claim to have seen him aboard, but... But? I'm convinced the steward was bribed. So I bought her story. I fell in love with her. Just as you did. And I helped her kill him. Just as you're going to help her kill me. You know what I think? I know what you think. You think I'm a nut. You could look it up. Five years ago, Stacy's Mountainville Lodge in the Adirondacks. She called me. She was desperate. Come up here. He's going to kill me. I flew up. I found him. They were near a cliff. She was screaming for help. I started fighting him off. I I guess he slipped. He, he fell over the side. He was killed. Look it up. Coroner's office. You'll see. An accident. Let's assume I buy all this. How does it make her a witch? Oh. She told me. She'll tell you afterwards. She's a witch. She falls in love with men, gets tired of them, and destroys them. I think you must I know. be... I know. I'm here to warn you. But I'm going to kill her first. Let me get you a cup of coffee. You're a fool. I'm here to save your life. Sure, sure. Okay. Look her up. I mean that. See if you can find a trace of her. See if you can find out where or when she was born, who her parents were. She has absolutely no background. I tell yeah, you... Don't, 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 don't oh, get excited. Lord, this is all so familiar. All of this is what he said to me. And what I said to him. Back there, before I killed him. Now, nobody's going to kill anybody. I don't know you. But you look like a nice guy. Take my advice. Save yourself. Save yourself. Uh, 
I'm not sure I should be here with you tonight, Fred. Well, you wouldn't let me visit you at all. Oh, it just wouldn't look right. Yeah, but it's all on the level. I'm a newspaper man. It's business. I'm doing a story. I had a very proper upbringing. Where were you raised, Hetty? I'd rather not talk about it. Why? Well, I told you it was proper, but it wasn't happy. I shouldn't say this, but there were times when I thought my parents were ogres. <coughs> Fred, is something wrong? No, 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 no. See, I, I just hope I, I, I didn't spill anything on you. No. I didn't have a happy childhood. I, I don't like to discuss it. Here's something we should discuss. I spoke with Tom this morning. I think I know what he told you. So far out, I even hesitate to mention it, but obviously he believes it. I insisted that he see a psychiatrist. In fact, we both went. And it's the doctor's opinion that Tom is riddled with guilt. You see, he thinks he murdered Larry. Larry? My first husband. But Larry was a brute. I was very young and... We're really too young to know anything about people. Larry was a drunk. I didn't know that either. And when he had a few, he would abuse me. Well, I shouldn't have done it, but I was terrified. I called Tom, and he came up and got into a fight with Larry, and... Well, there was that accident. But why should he get that far-out notion about you? According to the doctor, it had to be something... Well, something he could live with, something that could justify what he did, and he really has a vivid imagination. Strikes me as a very sober-minded person, aside He was from... a lit major at college. He became an accountant because he had to make a living. I... I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Fred. I've had so much trouble in my life, and... He's really a wonderful guy, and I love him. Why does he want to destroy us? Why should he have a guilty conscience about Larry? Whatever happened was in self-defense. Well, look, everything will turn out all right. Oh, you're only saying that because you have to say something. No, I believe it. Hello? Tom? Yes, it's Tom. But you said you were working late. Well, I am. I just took a break for dinner. Join you? Please. Fred, you obviously didn't hear a word I said this morning, did you? I heard every word. Heard them all and listened to none? Tom, you're not well, and I think we Oh, I be... know what you think. You think we should go away for a rest and all that. Forget it. I know what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> Poor Fred. I feel sorry for you. You're in love with her. To keep the record straight, I'm a reporter. There's a story here. I aim to get it. Sure, sure. That's what you tell yourself. Let's go along with you, Tom. Suppose what you say is true. Suppose she's what you say she is. Why not walk out? Get a divorce. I can't. Why? I hope you never find out. You see, she destroys you. She takes away your capacity to love. Your feelings, your mind. It's as if you're only just nourishment for her. And when everything you have to give is gone, she discards you for someone else. Tom, for your own sake, I think you should be under a doctor's care in a hospital. I suppose I should. But I want to save you. It'll make up for Larry. I must apologize, Fred, for exposing you to all this. I shouldn't have come here. But you wanted to expose him to all this. That's why you came here. You knew I always eat here when I work late. Tom, I'll do anything you want. Just tell me. <laughs> Disappear. As a supernatural person, you can arrange that without any problem. Please, Fred, go now. Leave us alone. But I don't want to... He's my problem. I have to live with it. And if you stay, well... An audience always excites him. Ah, now, look who finally showed up. What happened to that Nobel Prize for Journalism you were working on? Tenet, there is no Nobel Prize for Journalism. Oh. Well, what happened anyhow? I got off it all. Couldn't make heads or tails. Well, we're still on it. As a matter of fact, information keeps pouring in all the time. On her? On him. Funny duck. He was always interested in spirits, that kind of thing. He wrote his master's thesis on something called uh, 
demonology. Well, there's nothing there for me. As a man or a reporter? Both. You know, I've been married ten years, and I've never been tempted. But if I could be, she could do it. Oh, that dame or something. I'm surprised at you, Lieutenant. But there's hope for you. If what you say about the husband is true, he winds up uh, in the loony bin, and after a respectable interval, she could be yours. That's what's in your mind, right? You are the most cynical person I know. Come off it. We're two of a kind. I'd even wait for her myself. Lieutenant Carroll. Is uh, Fred Peterson there, please? Hold on, I'll see. It's uh, the girl you love. Cut it out. Okay, the girl we love. You hear? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm here. Take it. Hello? Fred, I'm scared. What's the matter, Hetty? Don't ask any questions. Just come to my place. Quickly. Come in, Fred. Oh, darling, I'm so glad you're here. Hetty, Hetty, why are you shaking like that? I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Please, please, Hetty, calm down. I'm here. Everything is going to be all right. I know it. I know. It's wrong for me to talk to you like this. To feel like this. But I, I can't help no, it. No, no, we'll work it out. Somehow we'll work it out. No, no, no. Why are you scared? I. He asked me to take his suit to the cleaners this morning. And I found this in his pocket. It's a receipt. Read it. From Carrington's one double action Danforth Wilson revolver, caliber thirty two. He bought a gun. Don't you see? He bought a gun. All right. Why would he buy a gun if he didn't want to kill me? Well, I think we have enough to interest the police now. Are you sure about that? Stop. Well, answer the question, Fred. What do you expect from the police? I have a permit for this gun. I have every right to own it. Now look, Tom, I get very nervous when people point guns at me. Maybe it's unreasonable, but do you, uh, do you mind putting that, that thing away? Well, I will. After I use it. No, Tom. Don't be a fool. You're not a killer. I always thought that. Till just now. Tom, listen. Let's say you're right. That she is a witch, okay? Don't you see? You couldn't kill her anyhow. You'd empty the gun at her. It wouldn't mean a thing. Fine. Why don't we find out? I won't no. let you. Get away from me, Fred. No. Come on, step up. Right. 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 Get me that gun. gun. If you move, I'll kill you. Come on. Just lower it. Drop it. Take a step. I'm going to kill her. No, drop it. Drop it. Oh. 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 Tom. You did it. Again, Eddie. It did it. Again. Call a doctor, Eddie. Oh. Oh. What for? Oh, you poor sucker. You think she... Oh, she's not worth it. Oh. You think she's paradise? She is. Ah, oh, she is. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. And then she'll kill you. She'll kill you, too. Tom. He's... He's dead. Tom. You saw, you saw there was nothing I, I could do. I know. I know. Better call the police. <laughs> Lieutenant Carroll. Lieutenant, it's Fred. Hey, Fred, I got news for you. What I mean is I have absolutely no news for you. Lieutenant, listen to me. You know, we, we drew a complete blank on that dame. We trace her back to St. Louis City Hall, where she married a guy named Larry Bellows. She gave her home address as Charterville, Illinois. But there's no such place. Listen, Lieutenant. It's as if this dame just materialized out of thin air. No background at all. Wait a minute. Hetty. Who are you? Hello? Oh, Fred? Fred, why did you call? Who are you, Hetty? Fred, what's on your mind? Hetty. I warned you three times, Fred. I warned you three times. And 
And how many warnings would you have needed? Or heeded? That's the trouble. When they have honey blonde hair, it's so hard to take them seriously. A mistake. You should always take every woman seriously. We'll be back shortly. Are there really witches? Everyone must keep his own counsel on the matter. However, if you should happen upon a damsel in distress, and she has honey blonde hair and baby blue eyes, remember, we warned you three times. Our cast included Joan Loring, Mason Adams, Tom Keena, Alan Manson, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the sounds in the universe, perhaps nothing stirs the imagination more deeply than the sounds of the sea. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Of all the sounds in the universe, Perhaps nothing stirs the imagination more deeply than the sounds of the sea. People who have never crossed an ocean can still be transported in a walk along the beach, skirting the lapping tides, or standing high on the rocks with the waves crashing below. There's an eerie quality about the sea, and it conjures strange visions in any mind that is ready to receive them. Our story concerns the spell cast by the sea. Our mystery drama, What Happened to Mrs. Forbush, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Patricia Wheel and Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Excuse me, madam. Oh, I'm in an awful hurry. I, I just wonder if you could answer a simple question so for me. So do I. The question is this. What? what happens this time of year? Oh, huh? that's easy. The kids get home from camp. Goodbye. Nope. What do you mean, nope? No. Nope. I mean, I should know when my kids get home from camp. Well, the answer I had in mind was a tad more general in scope. Well, see. I gave my answer. Let's hear yours. You know, I'm glad you asked. Are you? You see, what happens this time of year is that Buick dealers are giving particularly great deals on all their 74 Buicks. For a family woman such as yourself, I think a neat little Apollo would be just the ticket. It's small, economical, but surprisingly roomy. And it's a Buick, so it's really quite elegant. You don't say. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that good news? Yes. I mean, that you can get such a nifty deal on such a nifty small car. To be car. sure it is, yes. To be sure. By the way, uh, where do your kids go to camp? Guam. It's a G small island in the South Pacific. Guam. Guam. <laughs>
Suburban Savings in northern New Jersey would like to set you straight on savings. Straight off, Suburban offers you the highest interest allowed by law. A big 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban 7.50% savings certificates. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum $2,500. Federal regulations allow premature withdrawals on savings certificates, provided prescribed federal penalties are adhered to. Of course, Suburban also has a whole selection of other savings plans that keep your savings headed in the right direction, straight up. Why not head straight over to your nearest Suburban Savings Office, conveniently located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne, and let them set you straight on savings. This story takes place at Captain's Cove on the shores of New England. Bert and Marjorie Desmond are inspecting a picturesque old house on a bluff overlooking the sea. They're city people, and in the past they have spent their vacations at mountain resorts or in dry desert places considered beneficial for the health of their son. But this year it's different, and they're getting more intrigued by the minute as Mr. Smith, the rental agent, shows them around. Bert, the view and the window seat. I haven't seen one like this since my grandmother's house when I was a child. <laughs> I'm more interested in all these carved pieces over here. What do you call this stuff? Uh, scrimshaw. Oh, yes. The thing sailors made when they had time on their hands. Mm, old Captain had quite a collection. Most of it's over to the museum. What can you tell me about this ship model? A schooner, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that'd be Captain Forbes' ship, Desdemona. Sank. With all hands aboard. Oh, uh, Mr. Smith, is that an island I see way out there? Nope. That's Dead Man's Rock. Oh, what a gruesome name. Was it the scene of a shipwreck? Well, I understand some fella got murdered on that rock. I don't rightly know the circumstances. Uh, but there is an island further on out, known as Hiram's Hideaway. It's said to be the place old Captain Forbush took himself off to when he wanted to get away from his wife. Good fishing. I'll have to look into that. Oh, Bert, are you sure we really want to take this house? Let's see the rest of it. There's a fine old staircase. <laughs> Beautiful railing. I don't think it's been dusted in years. This house has been closed up most of the time. That's why it's such a bargain. Is there anything wrong with it? Nope. Tight as a drum. And a real historic monument. Now, you take this roof. Oh, it's wonderful. I've never slept in a four-poster bed. Oh, boy. It's a big one, too. And uh, this door leads to a veranda. Oh, my. This porch goes all the way around the house. It always does in a captain's place of residence. A trademark, you might say. Why, well, sure. This is what you call a widow's walk. Yeah. Uh, no doubt Miss Forbush did her share of pacing when the captain was away. Well, no pacing for me, thank you. My husband has a desk job. What do you think, Bert? About the house? Y yes. In a strange way, I've fallen in love with it. But I'm wondering... Wonder no more. We're going right into that room I already call my study and sign a lease for the summer. Bert. Glad you've come to life. You haven't said a word since we left the cove. I thought you were asleep. No. I've been thinking. And worrying. Worrying? About Robbie. Robbie? <laughs> I can hardly wait to get his reaction when he sees where he's going to spend the summer. Bert, maybe we've made a mistake. Oh, you're kidding. N no. That long, deserted beach and those rocks, it's a dangerous place for a boy. You'll have a ball. But it, it, it's not like any place we've ever stayed before. Have you forgotten how much of Robbie's life he's had to spend in bed? I haven't forgotten. But that's all over. The doctor said so. He said it was time Robbie started doing the things boys his age like to do. Not dangerous things. Bert, we're going to spend three months by the ocean. You bet we are. And the sea air will be good for all of us. Only, Bert, Robbie's never learned to swim. <laughs> What do you think of it? Oh, man. This house is twice as good as you thought it was. I didn't remember it was so musty. The place needs airing. I'm going to open some windows. Dad, who's the old guy in the picture? Why, uh, 
That must be Hiram Forbush, the sea captain who built this house. He sure has a lot of red whiskers. <laughs> he sure does. <laughs> you know, they knew how to paint pictures back in those days. Watch this, Rob. Walk over here yeah. and see how his eyes follow you. Sort of as though he was looking at everything you did. It's spooky. You think he's a ghost? Oh, come on, son. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? No. Well, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. I think your mother does. Mom believes in ghosts. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, Pop. <laughs> What's all this about ghosts? I'm teaching Rob to be the man of the house so he can look after you when I'm gone. Hey, I want to go to the beach. Well, you can if your father goes with you. And not right now. I have some things to do. I- I'd go, only <laughs> it's time to think about getting dinner ready. But I can go alone. Sure you can. Oh, no, Bert. Not the first time. First time for everything. Oh. And speaking of first times, how about that? <laughs> it's so strange to hear a telephone in a house like this. Glad there have been some improvements since the captain's day. Guess I better find out who it is. Pop said I could go to the beach. Now, Robbie, I want you to be very, very careful. Follow that little path and watch your step climbing down the bluff. Mom, I'm not a baby. And don't stay away too long. Do you have your jacket? Oh, Mom. I'll be watching you from this window. Damn, damn, damn. Why, what's the matter? That phone call from the office. Wouldn't you know they're having a crisis and they want me back? Oh, no, Bert. We just got here. You're on your vacation. Won't be gone long. Just for the day to help get things straightened out. <laughs> but it's a four-hour trip. I know. I'll have to start very early tomorrow morning. And I guess I'd better spend tomorrow night in the city. But you promised that first thing tomorrow you'd see about swimming lessons for Robbie. It was a part of our bargain. I know, honey, but it's just a matter of putting it off for a day. Oh, you said I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone... Each club and make arrangements for swimming lessons. And we'll meet some people so that you'll know the neighbors, and Robbie will have someone to play with. Robbie, dear, what were you doing on those big rocks today? Just throwing stones in the water. Mom, I can make them skip real good. I thought I'd asked you not to climb on those rocks unless someone was with you. I only climbed a little way. Well, no more climbing, young man, until your father gets back. But he's been gone for three whole days. Well, he's coming tomorrow. And we're going to let him know how well we've been getting along. Go to sleep now. I'm going out on the porch to watch the moon come up. Mommy, you promised to open the window very wide so I can hear the sound of the water? Yes, dear. (sighs) The weather's changing. I can scarcely see the beam of the lighthouse. It's getting all misty. And don't be frightened if you hear the foghorn. Uh, I like that sound. Night. Good night, dear. Good evening. Is someone there? I always stroll the veranda on a foggy evening. Well, there is someone. Who are you? I am Lavinia Forbush, and I presume you are the lady who is staying in my house? Why, I guess it was your house. Only I'm staying here now. My name is Marjorie Desmond. Didn't they tell you, Mrs. Desmond, that I never left this house? It belongs to me. Belongs to you, Mrs. Forbush. Now it belongs to a man who lives in Boston. Ah, he thinks he owns it. No one will ever take my place in this house. Come, let's walk this way. Ah, the fog is creeping over Dead Man's Rock. Just the way it was that night. Uh, no, I'm getting rather cold. I think I'll go inside. Poor soul, you need a fine shawl like mine to keep you warm. <laughs> it looks like a lovely old paisley. Won't you come inside where it's warm? We we could have a cup of tea. No, indeed, Mrs. Desmond. I only set foot in my house when it becomes necessary to get something I want. I'll stay right here where I always stay. Keeping my vigil. But the fog is closing in. (sighs) Really, Mrs. Forbush, I must go in. Oh, how thoughtless of me. The damp night air must have chilled you to the bone. Here, let me put my shawl around your shoulders. (sighs) What about you? Oh, I no longer feel the cold as I once did. My, it is grand to have a woman to talk to once more. 
Mrs. Desmond, my captain was a bold and adventurous man. He brought me precious gems from India, from Persia, and from China. Oh, dear Mrs. Desmond, you must not make my mistake. You must take your most cherished possessions and leave my house. Oh, but I have no jewels, Mrs. Forbush. Oh, dear lady, you have the greatest jewel of all, a son. How old is your boy, Mrs. Desmond? <laughs> Robbie's nine and a half. Just the age of my Jason, a most dangerous age. I, I know. I worry about him. And well, you might. What happened to me is history. And history has a way of repeating. Really, I, I, I don't think I want to... You will listen to me. Please. My Jason. Oh, he was a strapping lad who helped me with the chores around the house. And when Hiram's ship was in, the boy spent hours talking to the sailors, learning how to tie knots and carve those intricate things from bone and bits of wood. <laughs> My Robbie would like that. And then one day, when Jason was nine years old, his father came to me and said, I'm taking the boy on a journey. It is time he began to learn the ways of men. Why, Bert said something Too like... Too soon, I said... Too soon. But my Hiram was a very determined man. And when he made up his mind, there was no stopping him. It's only a short journey, he told me. We are taking the Desdemona to the Caribbees. And Jason will go with me. I watched through the spyglass until the ship was far enough at sea to hoist the big sail which caught the wind... You do know what happened, don't you, Mrs. Desmond? Don't tell me any more. I must, if you would save your boy. Late that evening, the fog closed in the way it has now. And then... Then began the long days and the lonely nights. Where is your son, Mrs. Desmond? Why, he's in bed. And I hope fast asleep. You hear that? Foghorn is a lonely sound. It's a lonely sound for women like you and me when we've lost... Stop trying to frighten There's me. There's still plenty of time. For what? To take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. A foghorn is a lonely sound. And a ghost-ridden house by the sea is an unsettling place for a woman who is worried about her son. Perhaps in the light of day, when her husband returns, Marjorie will be able to shake her fears. On the other hand, suppose Mrs. Forbush is really trying to tell her something. We'll find out more shortly when I return with Act Two. There's nothing wrong with drinking Budweiser sip by sip, is there? Well, the brewers of Budweiser think there's a better way. Sipping's fine if you're drinking wine. But Bud is the king of beers. A hearty drink. Look, rinse a 10 or 12 ounce glass with cold water. Then, open a can or bottle of Bud and pour it right down the middle so it kicks up a good head of foam. Now, take a big drink and then swallow big. No sips. That's how it should be done. More taste, more beer drinking enjoyment. Thanks to exclusive Beechwood aging, Budweiser has a smoothness that lets it go down especially easy. Sure, it's an expensive way to brew beer, but brewing beer right does make a difference. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Hey, Mom, what's for dinner? Hey, Mom, what you got? What's for dinner? Your ShopRite supermarket suggests choice beef first cup chuck steaks just 59 cents a pound this week. Save two on smoked ham, shank portion 69 cents a pound, butt portion 79 a pound. For a quick meal, try Swanson's Frozen Hungry Man dinners, just 99 cents each. For dessert, ShopRite's produce department is featuring fresh honeydew melons, 79 cents each. They're great topped with ice cream. There's a lot more for a little less at ShopRite, so stop in soon. She loves the family. She wants the best. 
she does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. If you're afraid of what the future has in store, perhaps you look to the past for guidance. But Marjorie Desmond has had a strange encounter with the past, which only bolsters the fears she already has for her son. Is it possible that a ghostly presence from a former time can prevent or promote an impending disaster? Marjorie's husband has returned from his business trip and we'll soon find out how he feels about what's going on. Bert, it's so good to have you back. Way longer than I expected. But I've only been gone a few days. Same old thing. You should be used to it by now. Mm, But this time it was different. I mean, this place... Well, now, tell me what you and Robbie have been up to. Bert, I want to show you something. Hey, where did you get that Paisley shawl? I like it. So do I. It has such nice, mellow colors. Where did you find it? In the old captain's sea chest? No. It was given to me. Well, that's a nice gift. Who's been around while I was gone? You're not going to believe this. Well, let me guess. It was given to you, only it wasn't really a present. You had to pay some enormous sum for it, and now you're afraid to tell me how much it cost. No, Bert. And I know you won't believe me. I won't believe you if you say Captain Forbush came to the door and said, My dear Mrs. Desmond, please let me in. I've returned from a long and tiresome journey. And it would please me very much if you would cook up some bacon and eggs. Uh, no, Bert. It wasn't Captain Forbush. I'm happy to hear that. It was Mrs. Forbush. What? You're going to laugh. I know you won't understand, and I didn't either. Only, only it happened. For heaven's sake, Marge, what happened? It was a foggy night. You sure? Spooks always come out on foggy nights. Now tell me, where did you really get that shawl? I got it from Mrs. Forbush. Let's not play games. I'm tired. She was there. She was where? On the widow's floor. Oh, cut it out. I talked to her, and she told me what happened to her husband. Sure, sure. Mr. Smith told us that. The captain was lost at sea. But Jason... Who in heck is Jason? Their son. Marge, would you please talk sense... Now, where did you get that shawl? I told you from Mrs. Forbush last night when we had a long talk. Now, I've heard everything. Okay, it's a joke. And I do think it's pretty funny. We're living in a haunted house, so let's enjoy it. If you don't want to tell me where you found that thing, okay. I'll play your game. At least until tomorrow. Don't you want to hear what she had to say? I don't want to hear any more of this crazy story. Come to bed. And tomorrow we'll have a great big laugh over this whole thing. And maybe you remember where you really found that shawl. That was the best picnic we ever had. Can we do it again tomorrow? Well, not every day, Rob. Maybe tomorrow we'll go to the beach club. I thought I might do some fishing. Dad, can I go fishing with you? Maybe we'll all go. How about it, Marge? Uh-uh, count me out. You know how I feel. I know. You like to eat the poor little critters, but it's cruel to catch them on those nasty hooks. Well, it is. Robbie and I may just go off and forget to come Take home. Take your son away from here. Take him away and guard him with your life. Well, honey, what's the matter? You look as if you'd seen a... It's nothing, Bert, nothing. I, I just have to be alone for a minute. Hey, Dad? What are all these things over here on the shelf? That's called scrimshaw, Rob. Scrim? Mm-hmm. These are things that were made by sailors a long time ago. When they were on those sailing ships and the sea was calm, they didn't have much to do. So they carved pieces of bone or wood and painted shells. I bet I could do that. You'd have to learn how to use a knife. Would you teach me, Dad? It's a uh, bedtime, young man, up the stairs. Mm, if I was on a boat, I wouldn't be going up any old stairs. I suppose you'd be climbing the ropes. Or walking in the gang. No, I asked that fisherman today where he slept, and he said down below. <laughs> Unless you want to sleep in the cellar, the direction is up. Get going. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> nice day today, Marge. And I don't know when I've seen Robbie so happy. Oh, he's certainly having a good time. And tomorrow when we go to the beach club, we can make arrangements to have him start taking swimming lessons. I'm not sure they have regular classes. Then we'll get him a private instructor. Marjorie, I am perfectly capable of teaching him myself. I won a medal in college, remember? Well, of 
course you're a good swimmer, Bert. And I thought... Oh, I suppose if Robbie had been well, you would have taught him long ago. But don't you think he'd learn more quickly now if an outside... Hey, there's nothing wrong with his old man, is there, Marge? <sighs> I have to finish up the dishes. Let's talk about it when I'm through. I tried to sail it? Oh, you must never, never try. Oh, my dad won't let me even touch that boat with the sails. But I can play with the other things. You know, the bones and the shells. I know. And I brought you one that was a favorite of my son. He was just about your age. Now, do you have a candle I can light? There is one over there in the bureau... But I could just turn on his light. No need to waste electricity. I never had it in this house. That doesn't look like a match to me. A tinderbox. Best thing in the world for striking a light. There. Now, Robbie, what do you think of this? Wow. What a big shell. This is for you, Robbie. To keep for Jason... While he is away. Where's he gone? I'm hoping you will help me find him. Oh, I'll be glad to help you. Because if he was here, we could climb the rocks together and, and explore that pirate's cave. We'll look for him, Robbie. We'll look for him together. So now, if you will come with me. Oh, oh I, I couldn't go anywhere without asking permission. But this is my house. And I am giving you permission. But I still couldn't go without asking. Quickly, boy. Come on. Put on your clothes. Uh, Mom! Mom! Dad! What is it, Rob? Why, Robbie, what are you doing with a candle burning? You know how dangerous... I didn't light it, Mom. You tell them, Mrs. Fo... Where is she? Where's who? The, that lady, Mrs. Forbush. She was standing right there. Oh, good Lord, not in here. Rob, there's no one else in this room. You've been having a dream. No, Dad. Honest, she was here. Look what she gave me. Not you, too. Say, that's a very interesting shell. So where did you find it? Dad, I didn't find it. Mrs. Forbush said it belonged to her son, and I could borrow it until he comes back. That's a likely story. You can make up a better one than that. But that's exactly what she said. I'm going to help her find him. And when he's here, we can play together down on the beach. No, Robbie, dear, that's not possible. You're both being impossible. But the trouble is, we have to find Jason. Oh, stop right? it, Robbie. I won't hear any more about this, Jason. Rob, you've had a dream. It seems very real. But now it's over. And tomorrow you'll have forgotten all about it. But, Bert, what about the candle and the shell? Well, there must be some reasonable explanation. But let's not think about it now. I'm blowing the candle out. And Robbie's going to sleep. Good night, son. You've been playing a joke on me, and I'll admit it's been a good one. You were very clever to get Robbie to go along with you. And I must say, he played his part well. But I can think of better games for a boy his age. This was no game, Bert. You didn't coach him to put on that act? Of course I didn't. Well... If it was a nightmare and he dreamed all those things about Mrs. Forbush and her mythical son, it was only because you filled his imagination full of stories. I have never mentioned either Mrs. Forbush or Jason to Robbie. Then there's a book about them somewhere around the house. Well, if there is, I haven't seen it. You, you must have had one of those imaginary conversations out loud, the way you do sometimes. And Robbie overheard you when you thought he was asleep. Oh, Bert, I don't do that anymore. And I don't see how he could possibly have been listening the night I talked to Mrs. Forbush. Marge. There is no Mrs. Forbush. How would you know? You weren't here. <sighs> Honey, 
We're taking this whole thing too seriously. Mrs. Forbush lived nearly 200 years ago. So she can't be hanging around here now. I suppose you're right. That's my girl. Give us a smile. Well, I... I'm, I'm trying. Now, repeat after me. No more conversations with Mrs. Forbush. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. <laughs> Where'd you get that kooky first name? Well, she told yeah, me. Okay, okay. No more conversations with Lavinia Forbush. And what will we tell Robbie? <laughs> He's teaching me how to catch fish. Oh, well, it looks as though you bought out the store. But did you get my groceries? Yep, groceries are all right here. But hold off on the steak. We just may come back with something very special for the frying pan. Look, Mom, my very own rod. <laughs> did you ever see one of these? This is a reel. Yes, dear, it looks like a very nice reel. Where will you use it, down at the wharf? Nope. We're going to get Rob off to a really good start. I've rented a boat. What kind of boat? Oh, just a putt-putt. You know, one of those flat bottom jobs with an outboard motor. But you you aren't going out to sea. Sure. Well, look at it, Marge. Smooth as glass. What only what do you know about the well, the tides and the currents? Marge, we aren't planning a trip to China. Where are you going? To that island. It's so clear today, you can see it from here. Don't you worry about a thing. See? I bought him a life jacket. And he's going to wear it every minute of the time. We promise, don't we, Rob? Sure, Pop. Promise me you won't go far? I told you. We're only going out to that island. When Mr. Smith said the fishing is good. What did he say the island's called? Hiram's Hideaway. Oh, yeah. Sorry I asked. Have a good time. If you stand on the porch with the binoculars, you can watch us most of the way. Well, Mrs. Desmond... I'm sorry you did not hear my warning. Oh, no, please, please don't come back. I've not been away. But I don't want to talk to you. It was bad enough that you upset me, but you had no right to bother my son. It was you who interfered, Mrs. Desmond. You and your husband. You spoiled it all. I was trying to save your son before this happened. Nothing has happened, Mrs. Forbush, and I won't let you alarm me anymore. But you are alarmed, Mrs. Desmond, and well, you might be. Why did you let him go? See, they are already out of sight. And if you don't act quickly, you'll never see either your husband or your son again. This time it seems more likely that the predictions of the ghostly Mrs. Forbush may come true. Marjorie is a worrier, but after all, Bert is not a seasoned sailor, and Robbie can't swim. No, they're not setting off for China, but they are tempting fate. And it's too late to turn back now. It is a calm and beautiful day at Captain's Cove, and it looks as though the fears of Marjorie Desmond were totally unfounded. Father and son have explored the island. A whole new world has opened up for a boy who has been housebound much of his life. And Bert is savoring the joys of feeling a new closeness to his son. It is late afternoon, and they are heading back reluctantly to the mainland. Can we do this every day? I'm going to catch a bigger one next time. For a first try, you did very well. Maybe we can go deep sea fishing someday. Maybe tomorrow. Could we? Hey, we're doing all right with these smaller fellows. Flound is good eating. You'll see. I bet Mom will be surprised. We caught one, two, three, four. Hey, Dad, remember what you promised about that rock? Oh, it's late, Rob. I think we better not. But you promised, Dad. Honest, it'll only take a minute. Well, I'm not sure I can get right up to the rock. The water's starting to get a bit choppy. Where was it you saw that piece of driftwood you wanted? Uh, up there. See? Looks just like a couple of deer's horns. Otherwise known as antlers. Only I'm going to turn it into whatever whatever that other word is. Scrim, you know. Hey, stop the boat, Dad. It's right up there. I can't just stop the boat, Rob. There's no place to anchor. I could almost reach it if I stood on the sea. Get down, young man. Uh, oh. Now, what did I tell you? There's a tricky tide around here. He'll come back some other time. Oh, but, Dad, that piece of wood will be gone. Sometimes the waves go all over those rocks. We'll never find a piece like that one. Oh. I'll, I'll try again. It's calmer over on this side. 
Slow down some more, Dad. There's no way to come in. I got flat place on the rock. You slow way down it, and then I'll jump off and get it. Is your life jacket on tight? Uh, sure, Dad. Okay, then. Be very, very careful. I'll idle the motor while you jump off. Grab your piece of driftwood and jump right back. Here I go. Uh-oh. The motor's died. And the boat's drifting. You stay right there, Rob, while I get it started. Yes. Yes. I want to speak to someone at the boathouse down by the pier. Uh, the place where you rent boats to go fishing? H- hello? Hello, this is Mrs. Desmond. My husband and son, are they there? Uh, uh, no. No, they rented a boat from you this morning to go to the island. W- w- well, I expected them back long before this, and I was afraid something might have happened. Well, I, I know it isn't late, but it is beginning to look stormy, and I can't see the island anymore. Uh, could you send someone out to look for them? The Coast Guard patrol? How do I reach them? Uh, no, 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 thank you. I'll go to their station down on the beach. No use going to the Coast Guard station, Mrs. Desmond. They've taken the cutter and gone in the other direction. But, but... Bert and Rob, I'm afraid they're in trouble. They are in trouble, Mrs. Desmond. Out by Dead Man's Rock. Then we must send someone after them. No one to send, unless we do it ourselves. Uh, How can we? I've done it before, and if the two of us pull together... What are you talking about? Row boat over there. Can you handle an oar? Well, once I knew how to row, I'm not sure that I... Hurry, Mrs. Desmond. Before the storm sets in, I'm aboard. Oh... Oh, well, an old, old boat why it's half full of water. No time to be choosy. You fit this oar in the lock while I shove off with the other one. There, there's a hole in the bottom of this boat, Mrs. Corbush. This is madness. We'll never make it. Pull, oh, Mrs. Desmond. Pull. Oh. The sea is getting rough. Aye, a storm is brewing. We, we, we must turn back. Too late, Mrs. Desmond. Too late. We must fulfill our mission. That rock seems further and further away. Oh, Mrs. Desmond. Oh, oh. It's no use, Mrs. Forbes. We, we're going to sing. Stay away from that warning bell. The boat is sinking, Mrs. Forbush. It's going straight to the bottom. We'll have to swim for it. Swim for the boy. Save yourself, Mrs. Denson. I don't know how to swim. I've got hold of it. Mrs. Forbush. Mrs. Forbush. Help. Help. Dad, I want to get back in the boat. Stay right there, Rob, until I can get closer. I can't seem to get this darn motor started. Hello! Who... Who are you? Hiram Forbush, at your service. Captain Forbush? Aye, aye. Aye, in difficulty. You can't seem to get this stupid motor started. Give me wind and sails any time. But they're not going to help me now. My son and I... Is your boy over yonder? Yes, I should never have let him off on the rock. Dead man's rock's a dangerous place to be. But one of my men will get him. I'll be very grateful for anything you can do. We have to get home. Uh, Couldn't you put us ashore in a a rowboat? Can't spare the men to take down a longboat. And my only rowboat was most rotted away. So I left it back on the beach. There must be some way. I'll pay you very well. All the money I want is out where we're going. And we can't stay around here any longer. So climb aboard and... No, no. I'll take my boy back in this boat and someone else will come along. or They'll send the Coast Guard to look for us. You won't last long in that thing. There's a storm coming up. Then then please, send up some kind of a signal, a a flare, a a rocket or... Shoot off a cannon and rouse the whole town. No need for that. 
We're not in any trouble. But we are. My son and I. You know how it is. I believe you have a son. I always wanted a son. Fine boy, this one. Just the right age for a first trip before the mast. Well, I'm giving you your last chance. Captain Forbush, let's be sensible. I have obligations to meet. Sounds to me as though you have a guilty conscience. Lively with the sheets, men. She's coming about. Up with the sails and dead ahead. Side, Rob, and and jump! Daddy, I'm jump, Rob! Jump! That's it, Rob! Hey, dog paddle! The jacket will hold you up. Here, here, here son! Grab my fishing pole. Uh, I, I got it. Good boy. Hang on. That's it. Now get hold of the side of the boat. Yeah. Ah, uh, Dad, I lost my stick. Oh, forget it. Easy now. I've got you. Are you all right? I'm okay, Dad. Boy, boy. Can you see what I was doing? I was swimming. Well, not quite. Here, Rob. Here's some of these rags to dry off. I'm going to try this, this motor one more time. Be all right. Hey, Dad. Think sometime we could get a sailboat? <laughs> I'd rather not think about this just now, Robbie. We've had a close call. Well, then maybe we could sail. Robbie, no more. Well, I. Dad? Dad, I hear someone calling. Well, that's not better our imagination. Hello. Hello. Over there, Dad. I got things standing up in the water. Hello. Good Lord. There's someone clinging to the buoy. Marge, are you warm enough? Mm. Never felt better. And now, Marge, if you feel up to it, will you please tell us what in the name of heaven you were trying to do? Uh, we... That is, I started out in a rowboat. That rickety old rowboat that was down on the beach? Oh, yes. Yes. Did you know it was there? I hadn't seen it before. That boat must have been 100 years old. Why did you... I can't explain what was going on in my mind. Or at least you wouldn't understand. You see, I had this awful premonition that something terrible was going to happen to both of you and that I must row out as far as that rock to save you. Well, the boat sank and mercifully there was that buoy and then you came along. Please don't ask me any more questions because now that you're both safe, all those crazy notions I had are gone forever. But something did happen, didn't it, Bert? Something happened all right. We were starting back when the motor conked out. And uh, you, you won't believe this, Marge, but suddenly everything was deathly still. And out of nowhere came this big old ship, like the one in the model over there. That's right, isn't it, Rob? Oh, Dad. And over the rail leaned that face with the cold blue eyes and the bristling red beard. None other than Captain Hiram Forbush. Oh, you're being mean, Bert, but I guess I deserve this. Go on. You don't believe me, do you, Marge? <laughs> but I tell you, there he was, big as life. I begged him to take us back to shore, but he said he was heading for the Caribbees. He had Robbie up on the deck while I was trying to start the motor. And then... And then that sailing ship started to take off. And I looked up, and that's when I yelled to Bobby to jump. Hey, Dad, that's the best story I ever heard. Now can I tell Mom what really happened? What really happened? You see, Mom, it was like this. I saw this piece of wood like, like antlers on that big rock. And I wanted to make something out of it. You know, some of that scrim stuff. And I begged Dad to let me get it. So he slowed down the boat and I jumped off. Oh, that was dangerous, Rob. Well, it would have been all right, except the motor conked out and the boat was drifting away. So I had to jump in the water or I'd still be on that rock. And, oh, Mom, I was scared. But, but I almost swam. <laughs> A swimming lesson for you tomorrow, Robbie. I promise. Mom, hmm? you tell me something, please? Yes, dear. What happened to Mrs. Forbush? Robbie, why do you ask a question like that? I've been worried about her. She... 
She drowned, didn't she? Yes, Robbie. She drowned. But that was a long, long time ago. What happened to Mrs. Forbush was not as important as what happened to the Desmonds. A possessive mother learned she must loosen the bonds with which she held her only child or live in an ever-present nightmare of fear. And a self-centered father discovered that if he neglected his wife and son, he ran the risk of losing them. Such lessons are learned and sometimes forgotten in strange and frightening ways. The ghost of Mrs. Forbush has been laid to rest. But the captain, since no trace of his ship was ever found, you may see the Desdemona sometime off in the mists on a foggy day. The sights and sounds of the restless ocean stir something deep within the soul. There are countless tales to be told of the sea. We'll look for some to bring them along with other probings into those things which touch the dark and mysterious recesses of the human mind. Our cast included Patricia Wheel, Gordon Gould, Billy Lou Watt, Mary Jane Higby, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to another world. A world of suspense. A world of the unexpected. And a world where fantasy and reality may often wear the same face. We are told the truth shall make you free. However, in certain situations, the truth can send you to jail. And so it's all a matter of what freedom really means, not to mention what truth really means. For Eleanor Hartley, this is no philosophical, theological, or intellectual exercise. It has become suddenly a tangible and terrible fact of life. Our mystery drama, A Tiny Drop of Poison, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You don't see many people putting salt in their beer nowadays. Not that there's anything wrong with salt on radishes or french fries, but man, not in the king of beers. Truth is, the only thing salt can do for Budweiser is make it salty. An unwise thing to do to the only beer in America that's beechwood aged. Unsalted Budweiser has become the most popular beer in the world. And that's because in brewing Bud, the Budweiser brewmaster goes all the way for a taste, a smoothness, a drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. And something else you can take without a grain of salt. The fact that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Dreaming about becoming richer? Why not wake up richer every day? At Suburban Savings in North Jersey, getting richer is an everyday reality. 
because Suburban has put into effect higher effective returns. Suburban's limited issue 7.50% savings certificate has an annual effective yield of 7.90%. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years with a minimum investment of $2,500. You'll sleep a lot more soundly knowing your savings are earning more money at Suburban Savings. So sleep on Suburban's high effective return tonight and come into any of Suburban's convenient offices tomorrow in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. Early withdrawal prior to maturity is, according to regulations, subject to a substantial penalty. There's simply no way of knowing. So often, a fateful day will begin quietly, prosaically, with absolutely no hint that the steady pace of the commonplace is destined to quicken or falter. With no intimation that today, a die will irrevocably be cast, and henceforward, our lives will change forever. Or, even cease to exist. A day like this has dawned for Eleanor Hartley. But she doesn't know it yet. Eleanor Hartley, at 32, she has it all. Looks, brains, personality, and a mission in life that seems certain of fulfillment. And on this day, this particular day, Eleanor Hartley is in a recording studio making a very important statement. The principal issue, the primary issue, the overriding, indeed the only issue, is morality. Do you or do you not? Can you or can you not trust your elected representatives? Okay, Eleanor, thanks. We got it. But I haven't finished. That's all we need. Tom, I intend to run my own campaign. Absolutely. Maury, don't edit any of this stuff now. Grab a portable rig and come on with us. We're going to the Madison Beach Club. Just a minute. I have no intention of going to the... You know, we didn't even drink our coffee. Why don't we just relax for a couple of minutes? Mr. Caldwell... I think it's time we reached an understanding. I thought we understood each other all along. You want some sugar? I agreed to run for Congress because a group of concerned citizens asked me. Well, they did. And I thought it would be that simple. Why do I have to go to the Madison Beach Club? You want to talk to people? That's where thousands of them are. Also, you look great in a bikini. I think that's dishonest. Why? It's your very own body. Is it your fault that it's more attractive than your opponent's, who happens to be a bald, paunchy old party hack? Oh... Why can't politics be simple? Hmm. You know, it's been such a morning. I didn't even get a chance to see the papers. Oh, look, right here. Right here on page one. This is what the game is all about. What? Look, we got some more results from the surveys. You have gone up seven points in the last week. That's not very much. Are you kidding? An unknown running against Big Jim Parkhurst, an entrenched incumbent? The way you're gathering momentum, we are in. Look, Eleanor... Uh, I have to know something. What? Big Jim is going to take you seriously from now on. I should hope so. Things may get rough. I'm not afraid. <laughs> you don't know what rough is. You don't know how Parkhurst's people will probe and pry and, and dig. So, if there's anything in your past, anything at all... What are you trying to say? By now, Parkhurst has unleashed the hounds... They'll examine your life from the day you were born. I have nothing to hide. Good. That is... Yeah? No. No one would ever come up with anything to, uh, to embarrass me. The year you were 22? What about that year? Eleanor, we can't account for it. What are you talking about? Well, we've checked you through school, we've checked you through college. You mean, you've actually investigated me? Of course. When you were 23, you married Ted, and the past five years have been an open book. But that whole year, while you were 22... Yes, well, like so many kids who get out of college, I was at loose ends. Didn't know what I wanted. So, I just took off. I traveled around the country. I was just trying to find myself. And I did. And that's all there was to it. Okay. Come on, finish your coffee and we're off. Hey, what? look at that. Oh, no, no, it's just nothing. It's just an article here. Which article? Oh, it's got nothing to do with politics. I 
<laughs> I just happen to know this guy. Who? Oh, some guy. He was killed about five years ago. Murdered one night. Nobody knew why or by whom. Well, this sure throws a new light on the case. Turns out he was a foreign agent. Who'd ever thought that Paul Grover could turn out to be a foreign What did you say his name was? A Grover, Paul Grover. Why did you know him? Uh, uh, Grover. Uh, no, I never knew anyone. Go there. figure some people. Um, Tom? Something the matter? Uh, I didn't feel good. Got a headache. Maybe I better go home. I'll rest for a while. Eleanor, what's the matter? Um, I told you, I have a headache. Okay. It's a woman's privilege. Hi there, Congresswoman. Hi there, Detective. Get any votes today? A few. You catch any crooks? No. I'm on a whole new thing. Sherlock Ted Hartley, that's me. <laughs> I draw all the weird ones. Uh, this was a guy named Paul Grover. Grover? <laughs> you like this. He was murdered five years ago, buried and forgotten. Now it's suddenly wide open again. You know why? Tom showed it to me in the morning paper. He was a spy. Which means we have to find out who killed him. Isn't it, uh, wasn't it always important to find out? Well, now more than ever. The information we have now is that he was ready to come over to our side and spill what he knew. But, uh, isn't this out of your, uh... The Federals asked us to cooperate. So the old man called me in and said, Ted, go get him. Oh. I'm a victim of my own reputation. So now I have to lone wolf around and try to sniff out a case that's five years old. Ah, let's eat in tonight. Um, okay. It's a rare night. I have you all to myself. Maybe, uh... Maybe I should never have gone into politics. What are you talking about? Here you are, a cop's wife. You're more than just a cop. And you're more than just a wife. It's one of those crazy things. You're going to go to Congress. I have to be elected first. Oh, baby, you're home free. <laughs> My career took off the day I married you. Oh, come on, Ted. No, I was always a good detective, but in the last five years, you'd be surprised how many ideas I got from you. You really taught me how to think. What do the police know about the murder? Well, just about zero. They figured Grover stopped for a hitchhiker because when he left his office to drive home, he was alone. They found his car at the side of the road, and he was about 30 feet away, stabbed to death. Funny guy. Lived all alone, no friends, just people who knew him casually. I... Well, after all this time, how can you expect to find the killer? Oh, I'll find the killer. Whoever he is. <laughs> At least that's what I keep telling myself. I looked at Ted. If he's determined to get the killer of Paul Grover, eventually he will. And I don't know what to do. Should I tell him now? Suppose I did. What would he do about it? But why? Why should I tell him? He can never find out. For all his skill, experience, instinct, he could never find out. No one could find out. It all happened five years ago. When I was someone else, drifting about in another world. How could anyone ever link me to Paul Grover? There were no clues. No one ever saw us together. No one saw it happen. Thanks for picking me up, mister. Um... Grover. Paul Grover. Uh, what are you doing out all alone this time of night? Oh, I... I just feel like walking, moving. You, uh... One of them hippies? What's in the name? Uh, talking about names. What's yours? Eleanor. Eleanor what? What does it matter? Okay. How'd you like some supper? <laughs> that would be, uh... Welcome. I know a nice little place just off the state highway here. You're very kind, Mr. Grover. Very kind. Ah, why are we stopping? 
Oh, well, I figured uh, before supper we, uh... We what? Well, let me put it this way. You want your supper, you got to sing for it. Take your arm away. Hey, now, listen. Don't you touch me. Who are you kidding? I know your kind. <laughs> hey, you come back here. Let go of me. Let go. What are you fighting me for? girl like you, you don't care, and I'm even willing to pay. Help! Scream Help! all. Scream all you want. Who's going to hear you? Ah. Okay. You ask for this. No. No, please, put that knife away. You'll quit scratching and slapping, and you just behave yourself, and you just do as I tell you, and you won't get hurt. I'll, I'll go to the police. Yeah. <laughs> Who'd believe you? Who take your word against mine? I'll say you're trying to frame me. You'll go to jail. Now, oh, come on, honey. Be nice. I'll even give you money. All right. All right. I, I'll, I'll be nice. Don't you try to run away now. I'm holding this knife. Sure. Sure. Well, now you're talking. Uh, drop it. You, you break my arm. That's right. That's the way I was taught. Drop the knife. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Drop it. Uh -huh. uh, oh, you. I told you. Uh, I told you to drop the knife, but you wouldn't. I, I don't want to die. I... Mr. Grover. Mr. Grover, I'm... I'm sorry, Mr. Grover. But I... What was I supposed to do? You wanted to kill me. What? What was I supposed to do? He was dead. The knife somehow had been turned against his own body. I just stood there. I remember now. I wonder why I didn't panic. But I was cool. I made sure to leave nothing behind me. Not in a car. Not anywhere around. There was no blood on my clothes. And so, I just walked away. I walked away into the night. And no one saw me. No one had seen me get into his car. No one saw me kill him. No one saw me leave. Nowhere does any shred or scrap of evidence exist to link Eleanor Daly. Now, Eleanor Hartley to Paul Grover. Well, she certainly told it the way it was. But is it true that there are really no clues? Perhaps there are no fingerprints or bloodstains, but how about other clues? Stronger clues. The clues that exist in the mind, the heart, the conscience. We may find a few of those when I return shortly with Act Two. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. What's for dinner? Your ShopRite is featuring ShopRite or Shenandoah brand grade A rock Cornish hens. A real family treat at just 47 cents a pound. What's for breakfast? Listen to these ShopRite values. ShopRite grade A large eggs, 59 cents a dozen. ShopRite sliced bacon, one pound package, 79 cents. ShopRite grade A, A butter, one pound brick, 69 cents. Crown top white bread, 22 ounce loaves, three for one dollar. Save on every meal at ShopRite. She loves the family. She wants the best. 
she does all that she can do. She lets shop right to the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? Shop right has the answer. The Talk of New York, WOR, your mystery theater station. most unusual and attractive young couple, Ted and Eleanor Hartley. Ted is a brilliant detective on the city police force. Eleanor is so bright and sincere and articulate that a citizens committee has asked her to run for Congress. Eleanor is busy with her campaign. Ted is busy trying to track down a murderer. This sounds like two different stories, but actually it's really one story. Because the killer Tom is looking for happens to be Eleanor. No. No, don't. Let me go. Let me go. I'll, I'll kill you, Mr. Grover. Kill you. Eleanor, I... darling. You... Eleanor, darling, wake up. Wake up. Oh. oh. What? Oh. I must have had a nightmare. You were muttering and mumbling the craziest things. I, I think it's just I've been working too hard. Darling, you don't have to put so much into it. There are lots of people working for you. I want to be elected, Ted. I feel I feel I could do so much good. Sure. I feel I owe something. You owe something? What? I feel I have a debt. I have to make up for something. What? Oh, well, once I did someone an injury. Who? It was a long time ago. Yeah, but if it bothers you... This person had it coming. <laughs> then forget it. It's not that easy. Want to talk about it? No. Part of our bargain, remember? We'd never press each other for details about what happened before we met each other. Well, I'd say overall it's a good bargain, but... Tell me, did I bother you with this Grover case? Bother me? Yeah, your nightmare. You were mumbling, but you don't want to talk about no, it. Uh, no, I'll talk about it if if, if you want. Uh, I remember reading it was such a messy murder. I have to find the killer no matter how long it takes. I'm scared because I know Ted means it. He, he never quits. He'll stay with it forever. I don't know what to do. But how can I tell him? How can I confess? It was self-defense, but... It'll be the end. Not just the end of my career. But the end. Between Ted and me. A dedication to the truth. I will follow the truth, wherever it may lead. I will seek the truth, whomever it may hurt. What we need in our lives today, at every level, is the truth. The truth. Unvarnished, stark, simple. Thank you. Come on, we have to go. Come on. Well, sneak down the back stairs. You're due on the south side in 15 minutes. There's the car. You didn't tell me how it sounded, Tom. Yeah, I know I didn't. What's, what's the matter, Eleanor? The matter? Yeah, with you. The speech. There's something missing. Oh, what? I don't know. Let's say some of the fire was out. Anything wrong? Nothing, Tom. Having a bit of a tiff with Ted? Ted is absolutely in favor of my running. So what's wrong? Why do you insist something's wrong? Your speech. I didn't believe a word of it. Why? Because it was obvious to me that you didn't mean a word of it either. But I... Eleanor, something is wrong. Something has been just a little off-key all week. Now, why don't you tell me about it? Tom, I wish you'd believe me. Everything's just fine. Yeah? I mean it. 
Well, if everything's just fine, why are you so pale and why are you perspiring? Uh, Tom. Then there is something. Tom. There's nothing we can talk about. But it's serious. Yes. Serious. Eleanor, if it should ever come out. It can never come out, Tom. Believe me. Eleanor. Please, Tom. Don't ask me any more questions. Please. Sure, sure. Okay. But whatever it is, I... I'm in your corner. I'll back you. I'll fight for you no matter what you did. <laughs> Even if you committed murder. <laughs> I can't believe we have a free afternoon. <laughs> Not Ted. You've been busier than I have. Well, that's true. I'm the one who's been doing the neglected, guilty. I even got you out here on false pretenses. I'm working. Working? Mm-hmm. And I said, let's park the car and go for a little walk in the country, but... Right here is the site. What site? The site of the murder... The Paul Grover murder. Right here, past this tree. No. Ted, I... Huh? What is it, darling? Something about this place. What well, if you want to leave? No, no I, uh, After all, if you want me to help you. Right here, past this tree, is where he drove off the road. To, uh, pick up a hitchhiker. No. I don't buy that story anymore. Why not? There was another car. Oh? There were tire marks about 50 feet south of here where another car pulled off the road. But, uh, didn't the police know this five years ago? Oh, sure. It was in the report, but the police are like everyone else. We have a considerable body of knowledge, but we only use what seems relevant at the time. You, uh, you think there was another car involved? That's right. Someone met him here and killed him. It has to be that way, because he was being set up. Hmm. So you see, I've got some clues. I have those tire marks. They made a mold five years ago. And I've got this, this little button made of bone. It was clutched in Grover's hand. You take a look at it. I looked. It was a little button, a sleeve button. From a corduroy jacket, one of, well, one of the host of buttons that adorned that jacket. The jacket I had worn that night. There were so many buttons, I never even noticed the one that was missing. That jacket. I still have it. I don't wear it often, but I still have it. It's in one of my closets. What you're saying is that if you can find the jacket it came from... You've got your killer. That's right. I've got him. Him? Well, it's from a man's type field jacket, very popular about five years ago, although lots of people wore them. I think you've got one like it back home. Anyhow, there was a fight. Grover was stabbed. The killer took the money. But I didn't... You... I... Didn't what? I didn't know that robbery was the motive. Wasn't it supposed to have been a secret agent thing? I figure a hired killer. But he was stupid enough to pick up some loose bills. That should hang him. Are you sure? You know what else I've got? I found a witness. There's a little restaurant a couple of miles down the state highway. Certainly, I don't mind telling you the story again. <laughs> there was this uh, young man who came in here that night. How can you remember so far back? Oh, Mr. Grover was a steady customer. was a good customer. So I remember what happened the night he died. Yes, he was a good customer, but he put ketchup on everything. Anyway, on that night, this young fellow, he comes in. He's wearing a, a corduroy jacket and denim pants. A uh, wire... Uh... Why did you notice him? Well, you see, he ordered a steak, and then he pays with a $10 bill, and there's blood on the bill. Blood? Yes, yeah, so I says to him, this looks like blood. He says, does it? And I says, how did blood get on this bill? And he says, maybe it's blood money. He takes his change, gives me a dollar tip, and uh, leaves. Why didn't you tell this to the police? They never asked. 
<laughs> Would you believe that this lieutenant here is the first policeman that's walked into my restaurant since it happened five years ago? And can you describe him, Hugo? Oh, oh, I have never forgotten him. He was a big man, six foot tall, about uh, 200 pounds. Uh, he had black hair, brown eyes, a big scar on the left side of his chin, and the tip of his left pinky finger was missing. Thanks, Hugo. Oh, so, yeah, don't mention it, Lieutenant. As far as the wife is concerned, uh, Madam, if I get up early on election day, I... I might even vote for you. You would? Why? Oh, I don't know. Maybe that's why. <laughs> what? Well, you see, you tell the average politician that you want to vote for him. He shakes your hand. He looks sincere. He says, thank you. You, you look sort of surprised. You say, why? That is honest. It shows you're honest, and uh, <laughs> that's something. <laughs> Hi, Eleanor. Come in, Dom. Got here as soon as I could. Something wrong? Nothing's wrong. Or maybe everything's wrong. Okay, Eleanor, spill it. I don't care what you have to tell me. I don't care how bad it is. Let's get it out of the way. You carry the thing around with you, Tom. You justify it. You say there was no help for it. It wasn't your fault. Why should you pay for it? But it doesn't let you alone. Whether you admit it or not... It keeps building inside of you, and and you feel you just have to tell someone. I understand. Everyone has his own little secret. This isn't a little secret, Tom. Funny, isn't it? Of all the people I know, I feel I can only tell you. <laughs> what about Ted? No. No, I can't tell Ted. Does it concern another man? Yes, but not the way you might think. Okay... We had to come to this point, you and I, Eleanor, because, well, we're going places together. I know. Eleanor, 10, 15 years from now, you could become president of the United States. Oh, Tom. <laughs> oh, Tom. Thank you. Oh, I needed a laugh. Why are you laughing? Sooner or later, we'll have a woman president. Why not you? <laughs> dream on, Tom Caldwell. Dream on. For all of them, it began with a dream. So ask yourself, why not you? <laughs> You'll be 40 ish, even more beautiful than you are now. Wiser, mm. more experienced. Now, what could hold you back? Oh, excuse me. Hello? Darling? Ted, where are you? At police headquarters. I won't be home until late. Can't it wait? No. I have to do it now because I just brought in my prisoner. Who? The killer. You know, the guy that murdered Paul Grover. The man. Who murdered Grover? Can you be sure? Yeah, I'm sure. We got him cold. Is it possible? Can two people have murdered Paul Grover? We know of one, but who is the other? Can there be another? Maybe it's possible to murder a man twice. We will deal with a number of interesting possibilities when I return shortly with Act Three. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy. Every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. Hello, M. Cow. My automatic transmission just got uh, automatic -ing. I was wondering, do you service Chevrolets? Do we service those sensational Chevrolets? Ma'am, Amco has serviced over 3 million automatic transmissions of all kinds. Ah. Nearly 900,000 Chevrolets alone. Ooh. Do we service Chevrolets? George, pitch pipe, please. Chevy Nova and Impala and the Bel Air and Camaro and the Chevy, too. Oh, my. Yep, we know them. Every Chevrolet automatic make and model on the road today, from the oldest Biscayne to a bright, spanky Caprice. Uh, by the way, what sort of Chevy did you say you had? A Chevy Mustang. Well, no matter. Nobody knows your automatic transmission better than Amco. Double A. MCO. 
There are over 500 AMCO centers coast to coast. Consult your yellow pages for the AMCO center near you. Double A M C O AMCO. Although once is usually par for the course, it does appear that some people can be murdered twice. Five years ago, Eleanor Hartley was forced to kill a man in self-defense. And now it develops that the police have evidence against another killer. And Eleanor Hartley, whose horizons are unlimited, now has to make a crucial decision. Everything all right with Ted? Uh, yes. Just fine. They got the killer. Killer? The one who murdered that, uh, Paul Grover. Oh, well, that's great. Well, Ted is really a great detective. Who's the suspect? I didn't ask. Oh, it'll probably be in the news. Okay, Eleanor, I'm waiting. Tom, I don't want to lose everything. Why should I lose everything? Well, you won't lose anything. Don't say that. Is it that bad? Yes. Well, it'll have to come out. No, it won't. Eleanor, Big Jim is out to get you. He'll stop at nothing. Whatever it is, believe me, sooner or later, he'll uncover. No, he can't. No one can. Only I know. Eleanor, there is no way out except the truth. You're wrong, Tom. There's another way out. And it turned up for me tonight. So, the problem is solved. It's settled. It no longer exists. Uh, Eleanor, I... No, Tom. I've pulled myself together. I realize the stakes I'm playing for. It, uh, it simply will not bother me anymore. You say that so easily. It's a matter of alternatives. What will be best for everyone in the long run? Well, I don't know what it is, but I sure hope you can live with it. I've lived with it for five years. I can live with it forever. I'll have to. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I woke you. <laughs> Did you think I could fall asleep? Tell me. Tell me everything. Who is he? Vince Perry. Very bad boy. He's had quite a career. Five or six years ago, he was just a punk. Now he was on his way to being number one in narcotics in this town. But, uh, you've got him for murder. How did you? Well, after all, five years ago, the police couldn't get anywhere. Well, I had one break. That little restaurant. I guess the detectives never went there last time. It is an out-of-the-way place, but... But why didn't Hugo come for it? Hugo represents a large group of people. Guys like Hugo simply don't volunteer. But all Hugo gave you was the description. It was enough. It told me it was Vince Perry. But the description. Is it enough? Two other things put him on the scene. The tire marks. They're a very special Italian tire. I checked back. I found out that Vince Perry had come into some money, bought an imported custom Italian car. Oh. And the button. I made the rounds of clothing stores all around his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Found out where he bought most of his clothes. Guy checked back through his records, and sure enough, Vince had bought a corduroy jacket with that type of button. Will all that be enough? The description, the button, the cast, the cops took of the tires five years ago. Plus, well, I shouldn't say that. What? Plus the fact he looks like a killer, has a bad reputation. Well, we don't have to worry about him anymore. Why, uh, why did you say that? Who was worrying about him? Well, I'm sorry, did I no, say something uh, wrong? No, I, um, uh, let me just swallow this. Now, wait a minute, what's with the pills? I need something to help me sleep. But you never took pills before. I've never been under this kind of pressure before. Well, why should you be under pressure? You don't understand politics. I thought the idea was just for you to get up and tell the truth. It's more complicated. Because you make it more complicated. Well, you don't know what a strain I... We're fighting. First himself. Do I have to meet him? He's really a very nice guy. He's a thief. Oh, and uh, this morning I arranged for you to visit Vince Perry. Vince Perry? Yeah, in his cell. Why would I... Calm down, calm down. How could you even suggest... Look, look, look at it this way. 
You have to do me a favor because I have to do Charlie Colligan a favor. Who is Charlie your... Colligan, he'll... Who? Your worthy opponent, Big Jim Parkhurst himself. Do I have to meet him? He's really a very nice guy. He's a thief. Oh, and uh, this morning I've arranged for you to visit Vince Perry. Vince Perry? Yeah, in his cell. Why would I... Calm down, calm down. How could you even suggest... Look, look, look at it this way. You have to do me a favor because I have to do Charlie Colligan a favor. Who is Charlie your... Colligan, he'll deliver the vote for you in the fourth ward. This is the kind of politics that I intend to fight. No, my dear, these are the kind of politics that I shield you from. Vince Perry just wants to see you. Why? Well, it'll be a very private meeting. Nobody will even know you were there. Why? Colligan owes him a favor. Do you mean to tell me that if I refuse to see this, this gangster, I can lose the fourth ward? It's not that simple, that open and shut. But elections have been lost by one vote. <sighs> Well, let's get it over with. Well, nice of you to show up, Congresswoman. I haven't been elected yet. Oh, I hear it's in a bag. I only came as a favor to a good friend. <laughs> now, you're getting the hang of politics. That's what it's all about, no? Favorites. I agreed to come to your cell on two conditions. A... It would be kept secret. B, I would do nothing that's foreign to my principles. Okay. Let's find out what your principles are. Let's see if you want to start out by doing the right thing. <laughs> what do you know about the right thing? I know this. The right thing would be for you to confess to the murder of Paul Glover. What did you say? Come on, you know what I said. You know why I said it? You killed Paul Grover. I've seen you do it. That's a lie. Here's the way it was. Now, I get the contract to knock him off. I followed him in my car. I figured I'd bag him after he came out of that restaurant. But first, he stops and picks you up. Then, after a couple of minutes, he stops again. So, I stop. I heard it all. I've seen it all. I let you go. Why not? Huh? You did my job for me. I never forget what you looked like. You can't... You can't prove a word of it. I'm in the spot you were in when he tried to attack you. Now, nobody would have believed you then. Nobody would believe me now. What do you expect me to do? Like I say, the right thing. There's two kinds of people. Honest folks and thieves. Now, there's a law. The honest folks obey it, period. The thieves break it. I'm a thief. What are you? <laughs> Oh, uh, Eleanor, I, I don't think you two have ever met. I, I'd like to present you to your opponent, uh, Congressman Jim Parkhurst. How do you do? Well, so you're Eleanor Hartley. Well, now I know why I'm going to lose. You're even prettier in person. Uh, I think I'll leave you two to chat. Excuse me. Are you already conceding, Congressman? Oh, sure. Eh, my time's run out. Really? But you're running a very aggressive campaign. Well, you kill a snake. The body can still wiggle. No, dear, I've had it. The voters are wise to me. You know, I always thought you were an ogre, and you are, but a very charming ogre. <laughs> Eleanor, let me give you a word of advice. Advice? Best in the world, because as advice I never followed myself. Now, when I became aware of you for the first time, you broke my heart. How? Huh. I saw you as I was, oh, 30 years ago. Filled with spirit, sincerity, a desire to find the truth and work for it. Really? Yeah, sounds strange coming from me, doesn't it? Well, just remember, it doesn't happen all at once. You wake up one day and, well, yes, you're a crook. You're dishonest. You betray your constituents. Now, you're not really that bad. <laughs> My dear, I'm worse. <laughs> it starts with the first lie, the first deal. That's when you swallow that first tiny drop of poison. Remember that. Have you tasted yours yet? No, don't answer. <laughs> Just think about it. <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Well, I, I know you'll have a highly successful career because you're a very honest little lady. You might even become president. <laughs> Good luck. Well, what did you think of Big Jim? Tom, I want to do something. But I need your advice. I want to make a statement. It's something that is true. 
But it would end my career. Then why make it? Because it's the right thing to do. Ted, what are you typing? How is the big luncheon? Oh, the usual. What are you typing? Yeah, you want to read it? To Chief of Detectives, dear Inspector Summerfield, please accept my resignation from the police force. Ted, what's this? Oh, I don't know. I just don't want to be a cop any longer. Why? Why? Well, look, you'll be going to Washington. But I thought we... Why do I have to be a cop all my life? Why can't I try something else? Because, Ted, for you there is nothing else. Uh, look, let it go. Ted, I love you. I love you, too. What do you want me to do? About what? You know. How long have you known? How long have I known what? When did you first find out that I killed Paul Grover? The first night I got the assignment. You told me about it in your sleep. You were having a nightmare, but you told me. And every night since then, in your sleep, you kept telling me. The buttons missing from your jacket in the closet. Why didn't you arrest me? How could I? Why should I? Besides, this is the perfect setup for Vince Perry. He's a rat. We're better off without him. Yes. And Paul Grover would have been killed by him an hour later. Why should your life be ruined? It's better this way. We need you more than Vince Perry. And it was self-defense, anyhow. Then why do you want to resign from the force? Because I just made my first deal. I've taken the first drop of poison. Someone, someone else said that to me earlier. I'll stop now before I become the kind of cop I have no use for. Hey, what are you doing? You can't resign, Ted. You're going to make an arrest. No, no, I won't. I can't. You can. You must. I've taken the first drop, too. And I can't live with it, either. Please, Ted. But it'll be the end. No, Dad. It won't. You'll see. It'll be the beginning. It was quite an unusual arrest. And an unusual confession. An unusual trial. And a rather unusual verdict. Not guilty. It would be nice to be able to say that she was elected... No, there is a limit to the unusual. A pity. I'll be back shortly. Hi, Ms. Goldilocks here. Professionally, taste-testing diet drinks can be very difficult, but I just had to bear with it. Then I found sugar-free diet 7-Up. It doesn't taste like other diet drinks. It's fresh, light, natural, delicious. Sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that I've taste-tested it hundreds of times, and each time I've given it my seal of approval. Yes, this one's just right. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Got a second? I'd like to tell you about a new... Co